Bruce Babbitt concerning an Indian casino decision. Committee members heard testimony from the Secretary's former Chief of Staff, Tom Collier, and former counsel, John Duffy. Chairing the proceedings, Congressman Dan Burton of Indiana. It's five and a half hours. The committee will come to order. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone back to our third day of hearings regarding Secretary Babbitt and the Interior Department's rejection of an Indian gaming application. This application was submitted by three poor Indian tribes in Wisconsin, and it was opposed by several very wealthy tribes who were major donors to the Democrat National, Par uh, Democrat National Committee and Party. Last week, we heard testimony from the chairman of the three Chippewa tribes who submitted the application. We heard from the owner of the dog track at which the casino was to be located. We heard from four Interior Department officials, both career officials and political appointees who were involved in the decision. And we heard from both an opponent and a supporter of the casino from the town of Hudson. We learned a number of important facts during these two days. We heard t testimony that the chief fundraiser for the Clinton-Gore campaign, Terry McAuliffe, approached Frank Havanek and told him that he had a hand in killing the casino application. We learned that a Justice Department attorney defending the Interior Department in the lawsuit criticized the department for not following its own procedures and suggested settling the case. We learned that the tribes who opposed the, this casino so strenuously and benefited from the decision to reject it contributed nearly $360,000 to the Democrat National Committee following its rejection. We heard testimony from two witnesses and received affidavits from six more that the head of the Indian Gaming Management Staff, George Scabine, told a group of people at a meeting in Wisconsin that political appointees in the department were responsible for killing the application. We then received five affidavits from Interior Department staff who denied that that statement was made. However, because two different meetings were held on that day, questions have been raised as to whether these Interior Department people were at the meeting in question. We're pursuing that to find out more, more of the details. We learned from a number of documents, emails, and deposition testimony that a senior counsel in Secretary Babbitt's office, John Duffy, appears to have been the driving force behind the decision. Mr. Duffy was a political appointee of Secretary Babbitt. We learned that after the decision to reject the application was made, Mr. Duffy and Mr. Babbitt's Chief of Staff, Tom Collier, left the department and went to work for the Minnesota Shakopees, an Indian tribe, which was the wealthy Minnesota tribe that benefited the most from this decision. We learned that in February 1995, the department reopened the comment period on this application for two months at the request of the opposing tribes. They did not inform the applicant tribes until they were confronted by the tribes about it six weeks later, which was highly unusual. We also learned that the Interior Department never met with the applicant tribes to give them a chance to correct any flaws in their application. They kept these tribes that they were supposed to be helping completely in the dark. This type of consultation is required by law. It flies in the face of the procedures used in considering every other application. To reinforce this very important point, let me just read to you from Mr. Scabine's deposition. Question, quote, here were three poor tribes that had represented, that had presented an application to the Department of the Interior, and you were making a determination as to whether to approve the application or deny the application. If you, as director of the IGMS staff, identified a particular problem that might lead to the rejection of the application, did you consider it important to communicate that directly to the applicant tribes to give them an opportunity to cure the problem? End of the question. And the answer by Mr. Scabine, quote, that's a good question. I don't think that I did that on this application. The first application I considered as head of the gaming office. If I were to do that again, different now, you know, it might be different. It might be something I would consider doing, but at the time, I didn't do it. It appears, end of quote, it appears as though the reason they didn't do this is because they didn't want to approve the application. This week we will hear from very four, from, excuse me, this week we will hear from four very important witnesses. We will first hear from Patrick O'Connor, 
former treasurer of the Democrat National Committee who was the chief lobbyist for the wealthy Minnesota and Wisconsin tribes opposing the application. Mr. O'Connor vigorously lobbied the President, Deputy White House Chief of Staff Harold Ickes, the head of the DNC, Don Fowler, and others to kill the application. In September of 1995, after he succeeded in getting the application killed, he wrote a fundraising letter to his Native American clients. Here's what it said, quote, as witnessed in the fight to stop the Hudson Dog Track proposal, the Office of the President can and will work on our behalf when asked to do so, end quote. We will hear from Tom Collier, Secretary Babbitt's former Chief of Staff, and Michael Duffy, the Secretary's Chief Counsel for Indiana Gambling Issues. And finally tomorrow, we will hear from Secretary Babbitt himself. We have a great deal of work to do over the next two days, so I'll not take any more time right now. I'd like to invite the gentleman from California to make any opening comments he has, and then we'll hear from our first witness. But before Mr. Waxman makes his comments, let me just say that we may have a motion or two that we'll have to vote on at some point during the hearing, and there may be a unanimous consent request, so I'll make all of my colleagues aware of that in advance. So if you can stick around, we'd sure appreciate it. Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to point out that uh, over the last year or so, we've had a lot of accusations about uh, scandals, but when it came down to it, these accusations were unsubstantiated. I think that's important to, to point out because people forget. We had allegations, and pretty colorful ones. We had allegations that the White House kept an enemies list, that it was using the IRS to punish political enemies, and that the White House was a haven for hard drug users. We also had a, a pretty big bumper crop of accusations that were pretty sensational. During this last year, uh, the White House was accused of altering its videotapes. Uh, former Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary was accused of demanding charitable contributions from Johnny Chung. Maggie Williams was accused of soliciting campaign contributions in the White House. Now, this is a list that I pointed out last week in my opening statement. And I also pointed out that the uh, fact of the matter was that all of these statements were completely untrue. One statement also was that uh, the White House was selling burial plots at Arlington National Cemetery. That's also untrue. But the reason I raise it is that the accusations get the headlines, but the corrections are buried. Yeah, on page 10, page 10 of the Washington Post, I want to hold it up, buried over in this little corner is an article that says, political donations not a factor in Arlington waivers, GAO says. So GAO did a study. They found this accusation was inaccurate. They print a, re a, a, a clarification that the accusation was not valid, and it appears on A-10. Where do the attacker's statements that are unsubstantiated appear? Usually on page one. Now, what we have is investigation by innuendo, and that will, I suspect, continue today. Let me try to summarize where we are. Uh, Mr. O'Connor and others on both sides of the casino controversy lobbied this issue. Both sides made campaign contributions and both tried to exert political influence. Not an unusual situation in this city of Washington, where both sides hire lawyers and lobbyists and try their best to win their, their aside. Uh, that makes the Hudson Casino controversy, like nearly everything else we've seen, in Washington, what would make this issue different is if we had solid evidence that the decision was improperly affected by campaign contributions. But there is no such evidence. Last week, George Skabin, Tom Hartman, and Michael Anderson all testified under oath that the casino decision was made on the merits without improper political influence. Hilda Manuel, Another senior Interior Department official provided similar testimony in a sworn uh, deposition, but was not permitted to testify, although she would have told us that 
she talked to Secretary Babbitt, and he told her, you decide, you career people decide this case on the merits. These are the four interior officials who were most involved in this matter and would, who would be in a position to know if any wrongdoing occurred. They are the ones we would normally rely on to see if there is substance to the innuendo. And they have all said that the decision was made on the merits. I realize the chairman is determined to plug away at trying to uncover more innuendo to fuel his theory of wrongdoing. But the facts are that every member of this committee seemed to think the decision was a right one. And there is no solid evidence that anything improper happened in the decision-making process. Now, our committee has conducted hearings, but more than hearings, we've had depositions. These depositions, by the way, uh, compel, are under subpoena, so people are compelled to come in, give testimony under oath. The press and the public are not there to witness it. And these depositions can take an extraordinary long period of time. People are deprived of their rights because they're compelled to be there. And um, sometimes these depositions become public, but sometimes they're not. We, uh, during the past year, had over 100 witnesses deposed, many of which had already been deposed by the Senate. Most of these witnesses uh, have never been and will never be called to testify. So they won't have a chance to speak in public. Until last week, I had never requested that a witness be deposed. But last week, I asked that we depose Patrick O'Connor, our first witness at this hearing today, so that we could prepare for this hearing. On Monday, I was informed that the chairman had rejected this request. I frankly can't think of a single legitimate reason for the chairman's rejection, especially given the large number of wasteful and redundant depositions the staff had already conducted. Perhaps my suspicions would not be as great had it not been for Fred Havenick's testimony last week. At the last moment before that hearing, we learned that Mr. Havenick would testify that Terry McAuliffe was somehow involved in the Hudson Casino decision. Terry McAuliffe, by the way, was one of the major fundraisers for the Clinton-Gore campaign. Although that charge has subsequently been reported in the press, no evidence has been produced to substantiate the allegation. The press reported it. No evidence was produced to substantiate it. In fact, every Interior Department official who was involved in this decision has testified under oath that they were never contacted by Mr. McAuliffe about this issue. The same is true of Mr. Havenick's allegation about his meeting with George Skabeen. We have learned since last week that two of the people Mr. Havenick claims were at the meeting now say they, they did not attend. And we have received affidavits from five other Department of Interior employees who dispute Mr. Havenick's allegations. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our committee's resources would be better spent focusing on real scandals. Last week, I brought to the attention of the chairman and the members of this committee the facts behind the Gingrich Lot tobacco scandal. The facts, the facts are that the tobacco industry is the biggest contributor to the Republican Party, that it hired Haley Barber, who was the Republican uh, National Committee chairman, as its lobbyist, and that Newt Gingrich and Trent Lott personally responsible for sneaking a $50 billion tax break for the industry into last year's budget bill. These are facts. When I raised this issue uh, last week, we were told that my request for subpoenas to look at this scandal, this uh, what purports to look like uh, campaign contributions producing favors for the contributors, uh, what, what, uh, what, when we asked for subpoenas, the chairman said he had it under a consideration. We haven't received a reply from him. Now, one deposition that was taken 
during the course of the, our investigations was a Vernon Jordan. And uh, it had nothing to do with this casino. It had, I don't know what it particularly had a lot to do with, but I read today in the newspaper called The Hill, a House probe turned sights on Jordan. Investigators for the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee are scrutinizing the deposition of Washington super lawyer Vernon Jordan to look for specific turns of phrase that might provide new insights into the White House sex scandal. Well, let's let everybody scrutinize this deposition. Let's make it public. Why should we have depositions taken and not released? I called at a previous meeting to have all those depositions made public. I'm going to, at the appropriate time, uh, ask unanimous consent that this deposition be made public. Let's get the facts on the table. And I would hope we get the facts on the table before the accusations are made. So we know that accusations are based on facts and not innuendo. Mr. Chairman, if this is an appropriate time, I would make my unanimous consent request. If the chair would like me to withhold it because we have other uh, documents we're going to try to make public into the record, I'd be pleased to withhold it, whatever his desires may be. But I do want to make this request at some time. We will entertain that. Uh, let me, are you, have you concluded your remarks? I have. Let, let me just uh, make a couple of brief comments regarding uh, some of the issues that have been raised. First of all, uh, the Commerce Department, on which I believe you serve, is uh, investigating the tobacco issue, and I think they will continue to. Uh, and our plate's pretty full right now. That's why we haven't uh, made any comment about that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we believe it will be looked into by the Congress. Regarding depositions, uh, almost all the people we have deposed have come voluntarily. We have not had to subpoena, I think, over maybe one or two. Uh, there haven't been very many. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, the reason we did not agree to have Mr. O'Connor come in for a deposition last week was because he was going to be before the committee today, and we didn't think bringing him in there twice was necessary. So that's the reason for that. And finally, regarding Vernon Jordan, let me make it clear. We are not involving this committee in any way in the scandal that is now engulfing Washington, D.C. And the deposition regarding Mr. Jordan that, that was taken by him dealt with uh, Webster Hubble and other issues. Uh, I have no objection. I don't think our council does or anybody on the committee has any objection to making that uh, deposition public. And so at the proper time, we will entertain that motion. And I think that when the public sees that uh, deposition, they will find that there was no reference made to any kind of a scandal of the type that we're talking about here in Washington today. And so with that, let well, me... Mr. Chairman, may I just uh, make sure. a couple of comments? Sure. First of all, I I'd serve on the Commerce Committee. That committee is going to look at the merits of legislation for tobacco control. Mm -hmm. It is not going to investigate the campaign contributions by the tobacco industry that, that I believe influence a decision to give them a $50 billion tax break. That is something that ought to be looked at at the committee that's looking at campaign finance abuses. But as I pointed out, this committee doesn't look at abuses when it involves Republicans, only Democrats. Secondly, I. Uh, uh, I'm pleased that you're going to allow that Vernon Jordan uh, deposition to be uh, made public. But I didn't uh, say that this committee is looking at this campaign, uh, that this uh, scandal uh, at the White House. I'm reading from something that your investigators uh, told the Hill newspaper that they're scrutinizing the deposition of Vernon Jordan to look for specific turns of phrase that might provide new insights into the White House sex scandal. So let's get that information out there and see if there's any turn of phrase. But that wasn't something I've raised. It's something your staff uh, uh, reported to the press. Again, it made a nice headline, House Probe Turns Sights on Jordan. Now let's, of course, when the deposition gets out and is looked at, I don't think we'll find another article that nothing found in, in Jordan deposition uh, relating to the so-called sex scandal. But this is the kind of investigation that uh, we are conducting on this committee, and I uh, want to point it out. Now, Mr. Chairman, uh, if it's oh. okay, I'll make my unanimous consent in request now moment, since well, we have an in, agreement in on it. In just a moment, we have some other unanimous consents we want to entertain prior to that. But let me just say, I don't know where that rumor came from. To my knowledge, nobody on our staff was instructed or gave any information of the type you're talking about to the Hill newspaper. And if you have specific individuals who said anything of that type, if you'll bring them to my attention, they will be taken to task because we are not involving ourselves in that uh, issue at all. 
I, I, I promise you we're not getting into that. That's something that's beyond uh, what I want the scope of this investigation to be involved with. Now, we have first, uh, I, I ask unanimous consent that the depositions of John Duffy and Ann Jablowski uh, be included in the record uh, after they have reviewed their depositions. I mean, I have no problem with them reviewing their depositions. So without objection, it's so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all documents regarding the St. Croix Meadows Greyhound Racing Park, except any proprietary studies included in volume 14 of the interior record, be made publicly available, provided that any documents with personal information such as, such as social security numbers and home addresses and phone numbers shall be redacted by committee staff before release. Without objection. Reserving the right to object, and I will object, Mr. Chairman, uh, so that our staffs can look over these documents. As I understand, there are some uh, problems with the release of some of these documents based on the Solicitor General's concern about it uh, uh, regarding attorney-client issues. So I will at this time object and then uh, uh, hope that before the end of this hearing we can uh, work out the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the problems in this so that, that we can make as much of it uh, okay. public as possible. Objection is heard. Uh, we will revisit this issue after, uh, after staff has had a chance to try to work out our differences and if not, we'll just have a vote on it. I ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and, the, and Committee Rule 14 in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to members of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes for the questioning of Secretary Babbitt equally divided between the majority and the minority. Without objection, so ordered. And now I will entertain your motion. Mr. Chairman, um, I do want to point out that the Hill article says, Republican staffers for the committee headed by Representative Dan Burton say different things. Uh, and however, the staffers who insisted on anonymity. So uh, it's really up, for you, up to you to talk to your staff to find out if, in fact, they're leaking this information to the press. Well, I will, I will check with our staff. We'll look into it. And if we find anybody's making those kinds of comments or, or to, to the Hill newspaper or any other publication, we'll severely correct them, because that's something we're not going to get into. I ask unanimous consent that the uh, deposition of Vernon Jordan taken by the staff of this, uh, sub of this committee be uh, made public. Without objection, so ordered. First panel today consists of uh, Mr. Patrick O'Connor. Would you please come forward, Mr. O'Connor? Stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be God? I do. Please be seated. Mr. O'Connor, uh, do you have an opening statement you'd like to make? Um, I would waive that opening statement. It's part of the record. Uh -huh. And uh, in light of our uh, delay in getting underway, I think it would save some time. Well, Mr. O'Connor, we'll, we'll uh, uh, submit your statement for the record without objection. It's so ordered. So, Mr. O'Connor, we will now start with questioning from uh, Chief Counsel, uh, Mr. Bennett, who's recognized for 30 minutes. Good, good morning, Mr. O'Connor. And good morning to you. Uh, sir, um, in your opening statement, which is part of the record, you made reference to two different, I guess, aspects of your life. Uh, one, that uh, you've essentially been a lot, you started your career as a trial lawyer, and the record should reflect the great respect you enjoy, sir, as a trial lawyer in the Minneapolis area, and then I believe that around 1961, according to your prepared statement, you began to engage more in activities that would be defined as lobbying. Isn't that correct? Uh, uh, working with clients in terms of their problems uh, with the Congress and with federal agencies. Well, would you agree, sir, that generally in the parlance that would be defined as being a lobbyist? I'm not disparaging that. I'm just saying essentially you've been a lobbyist for the past 25 it, or 30 years, it, haven't you, it sir? also included lobbying, yes. And then, sir, totally separate from that, uh, you are a former treasurer of the Democratic National Committee. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, I think the record should reflect your great prominence in the Democratic Party, and I believe now you are a trustee of the Democratic National Committee. Is that correct, sir? Uh, I believe they now refer to them not as trustees, 
but as to uh, major supporter major supporters and with respect to your lobbying activity and your activity as a major supporter of the Democratic Party I think in your uh, prepared statements you noted that as a major supporter you have the responsibility for fundraising isn't that correct that's correct and, and sir as a lobbyist I'm sure that you have represented clients on the merits of issues having nothing to do with the matter of political fundraising isn't that correct Certainly, I have represented clients that uh, did not involve fundraising. And uh, also, in terms of your great uh, commit uh, commitment and dedication to your party, of which you should be proud, the Democratic Party, you have raised money for the Democratic Party and have expected nothing in return on many occasions. Isn't that correct? I have raised money for the Democratic Party, yes. And I did not, I do not expect any uh, a return, if that's the term you want to use. And, sir, my question to you is then, uh, based upon your, your status in the legal community and your many years of experience both in the law and in politics, uh, you would agree, would you not, that it can become somewhat dangerous if you intertwine the two too closely, meaning intertwining fundraising and lobbying for a particular client? Uh, I don't believe, uh, uh, I don't know what you mean by intertwining uh, but uh, certainly, uh, I believe that uh, uh, you can uh, be working on a matter for a client and uh, still be involved if that client has a willingness uh, to make a contribution uh, to a political party or to a member of Congress. But that willingness should not be imposed on that client. Wouldn't you agree, sir? Yeah. That, say that again. That willingness, as you said, that willingness should not be imposed on the client no. as a condition of getting a result. Would you agree no. with that? You would agree with that, wouldn't you, sir? Uh, what you're saying... I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Is what you're saying is I, I shouldn't, uh, in my capacity of representing a client, uh, uh, impose upon him uh, to make contributions or uh, to... Uh, forcing to make contributions. Sir, that's what you're saying. Yes, yes, that's correct, sir. And if I can, sir, you have an exhibit book before you, I believe, um, and I want to make reference to exhibit 356, that being the billing records of your law firm, O'Connor and Hannon, to the St. Croix tribe, the, the client that which you represented in this matter, exhibit 356. And if you want to take a second to look through those billing records or have those before you, Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Bennett, excuse me, I'm Charles Leeper, counsel for Mr. O'Connor, and we do not have an exhibit book before I apologize. Excuse uh, me. You should have one right before you, counsel. I'm sorry. Did we have the number? Yes, I'm going to do it right now. Just the exhibit is 356, and for your assistance, each page is marked. And looking at the page marked 356-45 of that exhibit, counsel. Mr. Connors, your attorney finds that document. Uh, there is reference. That is a billing record, and I believe your billing records would have, as with all law firms, uh, there, it's itemized to the tenth of an hour and records the various lawyers who worked on matters. Isn't that correct, Mr. O'Connor? Uh, uh, yes. I, I, I believe, counsel, you're a little too close to the microphone. Sorry. Excuse I, me. I have difficulty All right. I hearing. apologize, sir. I apologize. Right. Not hearing, but understanding. Okay. The, the echo, and I apologize. All right. The, the entries there in those time records, uh, PJO represents you, does it not, in those yes. time records? Referring uh, to 356-45. Mr. Chairman, uh, there's some reference to exhibits, but I want to point out for the record the minority has not been furnished these exhibits. Uh, and uh, if we're going to have exhibits in a hearing, they ought to be given to the witness and to the minority so that we'll all know what uh, is being discussed. The gentleman will suspend for a moment. Absolutely. Hold on the time. Would you make sure the minority has uh, all the exhibits, please? And in the future, in the future, I those agree. exhibits should be given to the minority well in advance of the hearing so that they're prepared. I don't know what happened there. I have no idea, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Waxman, sir, do you have those exhibits in front of you, Congressman Waxman? 
Perhaps we can. Well, wait we just, just got one book. Uh, I want my council to look at it. I'd like to have it as well. So we have two, maybe. Well, as, as just for the record, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, these exhibits are going to be placed up on the television screen as well as we discuss them. The problem, the problem we have with that is that uh, it's hard to read on some of these monitors, especially when you get the fine print. Just, let's just hold off for one second. Make sure that everybody has uh, the exhibits so that we are all singing from the same hymnal, at least in this case. I, I thank you for uh, providing us, and I've made this suggestion in the past, that when you're going to use exhibits, they ought to be furnished to the minority. This is, it seems to me, basic procedural uh, courtesies that ought to be extended to us, and uh, I just want to uh, state again my strong objection, and it looks like Chairman agrees with it. Uh, when you're talking to your staff about leaks, also talk to them about getting us exhibits. Let's get this, let's get this committee on track. Now. Before we go any further, let me just say there is no evidence of any leaks. We will look into it. If we find that there were leaks, we'll, do, we'll take care of it. But, you know, you don't need to keep bringing that up again and again. We'll check into it. And we'll try to make sure in the future that all documents are presented to you well in advance of the hearing. And I hope everybody on the staff heard that. I want that done. Okay. Gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bennett. Yes, I'm from Maryland, Mr. Chairman. Oh, Maryland, pardon It's the stepsister to Virginia, so... Um, Mr. O'Connor, if we can, I, I have this up on the projection screen in the hearing room, sir, and we'll try to make sure, Congressman Waxman, I don't know why those exhibit books weren't placed in front of you. We have a, an abundance of them, and I apologize. Re referencing July 14, 1995, that is the day that the casino application of the Chippewa Indians was rejected by the Department of the Interior. Do you see that there, sir? Yes. There is reference. Top of the page. Yes, yes, sir. And in that, on that exhibit, there is reference that you are to follow up with Harold Ickes of the White House for, quote, outlining fundraising strategies. Do you see that, sir? Follow up with Harold Ickes at the White House. I see here uh, uh, discussions uh, regarding necessity to follow up with uh, Harold Ickes at the White House, uh, Don Fowler at the DNC, and Terry uh, McCullough at the committee to reelect. That stands as one item. Right. And then doesn't it say right there next to it, sir, it says outlining fundraising strategies? Yes, that's another item, yes. And it's right there on your time entry uh, for July 14th. And, and continuing down that page, sir, July 20, 1995, there is reference in your billing records to fundraising. Again, if you look at your entry of July 20, yes. 1995, fundraising. Mr. Mr. O'Connor, my question to you, sir, is why would you be billing your client, the St. Croix tribe, for your steps in fundraising? Uh, I uh, bill clients uh, uh, on occasion and certain clients if I feel that fundraising activities are important uh, to the client and uh, to any input that I might get as a result of attending uh, fundraising uh, receptions uh, any data I might get on issues uh, that might be discussed at that fundraising that are pending in Congress. If I feel uh, that uh, uh, it, it would be of importance to the client and the client should know it, I bill my time for it, yes. And so then, sir, uh, again, not casting any aspersions upon you, Mr. O'Connor, but then clearly the matter of raising money and political fundraising was very much involved in this process of trying to kill this casino application. Isn't that correct? Uh, can you... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. I'm sorry. Isn't that correct? Uh, you're billing your client for political fundraising activities. And I gather, in light of your last answer, you felt that the matter of raising money was very much important in connection with succeeding in the objectives of your client. Isn't that correct? Uh, uh, if, if you're talking about going to fundraising um, uh, 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 events 
or, uh, dis or working on fundraising itself, uh, if I uh, was of the opinion that it would be helpful uh, uh, to the client, um, uh, I would bill for it. Do you ordinarily bill your clients for fundraising activity as you did the St. Croix tribe here, sir? I, I have in the past, and uh, if I feel uh, that uh, fundraising activities are part of the work that I'm doing for the client, um, I'll bill for it. it. It varies. And then, sir, obviously with respect to fundraising activities being part of the process, uh, obviously politics uh, were very much part of this process in terms of killing this casino application. Isn't that correct? Politics in what sense, Council? Well, I guess the point is we've had uh, Secretary Babbitt, in light of his comments, and he's going to testify here tomorrow, has essentially said that this politics wasn't involved at all with respect to the rejection of this casino application. That and yet, be. and we're going to go through the chronology of your billing records, sir, but I'd submit that the points I raised on your billing records, as well as others throughout those billing records, reflected by Exhibit 356, contain notations to your billing your client for fundraising activities, billing your client for discussions with the committee to reelect the president, billing your client for discussions with Harold Ickes about political fundraising. So Secretary Babbitt would not be correct, would he, to say that politics wasn't involved. Uh, politics was very much involved in this matter. I think that what you said about my billing is correct. However, uh, I never talked to uh, 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 Harold Ickes in terms of uh, uh, fundraising, or in fact, I never talked to Harold Ickes at all on this issue. Let me show you if I can and move on, sir. Um, looking at your time records, Exhibit 356, uh, Council page 33, 356-33, uh, it, it appears, looking at those timesheets, Mr. O'Connor, that your first involvement specifically on the matter, not your first entry in your timesheets, but your first involvement appears to have been on March 15, 1995, when you had a meeting in Washington. Uh, you want to look at that time entry there, sir? Certainly. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Uh, if I could, please. If, if Council is going to be referring to a number of documents, maybe it would be helpful to tell us which documents he's going to be referring to. We can have staff get us those documents right now, and we won't have to have to scurry every time one goes on the screen, if you would be kind of the, so. the problem, it appears, is, though, is we don't have enough books uh, to uh, give every member one. I understand that. But what I'm saying is I think that Mr. Bennett will be probably referring to other documents in the course of his questioning. If he could let us know what number documents those are now, we can send the staff back on our side yes. to, make copies. Sure. to make copies of it. Congressman Barrett, um, we'll be referring to, for example, 356, the time records, and we can have someone prepare a list um, in about the next few minutes as we move forward. That we'll be getting be some documents later on, sir. That helpful. Thank you. Do you need some time before we get back to the questioning to right. review the documents? It would be helpful. I, again, it's the chairman's. I, I think it. Well, we can we can hold up for a minute or two. Yeah, if you'd like. I, I'd like to be able to read sir. these as, as you yes, go sir. through. Let's let's just suspend while the staff then makes copies of the relevant documents so that everybody has them and uh, in sequence. How long is it going to take? It's going on right now. It should only take a matter of a minute or two, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Just suspend for a minute or two.
Kevin, how are we coming along on those documents? We're already? Okay, uh, the gentleman from Maryland may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, my apologies, Congressman Barrett. Do you have this document in front of you now, sir? Um, looking at Exhibit 356-33, uh, your timesheet for March 15, 1995, Mr. O'Connor, uh, it reflects your first involvement in this matter, I think, basically was March 15, 1995, when you came here to Washington. Is that correct? I believe there may have been some involvement prior to that time. Uh, my recollection is I got involved in this matter in February. And I, I think, in fairness to you, sir, your time records would reflect some telephone calls, but I'm mainly addressing the first time you actually are at a meeting, and according to our review of the records, it is March 15, 1995, when you're here in Washington, I believe, Council. And looking at that entry, I note that you not only uh, met with officials at the Department of the Interior, but also at the Democratic National Committee. Isn't that correct? That's correct. In fact, uh, uh, there is a document which was produced pursuant to a subpoena issued to the Democratic National Committee, uh, Exhibit 299. And that exhibit, Mr. O'Connor, uh, Exhibit 299, which is on the projection screen here in, here in the hearing room, and I believe your attorney is about to locate it. Um, it is a memo from David Mercer uh, to Chairman Fowler, Don Fowler of the Democratic National Committee. Who is David Mercer, Mr. O'Connor? Uh, uh, David Mercer is an employee of, or was at that time, of the Democratic National Committee. And why would your first meeting be with the Democratic National Committee? Why would I be meeting with the Democratic National Committee? Yes, sir. In fact, looking again at your time records, Exhibit 356-33, with respect to your timesheet on this day, and again, we'll have it on the, on the television screen here in the hearing room, and there at the table before you, but apparently there may be a little difficulty in and seeing those, but they're being projected up on the screen now, um, and they're, they're in the exhibit book before you. Uh, at, on that page in your timesheets there, in fact, for March 15, again, this is mat these are matters you're billing the St. Croix Tribe for uh, in relation to your representation and stopping the casino of the Chippewa Indians. There's reference to meetings with various Democratic national campaign organizations. And my question to you, sir, again, is what would various national campaign organizations of the Democratic Party have to do with the application of the Chippewa Indians? Well, as uh, you're aware, uh, we met uh, on the 24th, uh, 28th, I believe, uh, yes, 28th of April, uh, with Chairman Fowler and several uh, uh, ch uh, uh, chiefs or chairmen of uh, Indian tribes that were involved in the uh, uh, Hudson Dog Track matter. Now, you're calling my attention now uh, to the meeting. March 15th, sir. I will get to the yes. April 28th meeting, presuming my time doesn't expire, right. but, but uh, the March 15th meeting is what I'm addressing now, sir. Yes. Uh, I should uh, say at the offset uh, that uh, I recorded time such as I recorded uh, as shown in this billing. I was not involved in the actual billing. Uh, that was uh, left uh, to uh, another par or to a partner in the firm. And I recorded time and uh, uh, whether or not uh, it was, uh, uh, whether or not I was paid for it or not, I don't know. Uh, because you should know that uh, we were on a retainer of $7,500 a month. And uh, uh, that would account for about 33 hours of time in a particular month at our rate of about $225 uh, 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 an hour. And, uh, and reviewing these records, I have seen that and every month in the six-month period, except one, uh, we went away over. Uh, so whether or not uh, I was paid, the fact remains I did 
record time, and I recorded this time. Uh, I don't recall at this uh, moment uh, what was discussed uh, at this meeting with the DNC, with uh, Truman, Arnold, and Chairman Don, Don Fowler. I don't recall what uh, transpired or, or what was discussed at that particular meeting. I do have recollections on the other meeting. Mr. Chairman, did you want to ask a question? Yes, real quickly. I guess I'm troubled because why would you be uh, discussing? I mean, your billing records show you billed the Chippewas, or not the Chippewas, but the Shakopee's, St. Croix tribe, St. Croix tribe, for this time. Why would you be billing them for time when you were discussing uh, uh, issues at the DNC uh, regarding that tribe? What, what was the purpose of you talking to the people at the DNC about this tribe at all? Uh, uh, the reason I would think that I put time down for meeting with Fowler on, on the 15th was the fact that I may very well have talked to Don Fowler about this, um, uh, about this issue, uh, about this application that's pending, that was pending. Well, Mr. O'Connor, why would the DNC be involved in any way in this application? Well, uh, uh, when we get to the 24th, we went to uh, Mr. Fowler to ask him whether or not uh, he would consider talking to Harold Ickes uh, about this matter. So, so you wanted Mr. Fowler to use his influence with Mr. Ickes to try to kill the application? No, no, Mr. Chairman. Well, then why would he not? Why would you uh, want him to talk uh, to Mr. Ickes? I can answer that. Sure. The reason that we wanted. Mr. Fowler to go talk to Harold Ickes was first, I wanted a, a, a meeting uh, with Mr. Ickes at some time with a couple uh, of people from the St. Croix tribe. Uh, I was hopeful uh, that uh, Mr. Ickes would give us such a meeting, and I was also hopeful that he might make an, uh, an inquiry over at Interior uh, and say, look, uh, people have approached me uh, on this issue and they feel you're not focusing on their opposition uh, to this application. Uh, so, that so was my hope. I understand, Mr. O'Connor. So, so the point was you wanted the DNC to use their influence to at least set up a meeting with Mr. Ickey so you could present your case. Uh, I think that's a fair statement. I question uh, influence. I would rather you call it what you want, but I wanted Mr. Fowler to see, because I knew he worked with Ickes, uh, whether Mr. Fowler would raise this issue with Mr. Ickes to see if I could get a meeting both with myself and with uh, my client, and um, also uh, so that we'd have an opportunity to discuss our concerns. That's true. When, when, and I, I don't want to infringe too much of your time, but when, when you were asking Mr. Fowler to do this and you weren't getting the proper results, you talked to some other people about getting access to Mr. Ickes and people at Interior, didn't you? Uh, in addition to Mr. Fowler, uh, yes. Who, who uh, did you talk to? I, I talked to Terry McCullough. Uh, and uh, what did Mr. McCullough say? I was uh, d um, in my meetings with Mr. McCullough, I was on his committee, and I was attempting to raise money, hard money, a thousand dollars, a individual, uh, for the committee to reelect in the primary. And during my discussions there, I did. I've known Terry for a long time. I did uh, tell him that I was having difficulty uh, getting uh, to uh, Harold Ickes, and I knew he saw him frequently. And I said. I, I'm trying to get a meeting with Harold Ickes, and uh, uh, would, would you, as a personal favor to me, would you uh, mention that to him? Huh? I might add, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't have a relationship with Mr. Ickes. I don't even think I ever met I, him. I understand, but you were trying to get access. No. Okay. Uh, did right. you talk to anybody else? Uh, well, I would have talked to anyone that I thought would get, help help me get it. Uh, did I talk to anyone else? 
my recollection is uh, the only people I talked to uh, were, uh, uh, were Fowler. I, I mentioned it, of course, uh, to uh, Mercer, and I talked to uh, Mr. Sh and Schneider. I talked to uh, McAuliffe. Did you I talk to Mr. Schneider? What? Did you talk to Mr. Schneider? Oh, yes, I did. What did Mr. Schneider tell you? Mr. Schneider, I asked uh, whether or not uh, if he were over at the White House and ran into these, would he mention it if he thought it was appropriate to do so? What did, and, he, what did he say then? Uh, when he reported back? Yes, sir. Huh? To did, me? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes. My recollection is on the phone he reported back to me and he said, I did talk to uh, uh, Ickes and he said he was looking into it. So, so you did, you were able to get to indirectly some access to Mr. Ickes and that he said he would look into it? Through uh, Mr. Schneider. Through Mr. Schneider. Yes. Mr. Bennett? Uh, Mr. O'Connor, uh, picking up on um, the matter of Mr. Schneider, uh, for the projection, this is page 13 of the prepared materials. And uh, Mr. O'Connor, if, if you will look, sir, on the matter of Mr. Schneider to pick up on the chairman's questions, yeah. if you'll look at your timesheets again, Exhibit 356-38. Yes. I think I know. There is, in fact, an entry. Can you pull the microphone a little bit closer? Can you pull the microphone a little bit closer? There is, in fact, an entry in that timesheet record for May 16, 1995, wherein you make a reference to getting a report from Tom Snyder that he talked to President Clinton. Do you see that notation in your billing record, sir? I recall that. And in fact, in a deposition taken by this committee, which has now been made public, uh, Mr. O'Connor, Mr. Schneider has indicated that in early May 1995, you asked him if he could help. And he explained that he did, in fact, speak with Harold Ickes. And to follow up on the point of Mr. Schneider, apparently his contacts with Mr. Ickes proved to have some weight, because I'll ask you, sir, to refer to Exhibit 312. Exhibit 312. It's a, a document, sir, which, while you're looking for it, I'll tell you, was produced by the White House pursuant to a subpoena issued by this committee. And it is, in fact, uh, a May 18, 1995 memorandum for Mr. Harold Ickes from Ms. Jennifer O'Connor. And there is specific reference to that May 18th memo to there having been a meeting last night by members of his staff on May 17th, the day after Mr. Snyder's contact, essentially indicating the rejection of the casino application. Were you aware that there was a meeting uh, of Mr. Ickes' staff the day after Mr. Snyder spoke with Mr. Ickes? Are you referring to Exhibit 312, sir? It's a, it's a a document You're referring to a uh, memorandum for Ickes from Jennifer O'Connor. That's correct. Who is a staffer for That's Dr. correct. Sir, Ickes. to my knowledge, Jennifer O'Connor is not related to you, and I'm not suggesting that she is. No, and but, she is. And I don't even know that you've even seen this document before. I assume you've not seen this document before, have you, sir? No, I don't believe. No, I haven't seen it. And I just to understand, the document was not produced by you. I'm just bringing your attention to the fact that your time records reflect Mr. Snyder speaking with Mr. Ickes, uh, requesting on May 16th, that memorandum reflects, the memorandum dated May 18th, reflects that the day before, the 17th of May, the day after Snyder spoke with Ickes, the staff of Harold Ickes had determined to reject the casino application. You don't have any knowledge of those meetings, do you, sir? No. no. Now, if I can, uh, Mr. O'Connor, uh, just stepping back for a minute in, in terms of uh, your attempted contacts with the White House, uh, looking at uh, Exhibit uh, 356, uh, page 35, your time entries for April 24, 1995. On that day, April 24, 1995, you, in fact, spoke with President Clinton directly about the Hudson dog crack issue, didn't you, Mr. O'Connor? Yes. And, in fact, the President uh, became involved, and he spoke with Bruce Lindsay, who called back to the White House from Air Force One. Isn't that correct? I don't know about his call back, but I did meet with the President, and I did meet 
on that date in Minneapolis with Bruce Lindsay. And in fact, you've been trying to get a hold of a woman named Loretta Avant at the White House, and it had some difficulty, and as a result of uh, this discussion, that same day, Ms. Avant did in fact contact you, isn't that correct? I was having difficulty uh, getting through to uh, Loretta, uh, do you pronounce it Avant? Avant, I believe is how she pronounces Avant. it. And, and she, in fact, as a result that same day, as a result of your speaking directly with the president and getting President Clinton involved in this process, you did receive a response back uh, from Ms. Avon. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, sir, I'll show you exhibits 304 and 305. And I believe in the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, that this is a matter that can be addressed by members of the committee uh, in some later questioning. But essentially, exhibits 304 and 305 one is a memorandum from Ms. Avant to Mr. Harold Ickes that same day, April 24, 1995. Uh, the other is another memorandum from Michael Schmidt of the Domestic Policy Council at the White House to Cheryl Mills of the White House Counsel's Office. Again, that same day, April 24, 1995. And in there, there is reference, particularly as to exhibit 304, Mr. O'Connor, there is reference in the exhibit, on exhibit 304, there is comments to the effect that it's a mistake for Pat O'Connor to be trying to tie the president into this issue. And then there's direct language in that exhibit that says, I'll, I'll read it for you in the interest of time, he, meaning you, must stop telling others that he has access to the White House on this issue. Uh, and then makes reference to this being political poison for the president. Did either Mr. Schmidt or Ms. Avant ever criticize you or voice any objection to your contact with the president or tell you this was political poison for President Clinton, Mr. O'Connor? Uh, I can answer that. Uh, first of all, I don't uh, know who I have since learned, but I don't know who Schmidt was. I don't. Uh, recall him being in a conversation on the telephone with me when I talked on that date uh, with Loretta Event or, Av or Advent. Uh, uh, and uh, I recall that conversation with her. Uh, it was a short conversation, but I definitely recall that conversation. And But no one ever voiced their, such criticism to you directly to your face or on the telephone? Nothing was said by um, uh, Advent or Ad, whatever. Uh, I'll just say Loretta, although I've never met her. I understand. Uh, uh, nothing was said in that conversation criticizing me uh, for anything. Or telling you to stay away from the president on this issue, or this no, would be political no, poison for the president. No. Directing your attention, just wrapping up here, Mr. Chairman, these last two minutes of my time, uh, to. Uh, exhibit 356, again, I believe it's uh, page 39, Council. Your entries from May 24, 1995, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, you, in fact, billed your client for uh, time you spent uh, dinner with Vice President Gore. Apparently, Vice President Gore also became involved in assisting you in stopping the application of the Wisconsin Indian Tribe. No, Mr. Gore did not get involved with me. In connection with that, uh, um, note uh, that was uh, recorded on that date of my time. Uh, that was uh, a, not a dinner, that was a reception, and that was an error in my part putting down dinner. It was a reception. But your client, it, it's contained in your client's billing records with respect to the contact with Vice President Gore. Yes, uh, uh, I did not contact uh, Vice President Gore then or any other time. But the indication in there uh, was a Gore dinner. It was a Gore reception. And I think that just placed uh, the, the event. It was at the Mayflower. Um, but it I, I don't mean to, sir, my time's about to run out. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, I believe others can perhaps follow up on the matter of Vice President Gore. Just one last question as my time is expiring. Exhibit 357 is your calendar book, sir. And page 23 of that exhibit are entries for May 5, 1995. And I'll conclude with this area of questioning, Mr. Chairman. We'll just allow time for the... What 
date? May 5, 1995, Council. And the entry is also in the, on the television monitor, monitor here in the hearing room. In that entry on May 5, 1995, Mr. O'Connor, you'll note there's an entry that underneath the Hudson Dog Track category says Indians-50 DNC, and then it references Larry Kitto, who I believe was the consultant with you on this matter, and then it also references the committee to reelect. In fact, that's a direct reference to political contributions that were, in fact, to be made by your client, the St. Croix Indian Tribe. Isn't that correct, Mr. O'Connor? Uh, 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 counsel, uh, what you're referring to there uh, is part of number three. Uh, and as counsel, as you are aware, uh, in my daytimer on the left-hand side are notes that I make uh, to... Uh, uh, refresh or to remind me of certain things. It does not contain any recording of billing. Uh, and so these comments relate to the committee to reelect. Well, Mr. O'Connor, in concluding, sir, in fact, along with the notation in your calendar of 50 DNC with respect to the St. Croix Indian tribe, in fact, sir, that's exactly the amount of money, $50,000, that the St. Croix Indian tribe. Con contributed to the Democratic National Committee. Are you aware of that, sir? I'm aware that one of the Indian tribes that we do not represent or did not represent uh, made a $50,000 of soft money contribution. No, sir, I'm I, aware of that. Sir, I believe later there will be follow-up questions. There are three different contributions from your client that total exactly $50,000. And I'm asking you, sir, whether or not that is a specific entry in your calendar to the political contribution that was going to be required of your client. If they made a $50,000 uh, contribution, uh, it would be, as you and I both know, uh, in the uh, ca uh, campaign uh, of statements, I should say they were. <laughs> they are, sir, and yes, those statements and reflect I, those yes, three. It would be in there. My reference, my, uh, uh, I don't recollect on this particular day, two and a half years ago, of what that 50 stands for, but in my judgment, I know that uh, 50,000 was mentioned as a goal uh, by uh, uh, McCullough to, uh, to see whether or not Kiddo and I could raise $50,000, uh, could raise $1,000 a person uh, from 50 Indians, not just our clients, but other Indians as well. And I remember Kiddo saying, uh, it's hard to raise that money from uh, Indians because they want to tie it into an event. But he said, I'll do what I can. And uh, my recollection uh, as to why these things appeared on five, I don't back away from them at all. Uh, but uh, my best judgment is that that 50 referred uh, to a goal uh, that was uh, uh, mentioned by, uh, by uh, uh, McCullough, uh, if, whether or not we could raise from 50 Indians $1,000 apiece. Yeah. I, I think my time is up, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Thank, Mr. You. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. O'Connor, pleased to see you here and uh, this opportunity. Please, I have this opportunity to ask you some questions. You've been a, lo a lawyer for around 50 years. Yes, yes, Congressman. And you've helped uh, lobby for clients for a large part of that time. That's correct, Congressman. And I imagine that you know how our political system works and how it doesn't work. It seems to me that what we have here with your work on behalf of the St. Croix tribe is the same sort of lobbying that occurs every day in Washington and in our state capitals and all manner of issues. Uh, there seems to be some suggestion that uh, that something more is being made out of your lobbying than there is, uh, and, uh, and that uh, you were doing something improper or illegal in helping get your clients' views heard. You're a lobbyist. You've got a strategy. You're trying to get your clients' position heard by the decision makers. Right. Isn't that what's going on? That's correct. So you, you talk to anybody you can in politics, it hopes that they'll flag the issue, help you get a meeting 
so you can present your client's point of view or they can present their point of view. Isn't that what's going on? It's, there was nothing different, Congressman, in the way I approached this lobbying issue than I would approach any other lobbying issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you hope they'll come up with a decision that's favorable, but your job is to get the arguments to them, to let them know that there's an issue there they ought to give a little extra attention to. Isn't that what that, you're trying to do? That's correct. Okay. Now, um, you uh, talk to a number of people, and you try to get them to talk to others. You talk to um, Mr. Fowler, who's the head of the Democratic National Committee. I did. You talk to uh, Mr. Snyder. You talk to uh, Mr. Schmidt. Is that right? These are all fundraisers. Uh, Schmidt. To... I, I don't recall uh, Schmidt. Um, uh, there, uh, I, I checked some of these memos uh, in the White House, uh, and there was a Schmidt involved in with Avant, with Loretta. Uh, but I don't recall any particular Schmidt that I talked to about uh, contributions. Well, that's, then maybe that's my error. But you talked to others to try to get a oh, meeting yes. with Harold Ickes. Did you ever have a meeting with Harold Ickes? No. Did you ever talk to Harold Ickes? No. He called me twice on two different days, one after another, and I returned those calls and talked to a man in his office, uh, and uh, and that man said Ickes wasn't there, but uh, uh, then I asked whether or not uh, Mr. Ickes would get back to me. Okay. Did Mr. Ickes indirectly or implicitly send a message to you that should the tribes make a contribution, uh, that, uh, that they better make a contribution if they went, wanted their application den denied? No. What about Secretary Babbitt? Did he make any suggestions to you uh, uh, directly I, or indirectly? A uh, Congressman, I never talked to Secretary Babbitt on this issue. Okay. Did you uh, ever offer to anyone at the White House, the DNC, or the Clinton-Gore campaign that the tribes were willing to trade campaign contributions in exchange for the Department of Interior making a decision in your favor? Absolutely not. And did anyone at the White House, the DNC, or the Clinton-Gore campaign ever tell you that a contribution from the opponent tribes would help them get the Hudson application denied? No one uh, from any source ever told me that. You. Uh, talked to a number of people, and you even talked to the head man. You talked to President Clinton. You saw him at a campaign reception. Is that right? Uh, no. Uh, it was not a campaign reception. He was in Minneapolis to address the Association of Community Colleges. And after that, uh, he came in on what we call a meet and greet. And I was uh, advised by someone, if I wanted to greet him at that time, uh, there, after that uh, discussion uh, or address, uh, that the, he would be in a room nearby. And I was there, but it was not a fundraiser. So you had an opportunity to say something to him, and you raised the question of your client's concerns. Yes. And then what happened? He referred uh, you to uh, someone else. Uh, the president said, uh, uh, Bruce, uh, come over here. Meeting Bruce and, Lindsay. And, and talk to Mr. O'Connor. Uh, he has a matter he wants to discuss. That was Bruce Lindsay? Yes. And then what happened? Did you talk to Bruce I Lindsay? I talked to Bruce Lindsay. And, and what happened from that? I, I said to Mr. Lindsay, uh, 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 my clients uh, have a, a real concern. Uh, there is an application pending at Interior uh, to create um, a off-reservation uh, trust land uh, at a uh, for a casino in Hudson, Wisconsin, which is across the river from us here, and uh, uh, I believe, and my clients believe, uh, that in the staff that's working on this is in Interior is not focusing on our uh, opposition and why we're opposing, and the data that we submitted. Uh, uh, pointing out the adverse consequences 
consequences that would occur. And what did uh, Mr. Lindsay then say or do? Mr. Lindsay, uh, oh, I also said I've been trying to reach Loretta event. And uh, Mr. Lindsay said uh, to me, uh, uh, are you going to be in your office this afternoon in Minneapolis? I said, yes. He said, you will be getting some calls. Uh, he said, I think you'll get a call from Loretta event and, uh, uh, and perhaps from Harold Ickes. And did you get, you did not get a call from Harold Ickes? I, oh, he called. But you didn't make contact. We never made contact. Did you, he did called you make, twice, that day and the following day. Did, did uh, you get uh, a chance to talk to Loretta Event? Yes. And tell us about that conversation. Um, uh, she called me, and uh, uh, she uh, 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 said, uh, uh, Mr. O'Connor, the reason that I haven't returned your calls is there are 400 tribes, and I only talk uh, to the chairman or the chiefs. Uh, I do not talk to lobbyists. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, she made the rather clear to me uh, that she wasn't going to discuss this issue with me. And uh, so I thanked her, and uh, that it was a short conversation. So you and representing your client tried to get the, de the, the decision makers to focus on this issue. And it turned out the decision was made in your favor, in your client's favor. Yes. Do you, from your own personal knowledge, do you have any reason to believe that the Department of Interior's decision was made because of campaign contributions from your no, clients? No. And uh, uh, Congressman, further, uh, uh, I failed to uh, uh, talk to Mr. Rickies. I tried, uh, but I never talked to him. Well, the decision was made, and we heard from the people who made the decision. Yes. And they told us, under oath, they made the decision because it was the right decision as they saw it on the merits. They said there was no political interference or influence, and um, that's, that's the record. Do you have anything to, reason to dispute that? No, and uh, my recollection is the only person in the staff that I talked to, well, two, uh, I had a meeting uh, with Collier, and also there was a deputy assistant secretary there, a woman. Well, I, I yes. Sub, sub, subsidian, uh, no. What? Sibison. Uh, those are the only two people that I talked to at Interior. And, and, you, and you made your case to them on behalf of your client? Yes. Well, you know, the White House gets blamed for a lot of things that uh, they supposedly did wrong. It sounds like in this case they did everything right. They did what they should have done. They tried to uh, get the information, and, uh, and that was it. Um, you build your clients for attending some fundraising activities. I didn't build them, Congressman. I recorded time uh, that I spent. Uh, in some fundraising activities for this client. If that's an issue between you and your client. It has yep. nothing to do with the Department of Interior, the White House, Chairman Burton, or myself. Isn't that right? No. Uh, had nothing to do with that. I submitted my uh, time, and a partner in the office made the billing. You, uh, the billing. You, you've been an active Democrat over the years, and you helped raise money for the campaign. I have, for a lot of campaigns. For a lot of campaigns. And you were, in doing that, uh, uh, hoping that when Democrats are in power, you can try to get their attention to get the case made to them on behalf of your client. Is that what's going on here? Uh, I am a, just a trifle uh, hard of hearing. Uh, uh, could you state that again, Congressman? Well, it seems to me you had two discrete things that you were doing. You were doing some fundraising, and you were lobbying for your clients. That's correct. Uh, and you were keeping track of the time you were spending in both areas. Yes, that's true. What I fail to see is, if that's true, what that has to do with the decision, unless the decision had to do with the money that was paid to the Democratic Party. 
uh, I agree. Uh, as far as my actions were concerned, uh, I don't see how the uh, contributions that I was involved in or knew about had any bearing on the decision that was made by Interior. Uh, uh, and I answered before uh, that uh, uh, I never asked anyone uh, to, uh, as a result of being involved in contribution, will, will you see that this, a a a this application is denied? Um, it's interesting just to note that uh, no one on this committee has even talked to Harold Ickes. People think Harold Ickes might have done something, but the best way to find out whether he did anything was to ask him, but we haven't even asked him whether he did anything. As far as you know, did Harold Ickes intervene in this whole issue? I don't know what if anything, Harold Dickey's did. I tried to reach him on behalf of my clients on more than one occasion. I also asked others to, uh, that knew him uh, if, if he would uh, uh, look into it. Um, but I never, uh, I never talked to Mr. Ickes. In fact, the only time I've ever seen him is on certain briefings and maybe two or three uh, at the committee to re-elect where he gave a briefing on the status of the campaign. And I don't recall that even at those briefings, I even went up and shook his hand. Well, I thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate it. I have more time, and I want to yield five minutes to uh, my colleague, Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much. Mr. O'Connor, welcome. Thank you. I have often used the phrase trivial pursuit during the course of these hearings. And I don't think the phrase was ever more appropriate than it is today. I'm fortunate to have 17 grandchildren. And one of the great joys of having grandchildren is to see how each generation rediscovers things that the rest of us, having been through those experiences, already know. It's wonderful to see that Lassie is a new phenomenon, or Mickey Mouse, or Donald Duck, or Bert and Ernie. And every time we have a new generation, these are exciting new things. But it is difficult to have a straight face when middle-aged lawyers or middle-aged congressmen pretend to virginal naivete with respect to lobbying activities. And of course, this is what we had a, a display of for the first half hour of this hearing. Now, as far as I understand, there are about 10,000 lobbyists in this town. And um, they pursue a tremendous variety of goals and objectives, some noble, some ignoble, ranging for, from getting uh, better schools for children to uh, peddling tobacco. Now, in what sense did this particular lobbying activity differ from any other lobbying activity that you have engaged in, or the other, whatever number it is, 10,000 lobbyists engage in? I don't know of any difference. Uh, uh, lobbying, uh, I think, is an honorable profession. Uh, I am a lobbyist. I have been a lobbyist for a long period of time. And this was just another matter uh, that I lobbied along with others in uh, our firm. And one of the others in the firm who was, I believe, the principal lobbyist on this issue happened to be a former Republican member of Congress. That is correct. So you really had a Republic, former Republican congressman and you and maybe others who lobbied on behalf of this client. Yes. Since there has been such a strained and unsuccessful attempt to tie money to lobbying, fundraising to mon uh, lobbying, let me read to you, um, Mr. O'Connor, a piece from the Washington Post 
dated November 25, 1995, describing a lobbyist meeting with majority with Tom DeLay. And this lobbyist is shown a book that lists the amounts and percentages of money that the 400 largest political action committees contributed to Republicans and to Democrats during the preceding cycle. Now, the preceding cycle was the cycle that just preceded the great Republican sweep of 1994. And this is what the Washington Post says. I quote, by the time the lobbyist had left the congressman's office, that's Tom DeLay's office, he knew that to be a friend of the Republican leadership, his group would have to give the party a lot more money, end quote. So here we have, in about as distilled a fashion as we could, as to what happens in this town when political power shifts. This lobbyist apparently went in to see the whip, and the whip, as many other news stories indicated, ex <clears throat> expressed unhappiness of previous uh, donation patterns and wanted those shifted. And of course, as the evidence clearly shows in the form of FEC records, that shift has now taken place. So what I find rather amusing, perhaps I should say nauseating, is this pretense of virginal naivete in the face of, uh, of a lobbying activity, which as far as I can tell, was no different from literally thousands of other lobbying actions that take place in this city and in state capitals across the country. I don't find the pattern attractive. I think we need to change it. I think we need to change it drastically. But the attempt by the council for the other side to rediscover what lobbies do is so strained and artificial and insincere as to, as to boggle the mind and even the imagination. I would merely like to ask one question, if I may, of a general nature. It seems to me that in every field of human endeavor, Defeat is often an orphan, and victory has many parents. Isn't it customary for lobbyists, and I don't mean you, but lobbyists in general, to claim credit for things that happen even though they would have happened without their intervention? Is that a common affliction of lobbyists? I believe it is. And it is this uh, unique affliction of lobbies which perhaps explains why some of them have such extraordinary incomes, because they succeed in brainwashing their clients that had it not been for their unique intervention, uh, the project would have failed. I, I believe that that has uh, happened in the past, but uh, Congressman, in my case, I, I failed. Uh, I never got to, icky, uh, to, uh, to Ickes. All right. I think my time is up. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Th thank you, Mr. Lantos. I want to yield to Mr. Kanjorski. Uh, uh, Mr. O'Connor, uh, of course, uh, you're an unusual lobbyist to admit that you never even got the ball and got it over the goalpost, so you couldn't make the artificial claims that Mr. Lantos talked about. But to put this in perspective, uh, 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 here we have two contestant parties interested in something that could be financially very rewarding to either one, depending on the victory, and uh, apparently brought the heaviest guns to bear 
to, to try and penetrate either the Department of Interior or even the White House to have whatever influence could be brought to bear, if there was any that could be brought to bear. In the process of doing that, we've heard a lot of names that are very familiar to the American public, Harold Ickes, uh, Secretary Babbitt, uh, the various other people involved. And when the day is over and the record is closed and we all go home, those names will never stop having penetrated the minds of some people that by virtue of the fact that they were brought up or mentioned, there will forever be a stain. And that's an unfortunate part of the history of Washington, it seems to me. Uh, let me just follow in, in, in this course. Your firm and you individually, well, I should say you individually as part of your firm, you're more associated on the Democratic side of things. Is that correct? That's correct. But you do have a former member of Congress who was an elected Republican member of Congress, Mr. Cochran of uh, Illinois, who really handled sort of the Republican side of this thing. Is that correct? Yes, along with other Republicans. Okay. And, and he was really the signator of this re retainer contractor agreement that you had, your, that your firm had. He was actually one that signed on behalf of the firm as the, quote, chief lobbyist. Is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, Congressman. I am a little uh, hard of hearing. Could you say that again? It was actually Mr. C uh, Corcoran that signed the retainer agreement on behalf of your firm. That's correct. The tribe. So that he was the direct contract party and chief lobbyist for this exercise. Uh, that's correct. He's a partner. Right. And, and you've been kind enough to concede that you weren't very fortunate, although you tried to contact people that you knew to see if you could move the process or find out what was happening. You failed. I failed as far as Mr. Ickes was concerned. But, and, uh, yes. but the result uh, that ultimately was made by people that uh, uh, in the department that were not the people that you contacted that, and that uh, were that people in the professional reign of the, uh, of the organization made the decision that benefited your client. And then the logic, as I understand it for the last several days here, is that a sort of a post-hoax fallacy that also your clients contributed money. And our friends on the other side of the aisle would like us to assume that by virtue of that, after that fact, that is evidence alone that something improper was done or accomplished here, and that it stemmed from the payment uh, or donation of campaign monies to the Democratic National Committee. Is that correct? Uh, the, the, uh, in 1992 and, of course, in the subsequent campaign, uh, 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 Indian clients of ours donated money uh, to uh, the... Uh, both to the DNC, uh, to the uh, committee to reelect, and also to members of Congress. I see. Now, you know, the interesting thing here, I've looked at our panel that we're going to have before us, and there is another very accomplished lobbyist in town, Mr. Eckstein. I've seen his name, but I don't see him on the uh, panel. And he apparently did actually get the occasion to talk three times to the Secretary of Interior. But for some reason, his direct testimony is not necessary to the American people. It's, uh, it's a testimony of people who uh, never made the score, didn't get the contact. But the person got the contact that we'd like to ask, exactly what did you say and exactly did, what did Secretary Babbitt say? They'll never appear before this committee or never be on the record in an open session. Is that correct? That's correct. You know, uh, we also have who, one, one, an outstanding uh, former governor and uh, a, a cabinet officer and I, I think uh, certainly an a outstanding uh, member of the bar that could eventually stand for the Supreme Court if nominated, Mr. Babbitt, and he's taken a lot of heat on this thing. He certainly has, and he's a very able person. And it, it seems to me that... Uh, uh, he, just reading the record and looking forward to his testimony tomorrow, but uh, a, a uh, law school classmate exercised his ability to meet face to face with a cabinet officer who was not directly involved in the decision. 
did not take any action and decision, and it was made by professionals much lower in his agency, that he has to now have his name questioned, his integrity and his honor questioned. And uh, it stems from another lobbyist who was retained by the other side in this case, that the majority party doesn't see fit to put us before him so we can ask him questions of what happened and, and get the best recall. We're just going to have to, I guess, rely on the public press and the insults uh, cast about in the public press to Secretary Babbitt and Mr. Ickes and the administration and whoever you will. That's an unfortunate uh, uh, result. I agree. Mr. Kanjorski, I, I, we have only five minutes left, and I wanted to yield some of the time to Mrs. Maloney, but we'll have an opportunity. In the Very good. I'll yield back to you, Mr. Chairman, so you can uh, you. I yield to Mrs. Maloney. Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, when you uh, contacted officials or attempted to contact officials in government or in campaigns on behalf of your client, you had a very strong story to tell in terms of the degree of community opposition. Is that correct? Uh, Ma'am, uh, again, I got to apologize. Uh, I am some, uh, somewhat uh, hard of hearing, and I'm not using uh, hearing aid, although my wife claims that I should. Could, could you just say that again? I'm, I'm going to, Mr. Connor, speak up. Uh, when, when you um, contacted officials in government or attempted to contact officials in government or in campaigns on behalf of your client, you had a very strong case to make in terms of the degree of community opposition. Is it not correct that the entire Minnesota delegation was opposed to the casino developers uh, from Florida's plans, as well as the Wisconsin as well as the Republican congressman from the area, as well as the local people. Is that a correct statement? That is a correct statement. I'd like to uh, ask you if you agree with this, the testimony of Mr. Scabine, do you believe that this decision was made entirely on the merits? I do believe that that's what happened. Do you believe that uh, campaign contributions or political influence determined the outcome of this matter in any way? Absolutely not. In this case, we had a very, uh, we had two sides. Both sides had lawyers. Both sides had uh, well-paid lobbyists. Both sides uh, made contributions. And I'd like to ask you, um, it, it has been widely reported that both sides made contributions, one side to the Democratic committee, other members uh, made contributions to the Republican uh, committee. And uh, the majority of these contributions on both sides was soft money, correct? It was soft money. Uh, I can only speak on our side, mm -hmm. and that was the side that opposed the application. Uh -huh. uh, both soft money and hard money um, was involved because I believe some of our in, uh, clients uh, contributed to the committee to reelect in the amount of a thousand dollars. Last night, the president, in his State of the Union address, uh, called upon Congress to ban soft money, so that large contributions could not be given to parties for party building. In your opinion, do you think that if we banned soft money, as the president called for? that it would help eliminate concerns about purchasing influence over policy? Uh, I certainly do. You, you support the president's I position? I support the president on, soft, on his position on soft money. And, and in this case, in many cases in which two teams are out there, two sets of lobbyists, they're winners and losers. And uh, when the winner later makes contributions, there will inevitably be an appearance of impropriety. And I'd like to ask you, do you think that banning soft money might remove uh, the appearance that decisions can be purchased? I believe that because soft money is usually in har a large amounts and it raises the question, uh, why would uh, he or she give a large amount of money if there wasn't uh, some uh, economic reason for it. 
I, I would like to follow up on the questioning of my colleague, Mr. Lantos, and he used the term trivial pursuit. I, I, I would like to use the term common sense. Let me tell you, if the New York delegation, of which I am a member, was united in opposition to a casino in their state, and Interior overruled us, let me tell you, we would have taken the issue to the floor. We, you would have never heard the end of it. And what I don't understand, I, I, I feel like, what is the fuss? If Interior had decided against what in their, this memo that Mr. Bennett cited, uh, 312, from Jennifer O'Connor to Harold Ickes, she begins one paragraph. She says, the local community is almost uniformly opposed to the proposed casino. And again, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I truly believe if Interior had decided any way except the way they did, we would have heard such an outcry from every Republican in this Congress for overruling community input, the position not only of the congressional delegation, the state senators, the, the, the uh, city council members, the assembly people that represented the area. People are elected to represent the point of view, oftentimes, of their constituents. If every constituent is telling you, we don't want a casino, what do you expect them to do? If, if Interior had overruled the delegation, I can't speak for the Wisconsin and Minnesota delegation, but I truly believe we would have seen a bill in Congress to reverse the position of Interior, and I, for one, would have supported them in the opposition uh, that supported the community's point of view against the casino developer from Florida. My time is up. I have quite a few more uh, questions for you, Mr. O'Connor. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Hasker, you're recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman. I just uh, remind the gentlewoman, I guess she wasn't here last week when Mr. Scavine mm -hmm. testified uh, that he was the person in Indian Affairs and Gaming that had to make that decision, that that was the first time in the history of making a decision about whether tribes had uh, gaming privileges or not or the license to do that, uh, that took into the effect what public opinion was. So, and the fact that it wasn't in Minnesota, it happened to be in Wisconsin, a different state. Uh, than the objectors, <clears throat> but I would like to go on to another issue. Since my name was mentioned in reserve my time. The gentleman has the time; he doesn't yield. <clears throat> Mr. O'Connor, a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, Mr. O <clears throat> Corcoran, Tom Corcoran, was deposed. Uh, Tom Corcoran happened to be my one of my predecessors in the Congress, a good friend of mine and a fine gentleman. Uh, but in his discussion, uh, there was a talk about the frustration he talked about in his deposition, the frustration of not being able to get in contact with Mr. Ickes. And in fact, the discussion with Ickes never took place, but the communication did. That in fact, he testifies that, um, that he signed a letter that you sent to him, and with your permission, he signed your name to the letter. And that letter then was uh, message by messenger went to the White House and it was also <coughs> faxed to Mr. Ickes at the White House. And basically, I'll read uh, the what happens here and it says that uh, I had been informed by Pat O'Connor that because he was unable to reach Mr. Ickes by telephone, that he was going to send a letter to Mr. Ickes. He subsequently sent a, a draft of that letter and he asked me to assist in reviewing it to make sure that the facts were correct. And he also asked me to facilitate its delivery to Mr. Ickes because Mr. O'Connor at that time was in Minneapolis. So I assisted him in both respects. It goes on to say that a question uh, about what was in the letter. And it says, uh, the question is to Mr. Uh, Corcoran, uh, if I make reference to what would be page two, and it's really number four, that uh, I want to address right now what number four says. And it says, all of the representatives of the tribes 
that went, met with Chairman Fowler are Democrats and have been so for years. And I can testify to their previous financial support to the DNC and to the 1992 Clinton-Gore Campaign Committee. Now, that was a reference just to refresh people's memory, right? It was in my letter uh, that, uh, uh, pardon me, it was in my letter uh, dated uh, May 8th that right. went to Harold Ickes. Right. And then he goes on to say, Pat O'Connor told me that with respect to item four, that he wanted to get the further attention of the chairman of the Democratic Party, and that the opponents, not only our client, but other tribes, were, in Pat's words, good Democrats. Uh, can you say that again? Uh, well, I'd be happy to. Yes. It says, Pat O'Connor, this is Mr. Corcoran testifying, yes. Yes. told me that with respect to item four, that he wanted to get further attention of the chairman of the Democratic Party, that the opponents, not only our client, but other tribes, were, in Pat's words, good Democrats. That the opponent. I'm the, getting confused. The, the, about otherwise, the Minnesota we the Indians opponents. who didn't want the, the horse or the dog track and casino in Wisconsin, that your clients, in essence, were good Democrats. Yes, our clients were the Democrats. Fine. So sometimes there's a fine line, and Mr. Lantos said it, I guess, very well, between what decisions makes and, and politics. I mean, it's there. It's part of the essence of this business. Uh, Corcoran concluded by saying, the only other contact that I know of with respect to anybody from O'Connor and Hannon with the president was a casual contact, not really a lobbying contact, that Tom Schneider told me about. Tom Schneider is a, a member of your law firm, is that right? That's Sorry. correct. Yeah. Was at that time. Yeah. As I recall, a day or so after it happened, Mr. Schneider, a good friend of the president, uh, he was attending a reception, and they were chatting. And in the course of that chat, the president indicated that Pat O'Connor had mentioned this dog track to him. They both had a pretty good laugh about it, that the president of the United States had been informed about a dog track in Wisconsin. And I must say that Tom and I had a pretty good laugh about it as well. So you've, you did get this communication to higher levels, is that correct? Uh, I I did get the communication to the President of the United States. And, and you did write the letter to Harold Eckes. And, and I did write so a letter to Harold So there was communication to Eckes. That's Eckes. correct. I just wanted to set that straight. Uh, finally, uh, there's an exhibit 357-23, uh, and it's on your calendar. And you note that you have a notation concerning that the Hudson dog, dog track uh, that there's a reference to Loretta Avant, and we talked about her. And she's the person who said, no, absolutely, this thing's there's an impropriety here, and I'm not going to talk to you about it, right? That, she hey. never said that, uh, uh, that it was an impropriety to me, but she said she didn't want to talk about so it. So she did the right thing. She, Basically, from her perspective, she did the right thing. From her, I don't wish to speak about her perspective, Fine. But I don't think I there was anything that. improper about me asking her. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, Mr. O'Connor, you'll note that there's an entry there underneath the Hudson dog, dog track in your thing that says Indians 50 DNC. Now, I'm not sure if that's 50 Indians or 50 tribes. Could have been $50, but you probably wouldn't have put a thing down for $50. Could that have been $50,000 that uh, uh, you had talked about Larry Kiddo? reference the committee to re-elect? Uh, 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 Congressman, I believe that that uh, uh, reference, and this was on the part uh, on the left-hand side of my regular day, order. day timer, where I put down things to remind me to do things. Uh, uh, this, uh, the Indians 50 DNC Larry Kiddo Committee to re-elect. My, uh, I don't recollect when I put that down and why I put it down, but I do know that it refers to number three, which is the committee to reelect. And my, uh, my feeling about it would be uh, that that 50 
probably relates to what uh, uh, Terry McCullough asked uh, me and Larry Kiddo to do, and that is get 50 different Indians, uh, whether clients of ours or not, to contribute $1,000 a piece of hard money. In conclusion, if I may, just one final, I'd like to uh, look at, have, enter exhibit uh, C113, uh, which says DNC, DNC Services Corporation, DNC, and Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, and adds up to $50,000. So maybe that's a coincidence, but I, I don't know. I yield back the remainder of my time. With, without Chair. objection, uh, Senator. Gentlelady yeah. will state her, point, state her point. Point of personal privilege, since my name was uh, mentioned by Mr. Hastert, uh, he stated that I only... Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I did not mention the, the lady's name. I said a colleague from New York. M Mr. Hastert had the time. Uh, you are recognized, I think, next to five Chip minutes, or is Ms. Waxman? Okay. Mr. Point Parent? of personal... Well, the, I did mention that uh, both with Wisconsin and the Wisconsin delegation that went on record Republicans uh, Roth, Republican Gunderson were opposed to the project, uh, as well as the minister. Uh, this is a regular Barrett, order, you're, you're Mr. Chairman. Order right now. Mr. Barrett, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, Mr. Yeah, O'Connor. You're right, it is. Mr. O'Connor over here, to your left. Way over here, way over here, I think. Yes, and Congressman from Wisconsin. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you for being here today. I'm not a very good dancer, so I'm not gonna dance around the issue. Your client gave a lot of money to the Democratic National Committee. Yes. Did you ever offer to anyone at the White House that your client was willing to give campaign contributions in exchange for the Department of Interior making a decision in your favor? Absolutely not. Did you ever offer to anyone at the DNC that your client was willing to give campaign contributions in exchange for the Department of Interior making a decision in your favor? I did. I never said that to anyone at the DNC or anywhere else. Did you ever offer to anyone on the Clinton-Gore campaign that your client was willing to give campaign contributions in exchange for the Department of Interior making a decision in your favor? I never made such a request. Now let me ask it the other way. Did anyone at the White House ever tell you that a contribution from your client would help them get the Hudson application denied? No one in the White House said that to me. Did anyone at the DNC ever tell you that a contribution from the opponents, opponent tribes would help them get the Hudson application denied? No one at the DNC ever said uh, that to me. Did anyone at the Clinton-Gore campaign ever tell you that a contribution from the opponent tribes would help them get the Hudson application denied? No one at the uh, Clinton-Gore committee to re-elect uh, ever said anything uh, like that to me. Do you know of anyone who either made or received any offers of that kind? I know of no one uh, that ever made such a statement or offer. And you are under oath today? A what? You are under oath. Oh, I'm aware I'm under oath. Thank you. I'd like to go to Exhibit 312, which is something that we have talked about a little bit earlier today, I think Mr. Bennett made reference to it. It's a memorandum for Harold Ickes from Jennifer O'Connor. Do you know what Jennifer O'Connor's title was or what her role was? I, I don't. I don't. Mr. Bennett, maybe you could help us with that? For the record, Congressman, I know that she's on uh, Mr. Ickes' staff. I don't know what her title is. Okay. Um, and this was May 18, 1995. Yes. The smoking gun in all of this is, that, again, that there was some sort of improper influence that was asserted um, and that drove this decision. But if you look at this memorandum, what, what are the reasons in this memorandum why this off-reservation proposal was going to be denied? If you could take a look at that. Sure. Well, this memorandum uh, 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 for Harold Ickes from Jennifer O'Connor points out that the local community is almost uniformly opposed uh, to the proposed casino. Uh, and it goes into the fact that the Minnesota delegation is also uniformly uh, opposed to the proposal. 
Um, uh, and it goes on to say the Minnesota tribes located near the state border feel they would be adversely impacted by the competition. Are those, to your knowledge, the correct assertions? To my knowledge, uh, I believe that these were uh, factors uh, that uh, were brought to the attention of the interior and uh, uh, to what extent uh, they weighed into the interior's decision, I'm not privy to. Okay. You are aware of the fact that the, the actual denial letter did lead off with the local opposition. I, I'm well aware of it. And you're aware that the letter also referred to opposition from other tribes, although I don't know that it mentioned Minnesota tribes. You, you are aware that the letter of denial also mentioned opposition from other tribes. Yes, I'm aware of that. When you talked to President Clinton in that line in, in Minneapolis, were you, were you frustrated with the woman who hadn't returned your call? Why did, why did you complain to the President of the United States? Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, characterize it as frustrated. I just told the President uh, that I wasn't getting uh, calls returned uh, from Loretta event at the White House. And she did ultimately return your call. What? She did ultimately return your call. She, that particular day. That she, particular day. She called me. Let me just say there, there have been occasions when I as a congressman am out in the community and someone will say to me, I have contacted your office, I haven't gotten a response. What I will immediately do is turn to the staff person next to me and say, what's the problem? Let's get back to that person. I'm, I'm pleased that the president's staff got back that quickly. But in any event, she got back and said the, re and the reason she gave for not getting back to you was again? Uh, the reason, uh, she said, uh, I deal with 400 different Indian tribes, and I only talk uh, to uh, the chairman of the tribes or the chiefs of the tribe. And in fact, her memorandum which is also in this record, says that this issue is such a hot issue, the, the White House wants to stay away from it. Isn't that correct? She never made that comment to me. No, but now in, in hindsight, we're, we're aware of, oh, of yes, that as well. Oh, yes, we're aware of it. You never got to see Bruce Babbitt on this issue? No, I did not. Did your counterpart, Mr. Eckstein, ever get to see Bruce Babbitt on this issue? Oh, I've read uh, quite a lot about that, and of course I observed... Uh, 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 Secretary Babbitt's uh, uh, testimony over on the Senate side. Um, and I, I believe he's not only a former classmate of the uh, secretaries, but I believe he might have been also a partner of uh, Secretary Babbitt when he was in the private practice. And finally, again, just for the record, the, the person from your law firm whose letter is on the the retainer letter, and I don't know if this has been introduced into the record, but if it's not, I would ask unanimous consent to have it introduced into the record, um, is Mr. Corcoran, who is in fact that a objection. former Republican congressman from Illinois, and you are not mentioned in this letter, is that correct? Uh, 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 Mr. Corcoran, it's true, he's a former Republican congressman, but I don't Mr. blame him, we Cor all have problems, I don't yeah. blame him for that. Uh, Mr. Corcoran was the partner uh, uh, in charge and responsible in supervising this particular client. But you are not mentioned in this letter, are you? I mean, I, I do not see your name Which in, the, in the, the retainer letter that is signed oh, by the, I, the Republican. I doubt, I doubt if I'd be mentioned in it. I don't think I ever saw the letter. Okay, thank you. I don't think I have any further time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, California, Mr. Cox. Thank the Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, and for the benefit of your counsel, the exhibits to which I'll be referring are 304, 305-1, and 311-A, 3 and 4. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, are you aware that the White House Counsel's Office uh, uh, advises that uh, the White House should be kept away from lobbyists on uh, Indian matters? On what? On Indian matters. Am I aware of it? Yes. No, I'm not aware of it. Okay, we'll just keep it. Just uh, keep it. We have in Exhibit 304 uh, a memo from the Executive Office of the President 
that states, uh, as you know, last year White House counsel advised Loretta, referring to the very Loretta event that we've been discussing here, uh, that she should not meet with lobbyists or lawyers on Indian issues. On April 24, 1995, in a memo to Harold Ickes, whom you had gotten involved in this, and he was obviously uh, very, very senior at the White House, uh, from Loretta event, uh, she advises Harold Ickes, quote, the legal implications of our involvement, meaning the White House, would be disastrous. Um, you then wrote a letter after that, uh, again to Ickes, having already gotten him involved, in which you laid out political reasons, political reasons for, uh, uh, not legal reasons, but political reasons for rejecting the application that was then before Interior, you said in your letter of May 8th, 1995, quote, I'm concerned that those at Interior, not those at the White House, but those at Interior who were involved are leaning toward creating trust lands. And your clients, of course, were paying you to stop that. Uh, and you wanted, in your letter, you say, quote, to relate the politics involved in this situation. Number one, Governor Thompson of Wisconsin, uh, a Republican, I note, uh, supports this project, the opposite view of your clients. Uh, number two, Senator Al D'Amato, a Republican, uh, I interpolate, uh, supports this project. Uh, number three, uh, the chairman of the Indian tribe in the forefront of this project, which you oppose, is active in Republican Party politics. Now, I would like uh, to ask the staff to uh, uh, put up uh, a video quickly. with the sound as well. Called access. Far away from cameras, the White House is putting access to its officials up for sale at this convention. Okay. A private club, so we have to ask you to step off the ground. For their money, 50 and $100,000 contributors to the Democratic Party can play golf or have a private meeting over drinks or take a luncheon cruise with powerful government officials like Transportation Secretary Federico Peña who makes decisions every day that affect the profits of all kinds of corporations. So many of the big money crowd showed up for this cruise that even a multi-million dollar contributor had to wait in line. We're seven and a half million dollars I gave the for what? Can't get on the damn boat. Of course, the seven and a half million dollar man finally did get on the Democrats' boat. If you have a lot of money and you raise a lot of money for them, you'll be able to see them quite a bit. And everyone else is left out in the cold. 300 miles north of Chicago. That's just what the leaders of this impoverished Wisconsin Indian tribe, part of the Chippewas, say happened to them. They were left out of the cold when the Clinton administration stopped plans to expand the tribe's small casino operation. It was uh, quite the rude awakening of uh, internal politics from their uh, White House staff. The Chippewas Casino expansion plan was opposed by a group of rival wealthier tribes with their own big casinos, who hired a well-connected Democratic lobbyist and made more than $75,000 in contributions to the Democratic Party, something the Chippewas couldn't afford. No, I wish I had 75000 to hire a full-time doctor on annual basis, son. We're still trying to meet those basic needs. Yeah. The lobbyist is this man, Patrick O'Connor a big contributor, as well as a former Democratic Party national treasurer, who today was making the rounds here in Chicago. The decision to stop the Chippewas Casino expansion came just after O'Connor wrote this letter to White House Deputy Chief of Staff Harold Ickes, citing a previous meeting with President Clinton and the wealthy tribe's big contributions, financial support to the Democratic National Committee and the last Clinton campaign. Here at the convention, Ickes wouldn't talk to us about the letter or about reports he put pressure on the Interior Department to block the Chippewas plans. The lobbyist, Patrick O'Connor, became quite upset when asked about his letter to the White House. No, you can't talk about this letter. can't talk about that, fella. You want me to hit you? Want me to hit you? Hey. It's something very few people in the middle of the process do want to talk about. The simple, Thank fundamental you. fact that access to the Clinton White House Thanks, Seth. Mr. O'Connor, I'd like to ask you the question that on the tape you would not answer. Uh, why, given that the White House 
counsel's office had advised that lobbyists ought not to be involved. And I should add that I worked in the White House counsel's office, and the policy was not to get the White House and the president and the high people involved there to interfere with agency decisions. Uh, why did uh, you have as your basic approach to this to involve the White House, to involve Harold Ickes, and why did you write Harold Ickes a letter that laid out purely political reasons that had nothing to do with the legal basis that Interior could legitimately use to make this decision? But why did you do that? Uh, first of all, uh, Congressman, uh, pardon me, uh, this letter not only laid out uh, the politics involved, but it did in the first page and part of the second uh, talk about uh, uh, the, uh, the reasons uh, for the substantive opposal. Right. And my question now, to you which is why do you, you want, want to, to involve, talk about? I want to ask you why you raised those political issues and why you wanted to involve the White House. Uh, All right. They ought not to have been involved Certainly. in this decision. Uh, I raised uh, these five uh, points uh, in the letter to get uh, Harold Ickey's attention uh, uh, to our problem. Uh, I decided that, uh, uh, you know, Harold Ickey's gets a lot of mail, uh, and, and I wanted to bring out uh, the, uh, the uh, politics involved in this situation. Also, as you're well aware, uh, when I addressed this letter, I addressed it to Ickey's as Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy and Political Affairs. Uh, now, why did I write the letter? I was hopeful uh, that I would get uh, Ickes uh, to at least uh, uh, read it, uh, to see uh, of the concerns of, of our client, and uh, I was hopeful that he might make a call over there and uh, say, say, I. I've been talking, or I've got some correspondence here from people that are opposing this application, and they're concerned uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the committee is not focusing on why uh, uh, we're opposing uh, this, uh, uh, this application. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my time has expired. Uh, I just want to uh, reiterate what I said at the earlier hearing that uh, I'm not sure that the decision that was reached here was not good for the community of Hudson, Wisconsin, but that's not what this hearing is about, and I'm very troubled by what I'm hearing. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. O'Connor. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, according to your date book. Uh, hi. Hi, Congressman. How are you this afternoon? <laughs> I'm very fine. And you? Very good, and I uh, appreciate I've got a few questions for you, and I'd uh, appreciate your cooperation in answering them. Certainly. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, according to your date book, it appears that you tried a number of times to contact Loretta Avent, an Indian specialist at the White House, in April 1995. Do you recall those attempts to reach uh, Ms. Avent? I do. And Ms. Avent did not call you back, did she? No. So on April 24th, you mentioned the issue to the president, and he referred you to Bruce Lindsay as he moved on. Now, Lindsay told you he would have uh, someone call you, and Ms. Event did. Uh, what did she tell you when she called you? Uh, she called me, and uh, uh, she said uh, uh, to me, pardon me, I can get closer to the microphone. Uh, she called me. And uh, in response, she said, to my calls to her. And uh, uh, then she uh, started right out by saying, uh, my job uh, is to work with uh, some 400 Indian tribes. And I only talk uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, chiefs or the chairman of the tribes. She didn't say uh, that was, she just stated that as a, a matter of fact. She didn't say it in any irritating tone, but that's what she, she made clear to me that she didn't want it. And she added, I don't talk to lobbyists. Okay, and, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and Harold Ickes left a message for you and you left mess messages for each other? Yes. But you never spoke to each other, is that correct? That is correct. 
you then try to contact uh, Mr. Ickes by going through Don Fowler, but you, don't, you do not know if Mr. Fowler ever contacted Ickes for you. Is that correct? I, I went to him, yes, and asked him, and I, I attended a meeting with him uh, along with some of our clients and other tribal leaders. Yes, sir, but, but do you know if Mr. Fowler ever contacted Mr. Ickes for you? I, I don't recall uh, a, a conversation with Fowler after that meeting on the 28th. Um, but I know that Mr. Fowler did talk to me uh, uh, after that 28th meeting. I know that. Um, and I can't recall right now uh, what he told me. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Thank you on that uh, point. Now, you s sent a letter on May 8th, I think it was 1995, to Mr. Ickes, but uh, you don't know if he read the letter, you don't know if he acted on it. Is that correct? That's correct. I don't even know if he got it. You never actually spoke to Mr. Ickes, you never had any substantive discussion about the Hudson Casino with anyone in the White House. And you do not know whether anyone in the White House did anything with regard to the casino, is that correct? That, that is uh, correct. Uh, the only thing I know is uh, I did get a telephone call from uh, a then partner of our firm, um, um, Mr. Schneider, and uh, uh, whom I had asked if he was over there at any time, and he ran into Ickes if he thought it appropriate to make an inquiry. And then he called me back and my recollection is what he said was, Icky said he'd look into it. Now, that's the only yeah. thing I know from uh, of Snyder. I'm going to ask you a question. It might be a particularly sensitive question to ask a lobbyist, but here it goes. So you don't really know of any reason why uh, all, you, all of your efforts, you don't know that if any of, you, any of your efforts, for that matter, on behalf of your client are connected to the outcome of the case. No, no I don't. And I don't know of, of uh, whether or not my uh, efforts uh, uh, were ever, uh, uh, well, I know this. Uh, uh, Icky's never called me back, and I sure tried to get a hold of him. So you don't have any reason to uh, think that the White House had anything to do with the outcome of the case? No, I don't. And you know, the only person I talked to who knew what I was talking about was Loretta Event. And as far as the DNC, you don't have any, any, any reason to believe that they had anything to do with the outcome of the case? No. Mr. Kucinich, would you yield to me? I would certainly yield to, uh, my, to Mr. Uh, Waxman. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost comical that we had to see an ABC film uh, as the, it's, it's come to this. This is what the Republicans are relying on, an ABC news report that three days of hearings on the subject have completely rebutted as well as Mr. O'Connor's uh, testimony today. They, they tried to argue that there was some uh, connection between campaign contributions and big lobbyists like Mr. O'Connor and the result, and they just not ha have not established it because apparently it's just not true. So w after all is said and done, they want to rely on an ABC news show that's been uh, discredited because we've got more information than they had when they did their show. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Congressman, I'd like to say uh, that they were hounding me, and if I had been five years younger, I think I could have outraced them. I sometimes feel that way myself. Uh, I'm uh, uh, now, Mr. O'Connor. You had a letter to uh, Carol Dickey's that said that Governor Thompson of Wisconsin supports this project. Yes. Now, we yes. know in. We know, we know, in fact, though, that Governor Thompson opposed the casino. Isn't that right? Say that again. Isn't it a fact, though, that Governor Thompson opposed the casino? It, it, it was my belief at the time uh, that uh, the governor uh, uh, was wavering, that the governor was... Uh, uh, um, maybe, maybe he would support the uh, uh, 
the, uh, uh, the uh, casino. And of course, I've heard uh, in testimony last week a view of one of the witnesses that said he thought the governor had an open mind about it and that he felt that he might very well support it and he felt that uh, it, it, it didn't necessarily mean an expansion of gambling. Um, and at the time I wrote this, uh, uh, I was satisfied with the information that was before me uh, that uh, uh, he was supporting uh, uh, the casino. I wouldn't have put it in there uh, if I, if I ha wasn't satisfied with what had been told me. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Connor. I, I think I'll take my five minutes at this point. Uh, on April the 24th, Ms. Avant uh, said no talking to lobbyists. That's uh, shown in uh, 305. You don't need to put it on the screen. But uh, she was very clear that she thought that this was a real legal problem if the White House got involved. And then you uh, look at... Uh, Not with me. And then, I know, I'm making, making some All statements right. here. Pardon me, I, I, excuse and then, me. And then you're looking at Exhibit 35639. Uh, uh, your billing records, uh, Mr. O'Connor, of May 23rd and 24th reflect your discussion of this matter with Terry McAuliffe, who was the head of the Clinton-Gore reelect committee. And uh, there's a reference to you asking him to agree to call Harold Ickes and arrange an appointment for the Indians. And uh, your time entry for June 6, 1995, Exhibit 36-41, talks about McAuliffe making contact with Ickes. And so it, it refers to this contact actually being made. Uh, the people at the White House had been red flagged, I believe, by uh, Ms. Uh, Avent that this was a hot potato and they should not get involved. Nevertheless, it appears as though uh, that uh, they did get involved. Mr. Kiddo, when he was questioned, we've got his deposition here, which you may not have in front of you, but I'll read out of it. He says, weren't you advocating that the White House get involved to get the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, to turn it down? He says, well, of course, when they, if they look at the information, in our opinion, there was no other decision to make but to turn it down. But you did, in fact, solicit the White House intervention for the express purpose of getting the result you got. He says, absolutely. And you wanted the White House to intervene and to put pressure, whatever pressure was necessary, on the BIA so that you could succeed in getting the thing turned down. We wanted the federal government to do its job, and it, and hopefully, the White House helped in that process. Do you believe that the White House pressure was part of the process in approval or denial of fee to trust applications at the BIA? Well, I would hope that somebody in the White House called the Department of Interior and said, take a good look at this, which they shouldn't do because Mr. At Ms. Avent says this is a hot potato. It's legally something we aren't allowed to get involved in. And then we go on. And you think if somebody at the White House phoned and said, take a good look at this, somebody at the BIA would get the point of what side the White House was on. Well, I hope people know who they work for, he said. I'm assuming that they take their, Babbitt takes his orders from somebody in the White House. So your partner, Mr. Kiddo, uh, felt like this kind of pressure being put on the White House uh, would end up uh, getting the White House to put pressure on the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the decision uh, being uh, made that would stop the casino. Now, I, I want to point out something that's of, of great interest to me, and I pointed it out last week. Prior to this decision being made, there was about $500 that had been named by the tribes uh, in question. $500 in tribes and contributions had been made to the DNC or related Democratic uh, uh, fundraising efforts. After this decision was made on uh, July 14, 1995, they contributed $356,250. Why do you think they did that? Uh, First of all, from what you said, Mr. Chairman, uh, there was $500 before July uh, 5th, 14th. And um, I'm not aware, I haven't any information as to when these were, and I don't dispute what you say, but uh, these uh, Indians in 1992 made substantial contributions uh, to the Clinton Gore campaign. Uh, now, why would they? Uh, uh, make a sub uh, make substantial contributions afterwards. 
uh, after that date that you after, that decision. after the uh, after the uh, for, uh, application was turned down. Right. Your question to me is why would they make it? Uh -huh. First of all, these Indians uh, have been strong supporters of the uh, Democratic Party uh, since the casinos uh, went into operation, uh, and uh, they were very, they've been very active. Uh, in uh, making contributions. I, I think you've made your point. I, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying, Mr. O'Connor. I just have a limited amount of time I'd like to... I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, I think you've made the point. But in you and your memo book and Mr. Kiddo's memo book, you both refer within about a three-week period to $50,000 being contributed to the DNC and the, uh, uh, this is uh, in, your, in your billing records uh, uh, as, uh, as related to the, the tribes in question. Uh, first, uh, my my records uh, do, uh, in that 50 were were not in the billing records. Secondly, it was in your calendar. It's in my calendar on the left hand side. It was right. in my calendar. Uh, that 50, um, uh, if, if in my recollection, that 50,000. And if you look, it it deals with not the DNC, but with the uh, committee to reelect. Okay. And in my recollection. Well. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Terry McCullough uh, uh, had asked us if we could get 50 individual contributions. I, I understand, and Mr. McCullough is one of the people that you asked to intercede to try to get an appointment with Mr. Ickes to talk about this issue. Yeah. And Mr. McCullough did. $50,000 was raised uh, by the tribes in question, and Mr. Kiddo in his memo book also refers to the $50,000. So there was $50,000 referred to in your memo book and in his memo book. Mr. McAuliffe asked for the $50,000. Mr. McAuliffe made the connection with Mr. Ickes at the White House, and the $50,000 was given. And ultimately, the, the application was rejected. You don't see any connection between them. No. Uh, and furthermore, I can't uh, talk about what's in Mr. Kiddo's book or what Mr. Kiddo said in partner, his deposition. And I uh, don't uh, dispute that at all. But I do know my situation, and my situation, that 50, in my judgment, referred uh, to uh, uh, Terry uh, asking us whether we could raise 50,000 from the Indians individually. And I don't recall that we did that. My best recollection, I don't know what Kittle raised, but my best recollection, I raised about $14,000, and it was from not only Indians, but from others. Well, one, one final question. During the conversation when Mr. McAuliffe asked for the $50,000, did you discuss at that time the problem that you were having with the uh, application of the Indian tribes? I'm not sure whether it was there or in a subsequent conversation. Uh, there were, I was working on that committee, and I saw McCullough on more than one occasion. One of them was with Kiddo. Uh, whether or not I asked him at that time, uh, will you as a personal favor uh, talk to Ickes, or whether it was in uh, a later discussion, which was only maybe a day or so later. But I did ask him. Well, uh, the point is, during the conversation, the $50,000 was discussed. It's very possible that you also discussed the Indian tribe issue. Uh, I don't think so, but let, it's let me, possible. Let, let, let me just say that we have a vote on, and nobody has had any lunch. What I'd like to do is have everybody go vote and come back, and we'll conclude with this panel. Mr. Chairman, just uh, if I might, one, we have no evidence, and maybe the chairman can help us on this, that Mr. McAuliffe did anything, whether he called Mr. Ickes, Mr. O'Connor can testify, that you made the statement, but I'd like to know what evidence you have to back up that statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman? We, we, uh, Mr. Chairman, we, I would like to ask if the chair would indulge just recognizing me for the moment so that I could give my time to Mr. Barrett when we come back because I will not be able to come back. So I ask for that courtesy. Uh, I just want to yield the, my time. The chair, the chair will uh, accept that. And Thank we will you. stand in recess until uh, as close to 2.15 as possible. How do you think it's going?
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Tierney for yielding me his time. Mr. Tierney wanted me to point out that he has a bill pending. Just one second. Would you uh, close those doors? Would the people in the audience who are still here kind of hold it down a little bit so we can hear Mr. Bear? Thank you, Mr. Bear. Mr. Tierney asked me to point out that he has a uh, bill pending for campaign finance reform uh, and that this type of hearing um, could just as easily be a hearing on, on tobacco and that both sides are going to continue to criticize the other's money uh, and that the real issue is campaign finance reform. And he wanted me to mention that. Along those same lines, Mr. Chairman, I also have to weigh in um, several times during the course of this hearing, Mr. Waxman and, other, and others have um, talked about the anomaly that we are here to discuss this issue, but nowhere on this committee's agenda is there uh, the issue of tobacco. And I realize that initially the response of the committee of the chair was that, that, that the, this committee's purview was foreign money. That was at the time when we were looking at the allegations of uh, Chinese money. Uh, next, we've been told that that is under the jurisdiction of the Commerce Committee, although that doesn't deal with the campaign finance reports. I, I actually think that the next, if I could offer one, I, the next excuse would be when the weather conditions are correct or when the weather conditions are right, because I, I think it's going to be a cold day in hell uh, before this committee would ever look at allegations uh, involving the Republican National Committee. And I would love to go through Haley Barber's time slips uh, and ask him some questions about his billing practices and contributions to the Republican National Committee. And I say that because I, I am critical of, of the money involved in politics. And, and I do not like the fact that there was a lot of money raised here. Um, but that money pales in comparison to the amount of money that was raised by the Republican National Committee. And anybody who looks at those figures uh, knows that. So you can have a good hearing, and this is a good hearing. Uh, and, a, and in a way, it, it's an important hearing because it highlights to the American people um, what the scandal is. The scandal is not that this money was given, um, because Mr. O'Connor testified that there was no quid pro quo here. I specifically asked him uh, if he knew that he was under oath when he gave that answer, and he said yes. So I accept him at his word. The scandal is that this type of practice is legal in this country. And the scandal is that, that this Congress refuses to do anything about it. And the, the sad reality is that I think what happens as a result in my home state and other parts of the country is that people just turn themselves off to the process. They say, we don't have the money to, to get involved. We're not going to get involved in the political process. Um, and I think that there might be a grand design uh, on behalf of the Republican leadership of this Congress to have fewer people involved in democracy because it, it then allows more moneyed interests to have greater power in this country. Um, and I think that that's something that, that has to be said. I also want to talk a little bit about, about the comparisons at the federal level and the state level because I think that they're very interesting and, and we really haven't spent much time on, on that issue. Uh, on the state level, as, as we know, uh, Governor Thompson had some pretty clear statements that he was opposed to expanding gambling. Um, yet, when we talked last week to Mr. Havanek and the, the members from the three tribes, they intimated that, that that really was not all that it appeared, that they understood that the governor had to make these public statements against gambling, but they were getting messages or they were, they were hearing that the governor was open to their proposal. So in essence, what they're saying is that there's some sort of secret understanding, uh, and I don't think they use the word secret, but secret understanding, um, that, that the governor would look at this with an open mind. So on the one hand, they are coming here, and the, the dog track interest in particular is coming here saying that they have not give, been given the, the right access that they want, that they feel they deserve, notwithstanding the fact that their lobbyist was the only one to meet personally with Mr. Babbitt. Um, but at the, at the state level, there's nothing wrong for them to have agreements that are reached without public input 
with the governor of the state of Wisconsin. So I think as we look at, as we put this up, if we had a blackboard here, and of course the minority doesn't have the resources that the majority does, so we don't have, can't do that. But if you look at state, federal, state, or the federal allegation is unfair access by the Democrats. On the state level, there's basically an acknowledgement that they had access to the governor where the decision was made. The other allegation, of course, is, is the money here. And here the allegation is that hundreds of thousands of dollars were in play. But I have a, an article here, September 18, 1990, Eau Claire Leader Telegram, which starts out, dog racing interest in the St. Croix Meadows Greyhound Park being built in Hudson have contributed $181,923 to Governor Tommy Thompson's gubernatorial campaign since 1985. A representative Democratic Thomas Loftus campaign said today he was the challenger to Governor Thompson. Now you have said that the 250,000 is a lot of money on the federal level. If 250,000 dollars in 1996 is a lot of money on the federal level, what is 181,000 dollars in 1990 at the state level in terms of access and buying favorable resort results? The comments by Loftus, the article goes on to say, the State Assembly Speaker from Sun Prairie came a day after the Milwaukee Journal reported that dog racing interests from the state's five tracks had donated at least $286,000 to Thompson's campaign. The, le the article goes on even further uh, to state, at his news conference, Loftus questioned why a Florida family seeking a track license would hire attorney Michael Greeby, chairman of the Republican Party of Wisconsin, to represent it. I think the answer is clear, because he was the one that they perceived with the Republican governor had the most access. Um, so yes, you can, you can hurl all the accusations that you want toward us, um, and we will hurl all the accusations that we want back toward you. But until we get at the root problem, this is going to go on. This is legal. Well, I am sure that if we brought in Mr. Barber and I asked him under oath whether he ever accepted or, or made the representation that by giving millions of dollars to the Republican National Committee, that the Republican National Committee, that the Congress would act in, in favor of his clients on tobacco, he would say, he would say yes. Uh, he would say no, there was no influence at all. Uh, but as long as you're going to permit under your, your jurisdiction this practice to continue, um, then I don't think we can ever be surprised. And, and the real loser in this is the American people, because they feel that they're not part of this system. And I'm afraid, Mr. Chairman, that they might be right. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Micah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, hope you can hear me okay. I'll try to be as loud as possible so you can respond. Um, you said you never talked to Harold Ickes, is that true? That's true. That's correct. Maybe you could pull that up a little yes. so I can hear you. My wife yeah. says the same thing about me. All right. Um, you said you did talk to Mr. Fowler at the DNC. Yes. And uh, did you ask him to, uh, what did you ask him to do, to kill the project if he could or uh, uh, to contact someone else or what? Uh, I met with Mr. Fowler and uh, on May, was that May 5th or? No, I think it was on April 20, it was on April 28th. April 28th, that's right. And uh, did I'll, you ask him to kill the project or to contact Harold Ickes or to contact someone in uh, the Interior Department? What, what was the strategy? Uh, at that meeting, Congressman, it was attended by me and uh, several tribe leaders. And in our discussions with Mr. Fowler at that time, uh, we asked, and I use the word we, I, I was part of the group, um, we asked if Mr. Fowler would uh, consider uh, talking to Mr. Ickes at the White House uh, to uh, express our concern that we didn't believe that the people in Interior working on this uh, particular application were focusing on our, uh, 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 our opposing the application and 
focusing on uh, the question of the serious economic consequences that would be suffered by but the basic, tribes. Basically, you wanted the project not to go forward, right? That's right. Then, then you met with Mr. McCullough, or you talked to him, you testified, and basically you told him the same thing, and you had still not to talk to uh, Mr. Ickes. And then you have a partner, is it Tom? Yes, uh, he heard, was a partner. Did you suggest to Tom to go to this fundraiser, or did Tom tell you he, he was going to the fundraiser where he might see the president, maybe Mr. Ickes? I, I think I understand your question, uh, and it is, did I talk to Mr. Snyder about possibly Mr. Ickes and the president if he happened to be over at the White House uh, and the Yes, I did talk to him, and I did tell him if it was appropriate, uh, would he bring it up to Mr. Ickes? Um, and, um, and then you, I think you testified a little bit earlier that Schneider came back and said he talked to the president, or at least he talked to, to uh, Ickes. Right? Yes. He reported back to you. Yes. And uh, what, did he, what did he say, that they were going to help? Uh, he's, he told me uh, by phone that he had brought it up with Ickes, and Ickes said that he would look into it. So basically, you hadn't been able to directly convey this to Ickes, but, but Fowler sort of sent a message, McCullough was going to send a message, and Snyder was going to send the message. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and then you said to one of my colleagues over here that you couldn't remember what uh, uh, Tom told you about the, the meeting. Uh, I, I don't recall if I said that because I recollect that w one that uh, Snyder did call me and that he did say that he had talked to Ickes and that he did say that uh, Ickes would uh, look into it. That's my recollection. Well, see, the problem I have, and maybe we could pull this up, is uh, Exhibit 35645, and we, the chairman had finished with some questioning about tying the your involvement. And see, we, it, you know, I'm not an attorney. I've experienced politics, but... This is pretty damaging when you look at that document, 35645, uh, and you your entry, and I think your PJO, on 71495, the day the project is ki was killed, that uh, in your notes it says discussions regarding necessity to follow up with Harold Ickes at the White House, who you didn't talk to, Don Fowler with the DNC and Terry Mack. McCullough, unless there's somebody else by that name, at the committee to reelect outlining fundraising strategies. And I, I, we see the $50,000 trail there that's been brought out today. Then on the same page, 720, a few days later, PJO, it looks like you again, unless somebody's doctored this. Briefing with Larry Kitto uh, on my conversations with Chairman of the NC discussion regarding thank you letters to White House and members of the Congress discussions regarding fundraising and this is the partner who raised some three hundred thousand dollars so it looks like you had past support which we all know about and people do support folks over time but then this is some pretty clear linkage to uh, the day of the reje rejection and then a direct follow-up uh, to uh, pay uh, the balance due. What do you think? Uh, uh, Congressman, first, uh, in connection with the, uh, uh, the notation that occurred mm -hmm. on the 14th, uh, those discussions with Mr. Kiddo took place in Minneapolis, and they took place before I was aware uh, that the uh, uh, interior had uh, turned down the application. It's just ironic it was the same but day. It no was one the same day, 
But no uh, one told you in advance that it was going to be denied. You don't think that you all had done? No, I, I had no knowledge uh, in advance. And the first knowledge I had of it was when our office in Washington received uh, the press release from Interior. And I believe either that afternoon or the following uh, day, uh, it was uh, faxed to me in Minneapolis. Well, you know, we're investigating this because the federal uh, judges looked at this. There's been a complaint about this. Uh, Regular order. In Mr. fact, Chairman. political influence uh, might have occurred uh, with this decision, and that's that's our concern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Souter. Thank you. Now, one thing I, I just want to insert in the record, it probably has already been inserted before, is uh, Exhibit 297A6, uh, which was a local BIA finding based on the studies of Dr. Murray and Arthur Anderson. And it says, time in response to comments and questions, that the findings of Dr. Murray and Arthur Anderson, Inc. indicate that the market size is of sufficient size to support an additional casino operation and will not saturate the market. Now, the reason that's important is, is because that's why all this political lobbying has taken place, because at the local level, they did the study, they determined this, and they had to bring in a uh, high-powered lobbyist and then high-powered lobbyists to, to combat that. I wanted to follow up a little bit, Mr. O'Connor, and I talk real fast, so just, you know, uh, yes, uh, and uh, to, Congressman, I didn't hear what you said because that, and it wasn't really directed all right. at you there. Okay. Um, I wanted to follow up with this. Uh, you indicated you didn't have a dinner with Al Gore; that it was a reception uh, that you billed for. Your records indicate on May 24th, 1995, that you had. Uh, a dinner, but you said it was a reception. Yes. And you also billed for a conference with Peter Knight and David Strauss. Yes. Now Peter Knight is one of the vice president's closest confidants and is chairman of, I uh, was chairman of Clinton Gore 96, a former Gore staffer, a lobbyist. David Strauss was Gore's deputy chief of staff. He testified in Senator Thompson's committee about the Buddhist temple event and said it wasn't a fundraiser. Now, did you ha you said you didn't have any discussions with Vice President Gore, right? Say that again. You had no discussions with Vice President Gore? I had Gore. no discussions uh, with, uh, with the Vice President Gore. Any discussions with David Strauss? Did you have any discussions with David Strauss? Yes. Uh, what did you discuss with him and what did you ask him to do? At that particular event, which was a reception over at the Mayflower, uh, a reception for uh, Vice President Gore, uh, David uh, Strauss was at that reception, so was I, and I did see him and I did talk to him. And that's one of the reasons you bill for, uh, my understanding earlier that you bill for these fundraising uh, receptions yes. because you hope to be able to talk to people of influence at these receptions. Uh, I, I bill for that because I did talk to people at that reception on that issue. Do you believe that resulted in any help to you to talk to them? Is that why you bill for them? Uh, say that again? Um, I assume you're billing your clients for that because you assume that by meeting and talking to people like David Strauss at these receptions, it's helpful to your cause. Yes. Do you believe it was? Uh, it's hard to, uh, to say whether it was helpful or not. Uh, uh, first of all, there were a couple hundred people there at that reception, and I, uh, in, that was the first time that I introduced the subject uh, to uh, David Strauss, and uh, it was not a long or a substantive discussion at all, uh, and it was only the first time I introduced it to him, uh, and uh, 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 I did not follow it up with uh, asking for appointments or uh, discussing it in substance. Did you introduce it to him hoping he would influence Vice President Gore? Uh, uh, no, uh, I'd put it this way. I introduced the, uh, the, dis uh, the issue, uh, and it was my intention to have him know that I was involved in it. I didn't ask him to do anything, and uh, I just uh, left it that way with the thought in mind that uh, if I do have to or I do decide to uh, talk to him later about it, I would call him up and get an appointment. Isn't it partly uh, also hoping that if he's in some meeting somewhere where he hears about something, he could be of aid? 
Well, all that helped, you know, I th in my judgment, um, and I let him know of my involvement. Is the same true of Peter Knight? Did you talk to Peter Knight? Yes, and it was, again, uh, the first time I introduced it, uh, uh, the subject, a very brief conversation, and uh, 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 as I mentioned before, crowded room, a lot of noise, and uh, uh, that's all I did. I didn't ask him to do anything. Would you say that the primary reason you went to that fundraiser was to talk to uh, Gore's close confidants, David Strauss and Peter Knight? I mean, is that what, are they the two main people you wanted to see, or who else were you targeting that night? Uh, I uh, usually go uh, or went to Gore receptions. Uh, um, for whatever purpose, and uh, uh, there was no pre-arrangement uh, uh, to see them there, nor did I know whether they'd be there, but they were there, and I did raise, introduce the subject to both of them at that time. And presumably, while you've tried to explain that it's not direct billing hours, it's part of the minimum number of hours that your firm bills for, that presumably you billed for that because you talked to Gore's people that night. Uh, yes, I did, and also on that date, I had another meeting, uh, and, and it was all coupled together in that billing. Can I ask you one other question that I've been curious about for days of this hearing? Why did you include the Delaware North uh, when it, the track wasn't in, owned by Delaware North? Uh, uh, you mean in my letter of yes. May 8th? Yes. At the time that this, uh, I was preparing this letter, um, uh, from information I had at hand at that time, uh, I was satisfied uh, that Del Delaware North were the owners of that track. Who gave you that information? Who gave you that information? Uh, I'm not uh, certain I got information from time to time from tribes. I got information from Larry Kiddo, and uh, I read articles uh, that appeared in the Wisconsin Journal and uh, other sources. So I can't tell you after two and a half years uh, where I got it, but I was satisfied at the time uh, that, uh, uh, that Delaware North uh, were the owners of that uh, track, so or never, I wouldn't have put it in. So you never actually checked, though, because they... No, I did not. I did, did not... Did you correct uh, it? Did you ever check to correct no, it? No, I did not. So so Terry McAuliffe, apparently, and uh, uh, the White House thought that it was owned by Delaware North? Uh, you uh, can't... Obviously, you don't... That, that's a leading question I shouldn't have asked. Yep. I yield back. All right. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Shadding? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, let me begin, uh, if I could, Mr. O'Connor, um, with a question which I think is substantiated by the memos and exhibits we have, referring specifically to Exhibit 296. Um, you have had a political relationship with Bruce Babbitt for over a decade, have you not? I've known um, uh, Bruce Babbitt for over a decade. That's correct. And you were the point man for raising money for him to qualify for federal matching funds for the state of Minnesota in his race clear back in 1986, were you not? Uh, you mean for Bruce Babbitt? For Bruce Babbitt's race. Uh, may I inquire of my wife? I, I, I don't think so. Well, take a look at Exhibit 296A1 and at Exhibit 296A6, if you would, which is a memo generated by Fred Duvall of the Babbitt campaign uh, to Matthew Reuter in the Babbitt campaign dated December 3, 1986, talking about matching state plan and it lists you as the contact for the Babbitt campaign for the state of Minnesota. The individual to was, who was to interface was Fred Duvall, and it refers to you as, quote, unquote, in the bank. Mr. Congressman, where is that reference, please? Uh, exhibit 296, page A6. This is a I think it pretty clearly shows that. Wouldn't you agree? This is the first time I've seen this. Okay, well, uh, I think the document speaks uh, for itself. I, 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 if asked, uh, I assume I would help uh, qualify him. Uh, I'd have no reason not to. 
I think the document speaks for itself and pretty well shows that you were in fact doing that. Let me ask you, uh, you know, I have no, I'm not yet able to reach any conclusions about the conduct of the Department of Interior in this particular instance, but I have to tell you I am stunned by the conduct of the White House and the conduct of Mr. Ickes and, quite frankly, by your letter of May 8th. I'd like you to refer to that. That's Exhibit, exhibit 311A-4, um, and it's specifically at page 2, where you uh, write that you would also like to relate the politics involved in this situation and at the first four points under the politics of this situation. In reflecting on that letter, do you now uh, wish to disavow it and acknowledge that it was an improper letter and should not have been sent, that those materials should not have been included in the letter? I certainly do not want to disavow it, and I do believe it was a proper letter. Okay, so you are a lawyer, are you not, Mr. O'Connor? Yes, I am. Do you accept the principle of the rule of law? What is the rule of law? Well, I think the rule of law is that decisions which are supposed to be made on the merits, based on the law, should not be influenced by nor decided on the basis of uh, the people who are backing them. And your letter, for example, uh, points out to Mr. Ickes, Deputy Chief of Staff at the White House, that the project you oppose is supported by Republican Governor Thompson of Wisconsin. Yes. I presume your purpose in pointing out to him that a Republican governor supported the project and you opposed it was that you wanted him to know that Republicans supported it and Democrats favored it. Isn't that correct? I, you, that was a long question. Now, um, well, I your think letter, items one, I, two, I, I, and three, yes, and and four I'll of talk your letter. About any one of those, if you wish me to. Well, each one of them make it very clear that you wanted Harold Ickes to know, point by point, that Republicans supported this license and Democrats opposed it. I wanted Ickes to know, uh, Congressman exactly what I put in that letter. You wanted him to know that Thompson supported it. I wanted him to know that Governor Thompson of Wisconsin supported this project. And you wanted him to know that Senator Aldemato, also a Republican, supported it. Yes. And in the third paragra paragraph, you wanted him to know that the chairman of the Indian tribe in the forefront of the project was an active Republican. Was active that's correct. I, to whatever it says there, and that's what it says. And you wanted him to know that that, that guy, that gentleman, had been a Republican candidate for the Wisconsin State Senate, didn't you? That's right. And then in the next paragraph, you wanted to make it very clear that you had met with the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Mr. Fowler, uh, and uh, that you took a group with you, and the entire group you took opposing the license were Democrats. You wanted him to know that. I wanted him to know what it says in there. And, that, and yes. you wanted him to know that they had previously given money. Yes, uh, that's, if that's what it said. I can tell you, yes, do, do you know that, of that, any that's correct. Do you know of any basis under IGRA on which Mr. Ickes or the Secretary of the Interior could have decided to turn the license down because it was supported by Republicans? Uh, 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 say that again. Do you, um, do you know of any basis under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act which would have allowed either Mr. Ickes or Mr. Babbitt or anyone to turn down this tribe's request because it was being supported by Republicans. No, there's, uh, there's no basis. Uh, uh, the uh, Interior made their decision based on the substance. Well, you sure wanted him to know something that wasn't substance. You wanted oh, to know yes, politics. Oh, yes, wanted, I wanted to get his attention. And I wanted well, no, you to... you don't just want... You don't ask for... If this paragraph began by saying, I would appreciate if you'd give these people a meeting because they are members of your party, that might be one thing. But you specifically are going to the merits of this proposal. You're talking about who's supporting it, not whether or not he should meet with you. You're saying Republicans support it, Democrats oppose it. Indeed, you go beyond that. You say Democrats who provided financial support to the DNC oppose it. Is there anything under IGRA which would have allowed Mr. Babbitt or Mr. Ickes to turn this down on the basis of the fact that Democrats who oppose it had given money to the DNC? Mr. Chairman, uh, the witness has tried three times to answer to answer it, his answer has well, we'll, 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 let, we'll let the witness answer. All right. Uh, uh, do you, uh, I wrote this letter. I stand behind it. Uh, and I don't think there's anything improper at all in advising Mr. Ickes of the politics involved in this situation. Uh, and uh, uh, at, at the time I drafted this letter, I had information 
from various sources uh, that led to satisfy me that these allegations were correct. And I wrote the letter, and uh, it was sent uh, to Wikis. I happen to think it's one of the Regular most stunning. Orders, Chairman. I happen to think it's one of the most stunning examples of a, a, an acknowledgement in writing of an attempt to buy influence and affect a decision on a basis that is not permitted in the law. Whatever you think, you think. I'm telling you what I think and why I wrote it. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Barr of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, exhibit C-106 is a quote from a federal district court judge, Barbara Crabb, indicating that, quote, there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision making. Exhibit C-104 lists one, two, three, four, five instances in which the Department of the Interior at levels below Secretary Babbitt made a decision or a finding that there was no reason not to approve the request of the tribe to expand their activities. Yet on July the 14th of 1995, which is Exhibit 328, the Department of the Interior does indeed disapprove the project, which is what the witness sought. Mr. O'Connor, I think your protestations of lack of influence are greatly exaggerated. Then we have also, Mr. O'Connor, I believe, in Exhibit 356-45, some activity, uh, despite the fact that you believe that you have little influence in anything, on the very same day that the Department of the Interior went against at least five recommendations to approve, on that day they disapproved it, and you build your clients additional monies to outline fundraising strategies. Six days later, you also build your clients to discuss fundraising. And apparently, these discussions were also successful. You may believe that they were not, but apparently they were. Exhibit C-102 lists, I think, close to $360,000 of contributions that then did indeed come in from those very tribes who sought to disapprove, sought the disapproval of the Department of the Interior. It seems obvious to me, as it did to a United States District Court judge, Mr. O'Connor, that there is indeed something here that is unusual. The tie-in between the DOI, that is Department of the Interior Disapproval, in a matter that normally would be approved and according to any number of other instances similarly situated, the department did agree with its field offices and disapprove. In this case, they did not, and their unusual action, not in accord with their previous practices and not in accord with their lower offices, immediately caused you to engage in fundraising strategy discussions with Chairman Fowler of the DNC, Harold Ickes, or at least your discussions regarding the, quote, necessity to follow up with Harold Ickes, raises the interesting question, if you had absolutely no influence with him and you had no discussions with him, why it would be necessary to follow up. Clearly, there is, at 
least an implication that the reason you felt it necessary to follow up was to raise monies that may, and I use the word may, have been a quid pro quo for the unusual action by the Department of the Interior, which gave rise to the quote from Federal District Court Judge Barbara Crabb, quote, there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision making, close quote. Your friends on the other side of the aisle may believe that findings such as that by the district court judge fall into the category of trivial pursuit. If they do, then the category of trivial pursuit is vast indeed, as I believe your influence is, uh, despite your protestations to the contrary. I do have one specific question, if I could, Mr. O'Connor. In Exhibit 357-23, about which there was some discussion earlier, and this is your May 5, 1995 diary and work record, one of the few that your firm did furnish pursuant to a very broad subpoena that requested much, much more information. But on this one in particular, about which we discussed earlier also, there is a reference under a written number three uh, there uh, to uh, Hillary, uh, followed by a date and a number of what appears to be thousands of dollars. What, uh, what does that refer to, uh, please, Mr. O'Connor? Yes. Uh, uh, that referred uh, to a, a previous discussion that I had had with Terry McCullough about attending this May 18th uh, 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 luncheon, I believe, over at the uh, uh, headquarters of the uh, committee to reelect. Um, and uh, what, did, what did that have to do with with the Hudson dog track? Yeah, uh, nothing. Uh, uh, the, the Hudson dog track are the comments up in number two. Okay, you can see on the, both of those pages there, uh, there are substantial portions that are redacted. One presumes that the reason those are redacted is they have nothing to do with the Hudson dog track. That's right. The implication then being that we should draw from this is material that is not redacted has to do with the Hudson dog track matter. Otherwise, it would have been redacted. Would that not be a reasonable presumption on our part? I don't think so. Uh, you don't think so? No. The, this, these uh, comments... Then, then why were the other parts redacted? The parts that were redacted were redacted because they dealt with other clients and other matters. I, th I thought you said that order, Mr. this Chairman. did also. What? You said, yeah. Mr. Chairman, that this Mr. matter Chairman, each of us point of had order. nothing to point do order. with the Hudson of dog order, track Chairman. matter. That is the reference to Hillary. Gen gentlemen, we'll finish this question and uh, we'll get on with it with Mr. Wax. Okay. okay. You indicated, Mr. O'Connor, that the reference here, which is not redacted, the reference to Hillary, had nothing to do with the Hudson dog track. That's correct. Okay. Other portions of your records that had nothing to do with the Hudson dog track have been redacted. Yes. My point is, why should we not presume then, since many other portions not having to do with the dog track issue were redacted, that these entries here, including the reference to the First Lady, did have something to do with H the Hudson dog track. Uh, all I can say to you about that, Congressman, is perhaps it should have been redacted, uh, but it wasn't. And uh, the, actually, this dealt with a fundraising luncheon uh, that uh, Hillary uh, Clinton was going to attend at the offices of the committee. Uh, to reelect, and that five thousand uh, uh, dollar uh, figure, uh, I believe, my recollection would be that either Hardigan or uh, uh, t uh, Terry uh, said, uh, "If you want to attend that thing, um, uh, see if you can get five contributions of a thousand dollars a piece uh, from five sources." Uh, they didn't, uh, it wasn't Indian sources, it was any source. 
Mr. Wax. Th thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. O'Connor, um, you said you didn't talk to Vice President Gore, but you talked to his aides. Do you have any reason to think that Vice President Gore or his staff had anything to do with the denial of the Hudson Casino application? None, none that I know of, none. Now, you wrote a letter on May 8th, and a lot of people made a big to-do about this letter. Uh, this was a letter to Mr. Ickes. You said who supported it, the application, who opposed the casino. Mickey, Mr. Ickes didn't write this letter. You wrote the letter. I didn't? wrote the letter. Uh, it's a very strange thing to me to hear people criticize Mr. Ickes and the White House for a letter they didn't write. This is a letter you wrote. I, I stand behind this letter, Congressman. <laughs> well, that, that's your letter, so yeah. you ought to stand behind it. But if do you know what Mr. Ickes' reaction was to the letter? No. If, 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 it's, uh, if it's a letter you wrote him, you stand behind it. But to make him have to stand behind the accuracy of your letter to him is a very peculiar notion. No one in the White House or the Department of Interior, for that matter, is responsible for what you write to them, are they? No. Um, since the chairman made a very blanket statement that Mr. McAuliffe uh, contacted Mr. Ickes on behalf of your clients, we've contacted Mr. McAuliffe, and we are going to submit uh, his affidavit uh, to this uh, committee record. He has told our staff that he didn't contact anybody. He didn't contact Mr. Ickes. He didn't con contact anybody at the Department of Interior. Uh, I, I don't know whether he ever, ever talked to Mr. Havenick, but Mr. Havenick said he talked to him. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But his statement is he didn't influence the decision. And what's really involved is, was there an improper influence in the decision by the Department of Interior? In fact, the people from the Department of Interior, including the young man who had the decision power, who had gone to school with Mr. McAuliffe, said he hadn't talked to Mr. McAuliffe. None of them had talked to Mr. McAuliffe. So I just want that out there on the record because it's so contrary to what the chairman said as an absolute statement of fact. What we need are the facts, not innuendo, but the facts. And when we look at the facts, we find out the decision was made by people who are career civil servants at the Department of Interior. And I'll ask you again, do you have any reason to believe they made that decision on anything other than the merits? I have no reason to believe that. Uh, also, I never did get a report back from Mr. McCullough that he had made any uh, a call to uh, Mr. Ickes. Well, today's testimony shows uh, that there was political activity, but no evidence of improper conduct at the Department of Interior. And if anything, it's a good day for the White House because when there was an attempt by you to influence them, uh, they uh, pretty much uh, rejected it and said they weren't, the person who finally talked to you said they weren't going to talk to you because you were a lobbyist. Yep. So if anything, the White House ought to be happy about the, this hearing. I don't know if that pleases the chairman, but the White House ought to be pleased about it. Uh, I guess that there are several truths that, that are coming out. We find that lobbyists sometimes take credit for things they didn't really do. We find that fundraisers sometimes try to take credit for things they didn't do. And I'm worried that the noose is tightening. Pretty soon they're going to find out that members of Congress take credit for things that we didn't do. <laughs> we certainly get blamed for some things we didn't do as well. Uh, I thank you. You've been an excellent uh, uh, witness, very forthright. I, I appreciate your testimony. I think that um, uh, you've, you've given us a clear perspective that while you did what you could as a lobbyist for your client, that uh, what you did was what lobbyists do all the time, try to get your point of view across to the people that make the decision. And as far as you know, uh, they, the people that actually made the decision may or may not have uh, heard from those you were contacting, but uh, they all say they hadn't heard from anybody. I have no idea of uh, who they talked with or what they did. I read the, uh, uh, their opinion. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, are you ready for questions, Mr. Scarborough? Would you yield to me, Mr. Scarborough? Yes, yes sir. Scarborough yields Chairman. to me. Uh, 
Mr. O'Connor may have been ignorant of the law regarding the White House exerting influence over the Department of Interior in this area, but the White House was not ignorant about that. And when they got these letters and these, these uh, contacts from various individuals, uh, they very clearly knew that they shouldn't be interfering in the decision-making process over at the Department of Interior. And I think that's the major question. Now, you indicated there's no facts to back up that Mr. McAuliffe was involved or, or did anything. Mr. Havanek, this is a fact, Mr. Havanek said last week under oath before the committee, and there were some, there were some uh, uh, statements that accompanied it that were sworn under oath, said that Mr. McAuliffe said to him in the presence of others that he killed the deal, meaning the dog track in Hudson, Wisconsin. Now, you may not agree with that, but it's a fact that it was in sworn testimony before this committee last week that Mr. Havanek said that, and he stands by that statement. Now, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you in, in closing here. On July 14th, 1995, and this is Exhibit 334, if you can put that on the screen. On July 14th, 1995, the Interior Department rejected the Wisconsin Chippewas application for a casino in Hudson, Wisconsin. Over the next 18 months, uh, Mr. O'Connor's clients and others contributed nearly $360,000 to the DNC. On September 14th, 1995, Patrick O'Connor and his partner, Larry Kiddo, circulated a fundraising letter to their Native American clients who benefited from this decision, I might add, uh, seeking contributions for a reception with the president. And here's what Mr. O'Connor wrote in his letter. As witnessed in the fight to stop the Hudson dog track proposal, the office of the president can and will work on our behalf when asked to. That's a pretty definitive statement. Very, very clear. When we asked the Department or asked the Office of the President of the United States to help us out in something like the Hudson Dog Track matter, they'll do it. And that's why you ought to kick in some money. Now, at least that's the way I, I, I look at it. Can, Can you I tell comment? me what you meant by that statement? Certainly. Tell me. Uh, first of all, I did not make that statement. It's not in your letter? It is not in my writing. I uh, did. I never saw the, uh, the, uh, the memo when it went out. Who did, who did, who wrote the memo? Uh, it was written by a Mr. Kiddo. Mr. Kiddo, your, your associate. Mr. Kiddo was one of the people in 1995 that was working on this issue, well, yes. Mr. Kiddo and you both were working on the issue, and he was yes. your associate working on it. And your name is on the letter. I did not put it there. Well, who did? I assume Mr. Kiddo did. And, uh, but I never did, and I, nor did I. Did you ever discuss the dog track matter with Mr. Kiddo? I d discussed that memo. Well, if, if you discussed and, it. Uh, and he said that he, he had put my name on it. Well, if Mr. Kiddo and you discussed it, then you must have known the content of it. It came up later uh, when uh, I was being deposed in the uh, action pending in the Wisconsin State Court, uh, and it came up at that time. Uh, and that's when I found out and first read it. Uh -huh. And what did you say to Mr. Kiddo at that time? At that time, uh -huh. which was uh, maybe a few months ago, I said, uh, uh, I don't recall ever uh, uh, signing uh, or participating in that memo. And he said, you didn't. And uh, I said, uh, well, uh, my name's there. He said, well, I put the name, uh, your did name. He, did he tell you why he put that name there without no. your permission? No, he didn't. But he, You guys were in this together all the way up and down the line, weren't you, in trying to get this dog track stopped or this casino stopped? We worked together on this issue. I'm only saying I did not participate in the drafting of that memo. I didn't know that it went out. I never read it uh, 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 until... It was raised in the, uh, of when we, uh, uh, when I w my deposition was being taken. Mm -hmm. Did you ask any of the Indian tribes for money after the fact, though, for the DNC or other Democrat causes? Uh, uh, did I ask for any of the, of the tribes for any m uh, money after the, uh, uh, the was application made. was denied? Right. Uh, I don't recall if I did or not, but I would say this. Uh, Mr. Kiddo was the person who worked with the Indian tribes, uh, not me. Now, whether or not on some particular 
uh, uh, event or issue, I may have solicited some money. I don't believe so, but I may have. The St. Croix was your the St. Croix were your clients, so were they not? Yeah, uh, St. Croix, Croix was the client of the O'Connor Hannon firm, and you were representing them. I, as as a uh, contractual um, um, partner, not partner, as a, I have a contract with. O'Connor. I know, but the point is, you were asking people all over Washington to help you out in getting access to Mr. Ickes. Obviously, you were representing them and trying to. Stop that. I'm not saying I, I didn't participate in the representation. I certainly did, and I'm proud of the fact that I did. But, uh, but you had nothing to do with this letter saying that we got the job done by going to the office of the president and you ought to kick in some money. I did not write that letter. I had nothing to do with it. But your associate did. Uh, Mr. Kiddo wrote it. On, he, on was not an, uh, he was not an associate of, no. uh, of our firm at that time but he was working on the same issue. I, w I wonder wh on what basis he would make that kind of a statement in writing if he didn't have your approval. That's, that's surprising. Well, that's to that, you're perfectly right to think whatever you want, but I'm telling you, he did not have my approval, and uh, I, I did not participate in that uh, uh, memo at all. Mr. Chairman, if I can say on behalf of my uh, client, just, just Uh, one final question. Do you think that letter was uh, appropriate or inappropriate? The Kiddo letter? Yes. The uh, one memo? that you were referring, were referring to. I don't uh, view it as, as being uh, all that uh, inappropriate. Uh, I, wouldn't have, uh, uh, I wouldn't have written it. Hey, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. If I might say, Mr. Chairman. Well, Counsel, uh, you're, you're not under oath. If you want to confer with your client, that this has been the standing procedure of the committee that legal counsel can confer with their clients, but as far as addressing the committee on any relevant issue, they have to do it through their client. Uh, very well, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to offer some information about your reference to the law, but I will uh, make well, you, that you, you're, you're welcome to submit that, submit that to uh, the committee in writing. That will be fine. Thank you. Any other members have any? Uh, Mr. Ken Jorsky, you want to be recognized? Uh, Mr. Barrett, do you have some questions? I'll use Mr. Barrett. I just have a couple of more procedural matters, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last week, Mr. Havanek testified before this committee that um, Mr. Skabeen, then director of the Indian Gaming Management, told him and a group of tribal representatives that the Hudson application was denied because of political interference. According to Mr. Havanek, Skabeen said, quote, Look, don't blame me. We would have given it to you. It was the political people who turned it down, unquote. Mr. Havanek also testified under oath that several other people heard the comment, including Rose Gurno and Margaret Diamond. Mr. Skabeen emphatically denied having said this. He testified that he recommended that the application be rejected. Mr. Skabeen's recollection was corroborated by the affidavits of five Department of Interior officials who were also at the meeting. Uh, clearly, someone was mistaken. Uh, following our hearing, um, there was a story in the Wisconsin State Journal, um, and it, it sheds a little light on this issue. Um, according to this story, at least two of the people Mr. Havana claimed were at the Wisconsin meeting, Rose Gunrow and Margaret Diamond, told the reporter that they were not there. Uh, the article in the paper actually also included uh, Mr. Ackley or, uh, from the tribe, although um, Ms. Arlen Ackerley, although my understanding is that Mr. Ackerley, in fact, was there. Um, so what I would ask, um, Mr. Chairman, is I would ask unanimous consent that the relevant excerpt of Mr. Havnick's testimony in the January 23, 19 article, 1998 article from the Wisconsin State Journal be inserted in the record. Mr. Chairman, I, I made a unanimous consent request there. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. One other request, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Um, I received earlier today a, um, a letter from a uh, constituent, not a constituent of mine, I should say, a resident of Hudson, Wisconsin, a Mr. William Cranmer, Ph.D. Um, I don't know this man. Um, I, it, was, it was to you. I don't know if it's the ordinary practice of the committee to include these in the record. Um, and I have not really looked in depth at his, at his letter, but I think it makes sense to have this included in the record as well. So I would also ask unanimous consent that the letter from William H. Cranmer, Ph.D., 
of Hudson, Wisconsin, dated January 26, be included in the reserving the right to object. Uh, gentleman reserves the right to object. Uh, I'd just like to see it. I'd be more than happy. We'll get you because get the gentleman you said that. he hadn't we'll looked at all. I, Let's just move on, and we'll hold it under the reservation. That's fine. And, and I would yield back yield. my time to Mr. Kanjorski. Gentleman yields back to Mr. Kanjorski. Yields back the balance of his time. Uh, who's next, Mr. Sen Mr. Mr. Horn? Mr. Sununu? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Sununu. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, on what day uh, did you learn that the application had been rejected? I believe that I heard that. Oh, pardon me. I'm not talking into the microphone properly. I believe that I heard that either the afternoon of the 14th or the 15th. I was in Minneapolis, and uh, my one of uh, my uh, associates uh, told me that uh, the O'Connor and Hannon office had received a press release. Uh, who was it that told you? I believe it would have been Mr. Corcoran. Well, I'd like to ask you about uh, Exhibit 385. Uh, this is a fax that was sent from Heather Sibison to Councilwoman Benjamin, and it says in part, uh, it asks the Councilwoman uh, to destroy, dispose of the old version of the rejection letter. So there was obviously a draft of the rejection letter prior to uh, June 14th that apparently had been sent to your clients. I guess my question... Chairman, we do not have exhibit 385 in our book. We'll suspend just a moment. Can you get uh, him exhibit 385, please, real quickly? Clearly, from the exhibit, uh, there's an indication that a draft of the finding, a draft of the rejection was sent prior to July 14th uh, to your clients, the St. Croix Tribal Council, uh, as evidenced in this exhibit. And my question would be, uh, didn't your own client uh, let you know that they had received an indication that a rejection had been written? I have never seen either one of these documents I now hold in my hand. And uh, my, uh, as far as I uh, can recollect, uh, uh, no uh, client of ours, which would have been uh, the uh, St. Croix tribe, ever communicated this to me. So the, the tribe knew that it had been rejected prior to the 14th, but they never bothered to inform you who, who was working on their behalf? I'm only saying I have not uh, seen these until today. I understand that you haven't seen this, but did they communicate to you that they knew in advance of the decision? Uh, my, uh, anyone from the St. Croix? Anyone at all communicate to you? No one to at all ever communicated to me uh, in advance of the decision of the interior. No one prior to the 14th? There's no one prior to the 14th. On June 2nd, 1995, uh, Tom Corcoran, your partner, billed one and a half hours uh, for uh, a drafting a memo to Vice President Gore with regard to the Hudson Casino. Uh, we have not received a copy of this memo. Uh, have you ever seen a copy of the memo he drafted to Vice President Gore about this issue? I don't. I don't believe so. I don't believe I ever saw it. Do you know what that memo dealt with? No. Did it ask the vice president to take any action? Well, I never asked the vice president to take any action or, or communicate with him either by phone or in writing. And you're not aware of any request that Mr. Corcoran may have included in this memo that he drafted and obviously billed, uh, billed time for? No. Uh, and I find it strange that uh, Mr. Corcoran, well, that's neither here nor there. I certainly find it strange that he would build a draft this memo and then not, then not be able to produce it for the committee. I'd like to ask you about the uh, fundraiser that you had on October 23rd, 
1996 for the vice president specifically. Uh, that was in Minneapolis, I believe, and we have a list of 20 attendees. Do you recall the event? It was in October of 96. That's correct. Uh, what date? October 23rd, 1996, a fundraiser with approximately 20 attendees. Approximately? With the vice president? Yes, in October in Minneapolis. That's What's correct. What's the uh, significance of 2,800? You said? October 23rd, 1996, there were approximately 20 attendees. 20? 20. 20. Yes, I recall that. Uh, is it true that approximately 14 of the 20 people at the fundraiser were opponents of the casino project? I'm not sure. I, I would have to look at the names of the people, uh, but of 14 out of 20, doesn't sound right to me. Well, my, uh, the information that the committee has are that there were 14, and I'd certainly ask the chairman to, to make a notation and verify that we can have it uh, correctly stated in the record, that 14 of the attendees were opposed to the application, seven in particular were from the Shakopee tribe. Uh, do you recall how much money was raised at that um, event? Uh, say that last. Do you recall how much was raised at the event? No, I don't. Re no, I don't recall off offhand how much money was raised at that event. Uh, but it, it's a record with the uh, election commission. Was the uh, the dog track uh, Hudson proposal uh, spoken about at the event? No. Never came up in in any conversation. No, not in that event. Not with me. You talked about a $50,000 goal that Mr. McAuliffe had set for you. Uh, when did he establish that as a fundraising goal for you uh, to raise that money with your uh, tribal clients? My recollection is that when McC uh, McAuliffe uh, uh, met with me and Kiddo, my recollection is uh, that the purpose of the meeting was to discuss how much of a money, hard money, $1,000 a person, could be uh, uh, solicited or secured uh, from Indians, not just our Indians, but uh, Indians throughout the United States that Mr. Mr. Kiddo has contact with. But Mr. McAuliffe was aware that you were working to, uh, to try and kill or, or, uh, the Hudson proposal. Me? Yes, that you were well, working if on I, behalf. Well, if I was kill, um, uh, killing it, I certainly didn't succeed in my efforts. To try and prevent the casino project? Well, I never got to Ickes. But it was indeed killed. But Mr. Mc my point is Mr. McAuliffe was aware of your efforts. Yeah. Uh, McCullough was aware that I represented um, uh, 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 Indians uh, that were opposed uh, to the... Uh, uh, Hudson, uh, the granting of that application. He was aware of that. Gen gentleman's time has expired. Uh, uh, well, if I could just ask you to clarify one statement that you made. You said you never got to Ickes. Isn't it, uh, didn't you state earlier today, however, that Mr. Schneider, uh, your uh, uh, partner, uh, spoke specifically to you saying, I did talk to Ickes and he said he was looking into it? That was your testimony earlier. That's true. Well, I, 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 I would only make clear for the statement that the, if one of your partners got to Ickes and, and these, this group is a, a client of yours, then that in effect is getting to Mr. Ickes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gen gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Maloney. Mr. Chairman, I yield my time to the ranking member. Ms. Thank Braxton. you very much uh, for yielding. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, your lawyer wanted to tell us yes. what the law was with respect to the White House contacting the Department of Interior, Chairman didn't want him to testify. Will you confer with your lawyer and tell us what your lawyer was going to tell us? We can get a clarification on that issue. Uh, um. I would say this, uh, Congressman, uh, there w there's been references made here about Judge Kraft, Kraft, Kraft's 
uh, uh, decision. And a lot of emphasis put on the fact that uh, possibility that uh, there may have been some uh, implication of uh, politics involved uh, in this. Uh, I uh, can say that uh, uh, judge, uh, the judge also said uh, that it's perfectly proper uh, for members of Congress or for members of the executive branch, including the White House, uh, to communicate uh, with Interior. It's, it's in that opinion. So in other words, um, the blanket statement that it's against the law for the White House to communicate in any way its views on a matter to the Department of Interior is not a correct statement. Uh, in my judgment, uh, no, and if in that opinion of the judge says that, uh, a federal judge in the federal litigation that's pending uh, uh, against Interior uh, in a federal district court in Wisconsin. Uh, it may be a moot issue because we have no evidence that the, Dep the White House c contacted the Department of Interior. Yeah. But to say that it's against the law for them to contact the Department of Interior is a big leap. Now, you were asked about a letter written uh, by John J. Duffy, counselor to the secretary on stationery from the United States Department of the Interior. You didn't write that letter, did you? What is the exact? I, I don't know. I, there's a letter that uh, I think Mr. Sununu asked you about this. It, it was a letter to Lewis Taylor, tribal chairman, St. Croix Tribal Council from John J. Duffy, counselor to the secretary. To the, to the secretary? Right. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I wasn't privy to any of that. Uh, the one who did, as I understand it from depositions, write this letter is Ms. Sibison, who works for the Department of Interior. And we asked that she uh, be permitted to testify, but uh, we were refused the opportunity to hear her testimony. But in her deposition, uh, she said this letter was sent by mistake. I haven't heard any evidence to the contrary, but to ask you about a letter that you didn't write and then to try to attribute what's in this letter to you is about as unfair as trying to attribute to Mr. Ickes a letter you wrote to him. I mean, this is, it's almost like Alice in Wonderland, things don't have any connection. It reminds me of the story of the man in New York who standing with his stick, and the man, another man said to him, what's that stick for? And he said, well, this is an elephant stick. And he said, an elephant stick? What, what does that mean? He said, well, this is to keep elephants away. He said, to keep, how, how do you have a stick to keep elephants away? And he said, well, you see any elephants here? Uh, when you have an issue where there are two sides, both heavily lobbied, one side's going to win and the other side's going to lose. And somebody could say it was their elephant stick that did it. It was magic that did it. Or they could try to take credit whether it was or not. But if it didn't make, it didn't influence a decision that the Department of Interior actually made without any political pressure, it, it, that's really the facts speak for themselves just like it's hard to believe that the elephant stick really kept the elephants away. I, I thank the gentlelady from New York for yielding to me so we can get this clarification of these loose things that are being said around this hearing so that we know um, what, you, what we should hold you responsible for and what we should hold other people responsible for. And members of Congress have to be responsible for statements they make, uh, hopefully uh, made with uh, some sense that there's a commitment to accuracy. Chairman, do you want me to yield any of my time to you? Yes, I'd be happy if you'd yield just a brief moment. Sure. Uh, stand corrected on whether or not it was the law, but we will stick by what we said earlier, uh, that Ms. Avent and Ms. Schmidt both, in memos number 304 and 305, said very clearly that uh, it was uh, political poison to, uh, to uh, uh, get into this, number one, and number two, it was totally improper for them to be interfering with the processes over at the uh, Department of the Interior. Now, when so, Mr. O'Connor called Ms. Avin, she said to him, I don't want to talk to you. I don't talk to lobbyists. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like they did what they were supposed to do. Well, the gentleman That's yield. Well, the gentleman from California yield. Uh, yes. Yield. I, I just want to concur in going back to that memo. I think it was political poison. Uh, and what we saw was we saw, frankly, 
attempts made by, made by both sides to continue to have an influence on this. It wasn't, it wasn't just Mr. O'Connor, but as we know, others were trying to have an influence. And in the end, the correct decision was made. The people yeah. of Hudson, Wisconsin, and the people of St. Croix, Wisconsin, did not want a Las Vegas-style casino foisted upon their community. And that is what the decision was, and that was the correct decision. Mr. Souter has a uh, unanimous like consent. I'd like to comment on my reservation to the... Your reservation, yes. Um, and ask a question. Um, the letter appears to be a very eloquent um, uh, testimony against the, the casino, and I don't have any problems with that. My, um, my question is, is the chairman had encouraged people to uh, submit oh, who were here and didn't have a chance to talk. In uh, part of late in this letter, he particularly is commenting on some of testimony from other witnesses. And as long as the record shows that there is a difference between depositions and sworn testimony and letters that people set in, I don't have a problem with putting in because I think it's a very heartfelt uh, and well-written letter. It's just that there is a distinction between a witness who's under oath. I would, I would ask unanimous consent that it be included and that it be noted that it was not, that it was a letter and was not submitted under no. Does under that meet your concerns? I withdraw my reservation. Without objection, so Thank ordered. You. We have, uh, let's see, earlier today, uh, I offered a unanimous consent. To I guess we can do that. Mr. O'Connor, you have been a very uh, patient witness uh, and you've acquitted yourself well, although we may have some disagreements and your counsel has been very patient. We appreciate your being with us today. Thank you. You're excused. I, we'll get to the next panel in just one moment. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Earlier today, I offered a unanimous consent request to release all documents relating to the St. Croix Meadows Greyhound Racing Park uh, be made publicly available. I did this because the committee will wrap up the hearings on this matter tomorrow and the public has a right to know the entire story. The Department of the Interior has raised some objections and we are accommodating the Department on two out of the three of their concerns. Because of this, the minority has agreed not to request a recorded vote but has demanded the question be placed before the committee in the form of a motion and not a unanimous uh, consent request. With that understanding, I have a motion at the desk and ask unanimous consent that the motion be considered as read and I recognize myself for five minutes in support of the motion. The Department of the Interior has said that some documents may be subject to the attorney-client privilege. Secretary Babbitt has not asserted the privilege, however. It is my judgment that privilege does not apply. Furthermore, these emails and letters concern the issue whether there was detriment to the community, an issue that was the subject of our hearings last week. I believe the public has the right to know this information and balance for themselves whether the decision to deny the application was on the merits or not. I now Mr. recognize Chair. Mr. Waxman for a brief statement. I uh, want to speak in opposition uh, to this motion. The uh, Interior Department is a party to a federal lawsuit in Wisconsin on the Hudson Casino issue. In that lawsuit, the Department withheld some documents written by its attorneys on grounds that they are subject to attorney-client privilege. They also withheld some documents prepared in anticipation of litigation on grounds of the work product doctrine. Although the Interior Department has withheld these documents from its opponents in the Wisconsin lawsuit, it produced them to the committee with the expectation that the committee would consult with them before releasing the documents to the public. It is our understanding, based on the representation of the Interior Department, that the majority intends to release these documents without any consultation. The question of whether the attorney-client privilege or work product doctrine is one that will require close scrutiny of the author, recipient, and content of each document. The Interior Department should have an opportunity to present its views on whether any of these documents are legitimately privileged or protected attorney work product. The majority apparently takes the position that its release of documents will not affect the Department's claim of privilege in the Wisconsin lawsuit. But this is an open legal question that the Department will likely have to litigate. The Department's claim of privilege and work product are matters that Judge Crabb can and ultimately will decide in the Wisconsin lawsuit. There is no reason the committee should interfere with the litigation and no reason why, at the very least, the committee cannot sit down with in Interior Department officials and attempt to resolve this issue amicably. And for that reason, uh, we oppose uh, the chairman's uh, proposal to uh, make these uh, documents part of the record and make them public. We recognize the fact 
that this would probably be a party line vote and that uh, the chairman has more Republicans to vote with him than we have Democrats to vote with me in opposition. Uh, so rather than inconvenience all the members to make them come here and cast a recorded vote, I, I will accept the chairman's verdict that uh, he uh, will win on a voice vote, even though as I look around the room at the moment, we probably have more votes on our side. But the uh, chairman will presumably call this uh, uh, as, a, as a, um, a victory for those who want the motion, and uh, we will accept that result, but I am registering my opposition uh, to it and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the motion. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed will signify by saying no. No. The opinion of the chair, as you suggested, the ayes have it, <laughs> and the motion is carried. It's uh, I would now invite the second panel, Mr. Tom Collier and John Duffy, to approach the witness table. Mr. Kinjorski. I was just going to make the observation that apparently the elephant stick worked in this case. <laughs> Glad you still have your sense of humor after this long day. Mr. Duffy, would you please stand and raise your right hand, please? You swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth of God. Yeah. You uh, are welcome to make an opening statement, each of you, if you so choose. Uh, we'd like for you, if you could, to confine it to a five-minute period, and if it's longer than that, we'll be able, we'll be happy to uh, submit the rest for the record. Uh, Mr. Duffy, I have an opening statement. Is my microphone on? I believe your microphone's on. You might want to pull it a little bit closer. How's that? That's that fine. Better, but you may yeah. need to pull them closer. Those don't pick up as well as uh, the mics up here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is John J. Duffy. I am currently an attorney in private practice in Washington, D.C. at the law firm of Steptoe & Johnson. I served as counsel to the Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt, from late 1993 until my departure in July of 1996. While I served in that position, I had some involvement with the Hudson Dog Track Casino application. There are several points that I would like to make about the application and about my recollection of the process that it took. First, neither I nor anyone else, to my knowledge, was instructed by the White House to deny the application. I had no contact with anyone at the White House about the matter. I understand that my assistant, Ms. Sibison, spoke with Jennifer O'Connor in Mr. Ickey's office and assisted in responding to correspondence from Congress about the application. I had no information that any of the tribes were contributors to either party if, in fact, they were. Excuse me, Mr. Duffy, if you could pull the mic directly in front of you and a little bit closer. Mr. Konjorski, I didn't, I don't think hears you as well as he should. I wish you would both do is that. This, is this? You need, you need to just pull it up close to you and as close as you can or move close to the table or whatever. Uh, is, is that better? Oh, that's a lot better. Okay. <clears throat> Second, the decision to deny the Hudson application was clearly correct. The Indian Gaming Reform Act, which Congress passed in 1988, makes it clear that Congress did not intend to authorize Indian gaming on land acquired by tribes far from their existing re reservations, except in very rare circumstances. I have appended the relevant statutory section to my statement. If tribes could easily open casino-type gaming facilities on land that they or others purchased far from their existing land, the purposes of IGRA would be subverted. One of the purposes of IGRA was to limit Indian gaming to existing Indian land. Off-reservation gaming by an Indian tribe was intended by Congress to be a rare event. The department did not believe that an application prepared by a Florida-based company on behalf of three tribes in Wisconsin for gaming off their existing reservations and right in the middle of communities which opposed it 
qualified for this exception. Third, I believed, and I said so, that the decision denying the application should address its compliance with the Indian Gaming Act. It was, after all, an application to take land into trust for gaming. I felt the department should be clear that in our view, the application did not meet IGRA's statutory requirements for an exception. I believe then, and I believe now, that it was important for the department to articulate its views on the requirements for the exception. I also thought it important that the decision explain the importance which the department gave to local opposition to off-reservation gaming by a tribe. In conclusion, I do not believe that it was the intent of Congress in enacting IGRA to permit Indian gaming off existing reservations under circumstances like this one. The notion that the decision was made because of any political affiliation or donation is simply incorrect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. Mr. Collier. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in a letter uh, to me dated January 9th, you requested that I appear before the committee to discuss the decision by the Department of Interior to deny the Hudson application on Wednesday, January 28, 1998 and Thursday, January 28, 1999. I'm happy to appear today. Um, my involvement in the denial of that application was minimal, and I'm prepared to ask, answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Collier. Uh, according to the rule, uh, the Council for the Majority is now recognized for 30 minutes. Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, Mr. Duffy, I believe you testified that you were counsel uh, to Secretary Babbitt. Uh, is that correct? I was actually counselor to Secretary Babbitt, yes. And you, re you remained in that position until midway through 1996? That's that correct? correct, yes. And Mr. Collier, you were the chief of staff to Secretary Babbitt, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, Mr. Collier, in the months before um, you left the Department of the Interior, uh, did you in fact have a number of uh, additional meetings than you would usually have with Native Americans? I met with uh, two or three tribes uh, in the month just before I left the department. That's correct, sir. I'd, I'd like to put up on the screen, if I may, uh, Exhibit 376. And just uh, for everybody's convenience, I think that I've managed to uh, pass out lists of exhibits that, that I intend to be referring to, and they're in the small packet in front of you, which might make it easier than looking through the large book, but you'll have two opportunities there. Um, exhibit 376 is, is a memo from Scott Dacey to Gary Jordan, and I'd like to refer to a, a section on page three of that memorandum. At the time of the writing of this memo, Mr. Dacey was the chief lobbyist for the Oneida tribe, which is one of the opponents uh, to the Hudson dog track application. And, and the memo states, um, Mr. Collier will be leaving the Department of the Interior at the end of June. He has been meeting with a number of tribes recently and says that he is putting a report to the secretary. Uh, he, has, he has been meeting with a number of tribes recently and says that he is putting a report to the secretary together concerning the future of Indian gaming. I expect that he will be joining his old law firm of Steptoe and Johnson in Washington, D.C., and his recent desire to meet with Indian tribes is his unique way of looking for future clients. Um, do you agree with Mr. Dacey's characteriz characterization of this memo? I do not. When you left uh, the Department of the Interior, you did, in fact, go to the law firm of Steptoe and Johnson. Is that correct, Mr. Collier? Uh, yes. I. Uh first uh, went to work for the law firm of Steptoe and Johnson in 1974 and have been employed by that firm with a couple of uh, opportunities for government service since that time, sir. And uh, Steptoe and Johnson has a significant practice dealing with Native American issues, is that correct? No, sir, it does not. It does not. Are, are there a number of individuals uh, currently employed at Steptoe and Johnson that deal with Native American issues? Uh, there are several, sir. Uh, does um, Steptoe and Johnson have an office in Arizona? We have an office in Phoenix, yes. Was that first established at the time of um, Governor Babbitt's uh, conclusion uh, of his tenure as the governor of Arizona? 
it was not. It was established before that time. Now, it's, it's my understanding that sometime after you joined the law firm that you began to represent the Shakopee uh, Medwakantan Sioux. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. When did you first begin to represent the Shakopee? In the month of November. Mr. Duffy, you were the counselor to the secretary at the time. Excuse uh, me, let me interrupt uh, Mr. Cairo briefly. When yes, did sir. you leave the Department of the Interior? I uh, resigned as chief of staff at the department on the 1st of June, sir, and oh. stayed there until the 1st of July, and I left the department on the 1st of July. Left on the 1st of, 1st of July, and when did you start representing the Shakopees? In November. Thank you. And Mr. Duffy, when you um, finished your tenure at the Department of the Interior, where did you go to work? Uh, I joined Steptoe and Johnson at that time. So you went to work at the same place as Mr. Collier, is that correct? That's correct. And it's my understanding that you have also done some work for the Shakopee tribe. Is that right? I have worked on their matters, yes. Now, just just to put this in perspective. Um, Excuse me, just one second. When did you leave the Department of uh, the Interior? I believe I left on the 17th of um, July, 1996. And did you immediately go to work for the same law firm? I did, yes. And uh, when did you start uh, doing work for the Shakopees? I don't recall. Several months later, I think. Thank you. And just to try and put this in perspective, if possible, um, it was the Shakopee tribe that the financial analyst for the Indian Gaming Management uh, staff of the Department of the Interior identified as the, um, the wealthiest of the opponents of the Hudson Dog Track application. Is that I, correct? I don't know. Were, were you aware of, in fact, did you read uh, the memorandum prepared by Mr. Hartman on June 8, uh, 1995? I don't believe so, no. Okay. Um, there is a section in there where, and if you could um, please put up exhibit 317A1, um, page 8, and there's a reference at the bottom of the paragraph. It states, at 96.8 at million, the per enrolled member profit at Mystic Lake is 396,700. Reduced by 8 million, the amount would be 363,900. The detrimental effect would not be expected to materially impact tribal expenditures on programs under IGRA Section 11. When, Mr. Duffy, when you were at the Department of the Interior, did you ever meet with any members of the Shakopee tribe or their representatives? Uh, not uh, to my um, knowledge. They may have been present in the February 8th meeting, and I think I've learned later that, that they were present in the February 8th meeting uh, in the congressman's office, Congressman Overstar's office. Mr. Collier, do you have any recollection of meeting with either members of the Shakopee or their representatives or lobbyists prior to your leaving the Department of the Interior? Um, Mr. Wilson, I don't believe I've ever met with the members of the uh, uh, Shakopee community while I was employed at the Department of Interior. Okay. Uh, and I'll address this question to both of you. In, in 1995, uh, just before the Hudson application was denied, did, um, and I'll ask you, Mr. Duffy, first, did you know that any of the opponent tribes, for example, the Oneida, the Shakopees, the Millock, or the St. Croix, had made uh, political contributions to the DNC or to Democratic state parties? Before the application was denied. I had no knowledge of that. No. And Mr. Collier, this is a question to you. Okay. Uh, were, were either of you aware that the opponents were said to be strong supporters of President Clinton? No. Did. Did either of you speak with with uh, Chairman, then Chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Don Fowler, about any issues involving the Hudson uh, dog track application? I don't believe I did. No, Mr. Collier. Not to my recollection. If if we could please put up um, Exhibit uh, 383. Uh, on the screen, and I'll, I'll read you a section from a deposition, and I just wanted to get your comment on um, whether this ref refreshes your recollection at all. Um, 
Mr. Mr. Duchesneau attended a meeting with Chairman, then Chairman uh, Fowler, and actually, I'd like to ask either you, you, you have both testified that you have not spoken with uh, Chairman Fowler about any issues relating to the Hudson matter, correct? That's correct. That's my recollection. Okay. Um, Mr. Duchesneau states that in the meeting that he attended, um, excuse me, Council, do you have a page number? On that? Yes, I do. It's it's Exhibit 383-1. 383. 383. 383.5. Um, I have 383-1, but it's a two-page document. Uh, the first page is deposition of Franklin Duchesneau. We don't have 383. It's earlier. In and it should be this, the third document in the packet of, of information that you have. But let, let me just read you the, the comment um, Mr. <coughs> Duchesneau made in characterizing his meeting with uh, Mr. Fowler. Um, he said that at the meeting, they indicated to Mr. Fowler that, uh, at least the Minnesota tribes did, that they had been strong supporters of President Clinton in his race for president. They had engaged in getting out the vote efforts on their reservations. They had contributed to the Democratic candidates routinely, and they were outraged that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was not giving adequate consideration to their objections, and felt that, particularly since one of the leaders of one of the tribes was a Republican, and also the Republican governor of Wisconsin seemed to be getting some special treatment. Um, did, did any of the uh, observations made by Mr. Duchesneau, were they ever brought to your attention? And Mr. Duffy? I'm, I'm trying to look for this. Um, uh, I don't recall having any information about uh, Mr. Or President Clinton. Um, I do believe that at the February 8th meeting, um, there was a statement made about um, some of the tribes being Republicans and some being Democrats. Let me, uh, now the, the law firm that you two joined uh, is a law firm, I guess, that Mr. Babbitt was uh, a party to, a partner in at one time, right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, when did the Shakopees become a client of that law firm? In November of 1995. So they became a client of this firm after the decision was made? That is correct. And when did you go to work for the law firm? Um, I began working for the law firm in July of 1995. Now, is it safe to say that you were the one that solicited and brought the Shakopees to the law firm? No, it's not. It is not. Why did they come to the law firm? Um, they approached me and asked me to represent them. I did not solicit their business. They approached you. That's correct, sir. Uh, but you did uh, you did uh, uh, know of the of the declination of the application for the gambling casino by the ones that the Shakopees opposed prior to them coming to your firm, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, two comments with respect to your question. I'm not certain that I actually did know that the application had been denied at that point. Um, and second, I never knew that the Shakopees were one of the tribes that were involved on either side of this issue. I wasn't involved in this issue uh, <coughs> enough to know who the tribes were um, that had an interest in it on either side. How about you, Mr. Duffy? I'm sorry, what was did, the question? Did, did you, did you uh, uh, know, I mean, you knew obviously of this uh, uh, decision by the department uh, to decline the application of the tribes for the casino at the Hudson Dog Track site before you left? Oh, yes. Did you have anything to do whatsoever with this uh, Shakopee tribe uh, coming as a client to the law firm? None whatever. Did you have anything to do with the decision to turn down the uh, the site uh, at the Hudson Dog Track. I participated in the decision making process. Yeah. To what extent did you participate? I was uh, in the secretary's office. I had what I've described as a monitoring role on the decision making process. But you didn't make the categorical decision to turn it down. I did not make the decision. No. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, 
just one second here. Mr. Scabeen uh, said in a memo, which we referred to last week, said on page five, section four, do they have a copy of this memo? Um, yes, they do. It's, it's in the packet of information in front of you, and it's page. marked 337-5. Uh, 337-5. Yeah, and on, on page five, section four, it says, this is Mr. Scabeen talking in his memo. He says, it is true that extensive factual findings supporting the local community's objections are nowhere to be found. DOI's position is that such extensive factual findings are not required, not required under section 20 of IGRA, IGRA. And then they go up to, we go up to section three. It says, see comments under uh, number three above. You go up to number three and it says, the point here, and a very crucial one, is that the department has to rely on the record, and the opposition of the local communities in the record is the evidence relied upon. The department, and then in parentheses it says Duffy, the department, then it says Duffy, made a decision that the opposition of the local communities was evident per se of detriment, and that the department was not going to require the communities for detailed evidence to back up their opposition. Sounds like that you were very deeply involved in the decision-making process. Would, would, could you identify for me what this memo is? This is a memo from Mr. Scabine. It tells on the front page there. This is a memo to Scott Keep, the Assistant Solicitor of Tribal Government and Alaska, uh, from George Scabine. And it was analysis of factual allegations in plaintiff's appeal brief in Skokagan, Chippewa community. So Mr. Scabine pretty much says that you were the guy that was making the decision. I don't think he says that at all. Well, what do you think he said? I think he indicates that I took a position on this. And I agree that I took a position with respect to whether or not we should use Section 20 of IGRA. And I believe I said that we should uh, also rely on Section 20 of IGRA. But do you, you, if you read down in Section 4, he says, DOI's position is that, is that such extensive factual findings are not required under Section 20 of IGRA. And so his position was that it was not required, and yet when he refers to you, you, you said that was the basis of the decision. I'm, I just have to read this here. I, I'm, I'm going to read Section 4 is what we'll, you're we'll, pointing we'll, to. We'll suspend for a moment then while you read it because we don't want to make sure we get through all the questioning. So we suspend for just a moment and give him time to digest it. The thing is, Mr. Scabine signed the declination, or no, Mr. Anderson signed the declination, but it was, uh, it's been reported to us in the committee that Mr. Scabine made the decision to decline the application. But in this document, it says, DOI's position, Department of the Interior's position, is that ex such extensive factual findings are not required, not required, under Section 20 of IGRA. And then it says, see comments number three above, and then it goes back and says that you made the decision on another basis. No, no, I, I don't. I, it says the Department Duffy made a decision that the opposition of the local communities was evidence per se of detriment, that the Department was not going to require the communities for detailed evidence to back up their opposition. L let me tell you, if I may, sure. Mr. Chairman, what I understand this to be. This, I understand, is Mr. Scabine's response to the specific allegations in the complaint. Right. And what he is saying here is that in response to the allegation that there's no factual support He's saying it's true that extensive factual findings supporting the local community's objections are nowhere to be found. Then he goes on to say that the position of the uh, DOI's position is that they aren't necessary. And he explains it further on by saying that the language of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act does not require such findings as a legal matter. Rather, it provides, and I'm quoting here, 
that the secretary must determine that a gaming establishment on newly acquired lands would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. The department must find it is not detrimental to the surrounding community. And what he then says is, absent conclusive evidence that there is no detriment, the secretary can reasonably determine that facts have not shown that the gaming establishment would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. He's applying a test to the facts in the record, and he's indicating that the department cannot make a finding of no detriment. The, the, the criterion that was used prior to this decision, though, as we understand it, did not use that same, uh, same uh, 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 set of rules. But that's, the the language in, that's the language in the statute. No. Well, just one second. Mr. Duffy, if I could just follow up on a distinction you made there. You said that as a legal matter, um, it is true that, uh, and you had been read the, the statement, DOI's position is that such extensive factual findings are not required under Section 20 of IGRA, and you noted that as a legal matter, that was a correct statement of fact. Uh, does that represent a change of policy uh, for the Department of the Interior? I believe this is the correct interpretation of IGRA. I mean, it, it, we, what is done here is Mr. Scabine is clearly uh, following the statute that the burden of determining detriment is not placed on Hudson. The burden of determining whether or not there is existing detriment is on the department. The department must make an affirmative finding of no detriment. Now, but Mr. Duffy, recognizing that that you believe that this is a correct interpretation of the statute, does it represent a departure in the way the uh, Department of the Interior had interpreted the statute? I don't believe so. It, it's, it's my recollection when Mr. Scabine was before the committee last week, he said this, uh, we, we brought to his attention, this was the first time this had been uh, uh, decided this way, and Mr. Scabine said, well, he was not in charge of the department at that time, or in the previous cases, and that they had been incorrect in the way they'd uh, applied the law in the past. So this was the first time that they'd used this, uh, this approach. I'm, uh, Mr. Scabine here is pointing out what is, in fact, the approach that he has used, which follows the statutory language. This is a departure from what the previous uh, uh, procedure had been. I, I don't believe so. Well, you're you're the counsel. Uh, or you're the counsel, weren't you? Uh, <laughs> to the no, I'm I'm in a I'm I'm a counselor to the secretary. I'm not the solicitor. I'm not the solicitor's office. It's the solicitor's office that determines the law and how the law ought to be interpreted. Right. Did you talk to anybody at the solicitor's office I, about that? I believe I spoke to Robert Anderson, who was then the associate solicitor of Indian Affairs. And and in your conversations with him, did you talk about this being a departure from previous procedures? I think we talked about whether or not the interpretation that Mr. Scabine gave here was an appropriate interpretation, and I believe he said it was. Just following up on that, you mentioned that you spoke with uh, Mr. Robert Anderson about this matter. Did he provide you with a uh, legal interpretation? I, I don't you? recall a specific conversation. I, I did review as part of one of the depositions that I have um, participated in a document which I believe uh, sh indicated that there was a meeting at some time in which I attended with Bob Anderson, but I don't have a specific recollection of that. But my understanding is that, um, that there was a discussion there of that subject matter. That's what the memorandum, I believe, says, and that Mr. Anderson agreed with the position that Mr. Scabine has taken here. But notwithstanding the inability to recollect a specific date, do you have a general recollection that Mr. Anderson provided you some uh, advice on this. I, uh, that's what this memorandum says, yeah. Okay. It, it, and this is just something, a clarification for the record and, and for our knowledge. Uh, is Mr. Anderson a member of one of the tribes opposed to the Hudson application? I don't know what Mr. Anderson's tribal membership is. Okay. Well, perhaps that's something that we can um, follow up on later. Um, you know, although it does not involve a 
uh, application for a gaming facility. Are you both aware that the Shakopee tribe is uh, currently involved in an application to take land into trust in Minnesota? We don't represent them on that. You, you do not represent them? Are you, are you aware or do you have any knowledge of that, Mr. Duffy? I believe in, I, someone in conversation indicated that to me, but not as a legal matter. I think that was just a part of the conversation. Mr. Collier, do you have any knowledge of that? I have a vague recollection that um, that there is such a matter pending, but I don't know which land or any of the details, and we don't represent them at all. Mm -hmm. Just uh, as a related matter, are you aware that um, this application is, is being opposed specifically and strongly by the state of Minnesota, the uh, city of Shakopee, and Scott County, where the land is uh, located? Do you have any knowledge of that, Mr. Collier? I have no knowledge of that. Mr. Duffy? No. Uh, the the follow-up question, I think we'll get the same answer, but um, it's come to our attention that the uh, area director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs has resisted meeting with uh, any of the opponents to this application to take land into trust uh, that the Shakopees have advanced. And I was going to ask your um, opinion of that, but if you have no knowledge of the other facts, I think I'm probably going to uh, not get very far with that. But you have no knowledge of that, Mr. Duffy or Collier? Uh, I do not me, have any knowledge. Let, no. let me follow up real quickly. I want to go back to this memo real quickly. It says, it is true, Mr. Scabine's memo, it is true that extensive factual findings supporting the local community's objections are nowhere to be found. He's saying that there was, n there was no, no factual basis uh, supporting the local community's objections. There, there's no, nowhere to be found. But then it goes up and it says in Section 3, the Department, Duffy, made a decision that the opposition of the local communities was evidence per se of detriment. So while he's saying, he's saying in Section 4, it's true that, that extensive factual findings supporting the local community's objections, it, there's, it's nowhere to be found. And yet it says that you made the decision that the opposition of the local communities was evidence per se of detriment. Congressman, what you're asking me here is to interpret Mr. Skabeen's memorandum. All I can tell you is what I, know, but he, I understood. He was the fellow that was in charge of this area. He says very clearly, it's true that there was no factual findings supporting the local community's objections. It was, it was nowhere to be found. And yet it says that you made the decision that the opposition of the local communities was evidence per se of detriment. Well, on what basis did you make that? Because Mr. Skabeen was in charge of that area. Congressman, Mr. Skabeen says here, it is true that extensive factual findings supporting the local communities were no man to be found. Now, as a matter of fact, the decision very clearly indicates a series of factual findings with respect to detriment concerning both the local community and the local tribe. Well, well I think the emphasis here is on extensive factual findings. But Mr. Duffy, I don't want to split hairs here, but there was a referendum there was uh, votes. There were the mayor was involved. There, there, it, it, at the very least, it was split. The 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 decisions of, of the local communities on on this issue. You had you had several people testify before us that yes, there was a vote 51 or 52 to 48 that the the, the town approved it and the mayor was for it. And then of course there was a recall petition. There was just a lot of things that went on politically in this fight. But it was uh, it was. Uh, uh, half a dozen of one and six of the other. So how did you come to the decision that, uh, that uh, there was uh, evidence of detriment when there was that kind of a split in the community? Because, Congressman, we took the approach with respect to evidence of detriment that we would look entirely at the concerns of the local elected officials. Uh -huh. We realized that there was no way that we could make a determination based on referendums, some of which were paid for by private parties, uh, material, letters, which might have been generated, we couldn't figure out uh, a question of whether or not the community was in favor or against something. So we looked to the local community. And the reason for that was that when you take land into trust, Congressman, you take it away from the local community, out of their regulatory jurisdiction, out of their control, and you give it to the tribe. So it seemed to us that we ought to focus our attention on the party that was losing control. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that we should consult well, when there was a determination. Let, let, let is this the first time this has been done? Is the first time what has been that done? That land has been put in trust like this and, and casinos uh, constructed outside the uh, tribal community? No. Uh, so it's been done before. There's no question yes, about that. Yes, it has. Uh, 
the dog track was already there. The lo parking lot had 8,000 spaces. According to testimony last week, they were only going to utilize 4,000 of those spaces as far as uh, additional problems for the community from a physical uh, infrastructure standpoint. There really wasn't going to be any. They had already done an environmental impact study before locally, and the environment was not going to be hurt anymore because there wasn't going to be that many cars and people there. So the only question was, was there going to be a casino there, and was this casino going to be stopped uh, because of, uh, of, uh, of the local community or because of the lobbying efforts of the Shacklebees? The thing that troubles me, Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier, is that you, you were involved especially you, Mr. Duffy, in the decision-making process. You, you leave the Department of the Interior, and you go to a law firm, and you immediately start representing the tribe that benefited from your decision. And Mr. Collier represents the tribe that benefited from these decisions. Mr. Collier was the chief of staff, and you were one of the chief legal experts in the Department of the Interior. It sure, sure looks kind of funny, wouldn't you say? I mean, doesn't it, doesn't it smack of a little bit of uh, unusual... Uh, an unusual situation where you're involved in the decision-making process and the, 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 the tribe that benefits ends up hiring you as a legal uh, counselor with a law firm that you go to represent? Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, since um, the uh, Shakopee representation came to me while I was at the law firm of Steptoe & Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to respond to your, uh, to your question. Sure. Um, I think there are two very important facts. Um, the first one is that there is no connection whatsoever to any work I did at the Department of Interior, including my minimal involvement in the Hudson Dog Park <coughs> issue, and my representation of the Shakopees. And just so there's no misunderstanding, uh, let me say it again, there's no connection whatsoever to that representation and work I did at the department. And second, um, I take issues of ethics and revolving door concerns very seriously. Um, when I left the department, uh, Mr. Chairman, I received a briefing in detail from the ethics officer in the department, who was a career official that had been in that job uh, during the previous administration and then was there during our administration. <coughs> Um, and from a member of the solicitor's office that has dealt with these issues for um, an extensive career. I returned to my law firm, and just to make sure there wasn't any misunderstanding with respect to that, I asked them to put the essence of the briefing they'd given me in writing, and they sent that to me in a letter. Mm -hmm. I then took that advice to the executive committee of my law firm and discussed the matter with them. On the executive committee was our ethics counsel, mm -hmm. Bob Jordan, who is the ex-president of the D.C. Bar Association, the ex-chairman of the D.C. Bar Association you, you, you don't need ethics to go into committee. This long litany. I understand where Mr. You're chairman, from. you have been making. Um, I know, but let me just ask I, you one final question. If I may finish my I, answer, I, Mr. Chairman. I understand chairman. where you. What, you don't need to go into this long litany. I'm running out this of time. This is this is very important I to me. I understand it is. And I want to make sure you appreciate All right. that my representation of the Shakopees does not violate any ethics rule. It doesn't violate any statute. In fact, Mr. Chairman, there's a specific statute that allows that representation, um, and that specific statute, in certain circumstances, requires you to inform the department before you take on such representation. That does not apply in this situation, and yet I took an extra step under the law to inform the department. And so the two points I want to make sure this committee understands without any doubt is that there is no question as to the legality or the ethical appropriateness of my representation of the Shakopee tribe. And second, there is no connection whatsoever to work I did at the department and my representation no, of the because, Shakopees. Because of your lengthy answer, I, I will take the liberty of just taking a little bit more time, and I'll give my colleagues the extra time if he requires as well. First of all, the Shakopees were the beneficiary of the decision made by the Department of the Interior. Mr. Chairman, I was uh, not at the Department of Interior when that decision I was made. I understand. I did not know the Shakopees were involved in that how, decision how at all. How did the Shakopees come to ask you to work for, uh, to, to represent them? The Shakopees were interested in counsel on several matters, 
and they sought references from several people um, throughout the country. One of those referred them to me. They came and met with me. We had a discussion about those issues, and they decided to retain me. Well, let me, let me read to you what Mr. This was a question put to Mr. Babbitt. Does it concern you, if only in appearance, that Mr. Collier and John Duffy, after they left the department, worked on behalf of one of the tribes that opposed the Hudson Casino application at your former law firm? And Mr. Babbitt said, although Congress has explicitly exempted such representation from the employment restrictions imposed on former federal employees, it is not something that I condone nor something that I would ever do. So your former employer thinks that this uh, gives the appearance of impropriety. And the thing that concerns me, and uh, we are not here to try to impugn anybody's integrity, but we, we're, I appreciate trying, that, we're trying to get the facts out. And the facts are that Mr. Duffy was involved in the decision-making process. You were the chief of staff. A very, very wealthy tribe and other tribes uh, benefited by this decision. And you went to work. And in a short period of time thereafter, both you and Mr. Duffy are the beneficiary of that decision because you are now representing the Shakopees. Now, although there may not be anything legally wrong with it, the appearance of impropriety is very real, even according to Mr. Babbitt, the Secretary of the Interior. With that, I'll yield to uh, Mr. Chairman. Questions. May I respond to your, sure, you can your respond. comment, please, sir? Um, uh, with all due respect to my uh, former boss, the Secretary of Interior, um, since these matters came up, uh, my counsel has advised me that I shouldn't uh, discuss anything with him, and I have not. Um, I don't believe that uh, Secretary Babbitt, frankly, is fully aware of all of the facts with respect to my representation of the Shack. <coughs> And I think that his comment reflects the fact that he's not fully aware of those facts. Uh, second, if I may, um, I want to reiterate that there is no connection whatsoever to any work I ever did at the Department of Interior and my representation of the Shakopees. Mr. Duffy was hired by my firm more than a year after that decision was made. I was not involved in this decision at the Department of Interior. I had left the department when this decision was made. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Call, you described the lengthy process on, by which you'd established uh, the ethics uh, to move over this law firm. Mr. Duffy, did you go through a similar uh, procedure? Yes, a uh, relatively similar procedure. That's correct. Uh, Mr. Duffy, the applicant tribes and Fred Havenick testified last week that they believed that this application was going to go through until politics got in the, in the way. Uh, it's my understanding that all off-reservation casinos, such as Hudson, are closely scrutinized by the department before they're approved. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, was the decision to deny the application based on the recommendations of George Skabeen and the career gaming staff? That's correct. And then a decision was made by Mr. Anderson. In your judgment, uh, was there a recommendation based on the merits? Absolutely. Mr. Collier, uh, let me ask you the same question. Is it your understanding that the application was reject rejected based on the recommendations of career department employees? Um, Congressman, I had left the department by the time this decision was made, and I don't have any firsthand knowledge as to any basis for this decision. Mr. Duffy, did you ever pressure the department's career employees to recommend that the application be rejected? No, I did not. Uh, and you, Mr. Collier, did you ever pressure the department's career employees on their recommendation? No, Congressman, I did not. Mr. Duffy, did you ever receive any instructions or opinions on the Hudson application from Harold Ickes or anyone at the White House? No. Uh, and the same question to you, Mr. I Collier. did not, Congressman. Mr. Duffy, what about the DNC or the Clinton-Gore campaign? Did anyone from those organizations ever express an opinion to you about the Hudson application? I don't believe so, no. And I didn't. No. And Mr. No, Carter, Congressman. Uh, let me address the next question to both of you. Did Terry McAuliffe ever speak to you about the Hudson application? No. No. Uh, and again, to both of you, do either of you have any knowledge that suggests that the decision to reject the application uh, was made in return for promises of political contributions from the opponent tribes? None whatever. Nor me. And do either of you have any knowledge that the department's decision-making process was tainted by any improper political influence? None. No. It seems to me a legitimate concern that you might have for the best interests of the Indian tribes was the effect that approval of 
off-reservation gaming might have on public support in Minnesota and Wisconsin for on-reservation uh, gaming. In short, it's possible that if the Department approved a series of off-reservation exceptions, the tribes could lose the benefits they currently have from the policy of on-reservation gaming. Was that part of your thinking, Mr. Duffy? I, that's absolutely correct, Congressman. That's part of my thinking, yes. And Mr. Collier? Um, I don't recall on specifically on this issue having that concern, but on this uh, issue as a matter of general policy, yes, that was a concern. Um, it was stated that Mr. Scabine told us last week that uh, uh, he didn't know about the precedence of these off-reservation issues. As I recall his testimony, and we can check it out because there is a transcript that he, as I recall him, his testimony, that he didn't look at the past presidents because he didn't think he needed to to make a decision in this case. Uh, there have been some decisions in the past where off-reservation gaming has been approved. Uh, isn't that accurate, Mr. Duffy? I believe that's correct, but I don't have a detailed knowledge of that. Well, in one case in Connecticut, the land was uh, contiguous to the reservation and, uh, and was approved for a uh, trust. Wh which case was that? I think it was in Connecticut. I don't recall. Is it the Pequod case? Uh, yes. That was not a gaming case. It was not a gaming that case. That was a pure land and trust case. had no gaming implications, whatever. Are you familiar with a decision in, the Oreg in Oregon on an uh, off-reservation trust? Are you talking about the Solets case? Yes. Solets yeah. tribe of uh, Oregon. Yes. Uh, it, that was made in the prior administration, I believe. And as I uh, understand the uh, issue there, the, the tribe filed an application with the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs Area Office seeking to have land taken in trust for gaming purposes. Uh, the 10-acre parcel was to be taken in trust, was located in Salem, Oregon, approximately 40 miles from the tribe's reservation. On July 14, 1992 and October 21, 1992, the BIA Area Office forwarded the, uh, to the BIA Central Office its written recommendation for a departmental finding that one, the requirements for taking the land into trust under Part 151 have been met, and two, Section 20, taking the land in trust for gaming would be in the best interest of the tribe and would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. I, I don't know the details yeah. of that decision, Congressman. Uh, well, I, I, I point that out because uh, th there is this question of whether all off-reservation gambling uh, requests had been approved and suddenly this one was disapproved. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the historical uh, record. Mr. Uh, Collier, did the Shakopees make a contribution to the DNC? Um, I'm aware of one contribution that they made, uh, Congressman. And that contribution was for uh, $20,000, not $50,000, has been alleged? The contribution that uh, I worked with them on was for $20,000, that's correct. And did you solicit that contribution? I did not solicit the contribution, Congressman. They uh, approached me and, and asked some questions of me uh, with respect to that contribution, and I responded to those questions and uh, gave them the, the assistance they needed. And what did they ask you? Uh, Congressman, it's uh, uh, difficult to communicate uh, privileged communications between uh, my, my client and, and myself. I, it's inappropriate to do so. But let me, uh, uh, let me tell you uh, what my goal was with respect to the uh, work I did uh, for the Shakopees on this contribution, and it was simply to make certain that the contribution was done in a proper and legal fashion. Do you know, uh, Mr. Collier, of any linkage whatsoever between the Shakopee's decision to contribute to the DNC and the Hudson Casino decision? I'm not aware of, of any information whatsoever that would lead me to believe that there was <coughs> any connection between that contribution and the decision on the Hudson dog track. Uh, for the record, uh, uh, we were able to get the transcript uh, from Mr. Uh, Scabine's testimony, and uh, he said, as the head of the office, the gaming office, uh, now this was, this was part of the question. This was part of the question put to him. As the head of the office, the gaming office, uh, which you then were, and with your 20 years at Interior, 
Can you give me today any examples of which an application was reject rejected not under Section 20, but under Section 465? And Scabine answered, I cannot. I would. I cannot really talk about matters that occurred before I became the gaming director, so I can't answer that question. There may be some. There may not be. And then Mr. Cox was asking the questions. Do you know of any? Scabine, specifically, I can't recall of any. Cox, in connection with preparing this, did you find any precedent? Scabine, no. No, this decision was made on the merits of this application. That was Mr. Uh, Scabine's uh, testimony. I want to uh, put on the screen I, an excerpt from Mr. Duffy's deposition, which was taken on January 26, 1998. And uh, Mr. Duffy said, I don't believe there's a shred of evidence that Mr. Ickes ever talked to the Secretary about this or the Secretary ever talked to Mr. Ickes about it. Is that a correct statement, Mr. Collier? As far as I know, that's absolutely... Oh, excuse me, this was Mr. Duffy. Yes. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is, Congressman. You said it, and you still stand by it? Absolutely. Well, then we had a colleague of ours, Mr. Horn, at this deposition. Now, again, a deposition is not like this, a public hearing with an audience, even a television camera. A deposition is in a room with a reporter taking things down. And Mr. Horn said, let me ask a question. One of your sentences was, I don't believe there's a shred of evidence that Mr. Eckes ever called the secretary. Was that because it had been shredded at either end of between the White House and the Interior Department? And then, Mr. Duffy, your answer was no. I wasn't there. I don't know if Mr. Horn asked that as a joke. Uh, do you recall whether it was asked as a joke or was it sarcasm? I think it was the latter. Sarcasm is the way I would. Well, I only point this out because I just think that people who come in and give their depositions shouldn't be bullied by members of Congress. And I guess it's easy to bully people when you're in a little room and thinking maybe no one will uh, pay attention. It also indicates that whatever your answer is, it doesn't make any difference. The decision in Mr. Horn's mind and others is that there was some wrongdoing. No matter the fact that all the people made the decision on the merits, without political interference, that's their sworn testimony, and we really don't have anything to contradict uh, those uh, clear and unequivocal statements. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'd just like to conclude by re reiterating the co comments I made during my opening statement last week uh, before I yield to others. These questions were necessary because we've reached a point in the committee where individuals have to come before the committee to disprove baseless allegations that have been made against them. We're no longer in the normal situation where wrongdoing has to be proved by those making the allegations. No one has been able to prove or even make to me a credible showing that there was any wrongdoing. And it seems to me those who make the accusations should bear that burden. One last question, Mr. Duffy, just to clarify it. I, I cannot keep straight in my mind what the basis was that Mr. Scabine wanted to turn down the application or what you suggested be the basis for turning down the application. But to me, it doesn't sound like it makes a lot of difference because you end up with the same result. Isn't that accurate? I, I think that's exactly accurate. Uh, that's exactly correct. And it was really a technical matter within the Department of the Interior, not the question of the substance of the decision, but rather a technical question as to how we would express it and under what sections we would make our determination. Some people have suggested to me that the basis that you suggested for uh, rejecting uh, the application might be easier to challenge in court than the one that Mr. Scabine suggested. Do you know? Uh, because we were not thinking about whether or not one was easier or one was harder to challenge in court. The underlying decision under 465 was an appropriate mechanism because we would not, under our approach, have taken this land into trust, no matter what the reason it was going to be used for, this far away from the tribe's reservations. And I have repeatedly stated that, that this is a very long distance from their reservation. And res the, the uh, policy of the United States government has been relatively clear on this, that as you get further away from the tribe's reservation, 
the impact that it will have on the local community rises in importance and the objection to the local community rise in importance versus uh, land and trust close to the reservation. So that, that's true regardless of whether it's gaming or not gaming. So Mr. Scabine was correct that we could have made that decision alone, but I thought that it also, also should have been made under Section 20, and that was my recommendation. I want to yield uh, to Mr. Kondrowski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me clear up a few points here that uh, we'll be facing tomorrow and won't have the opportunity of asking him tomorrow when the Secretary is here. Uh, as my understanding, your testimony, Mr. Collier, is that you left the Department prior to this decision having been made and you participated in no way in the making of this decision. Now, may I ask you if you know whether Secretary Babbitt in any way had a direct impact on this decision or participated in any direct way on this decision? Uh, not while I was at the department, sir. And you left within two, two weeks prior to the decision being filed? I did, although for the month of June I was uh, much less involved in these things. Uh, <coughs> I had resigned my job as chief of staff, so really there's a six-week period there that I was out of the loop. All right. uh, Mr. Duffy, uh, a lot of questions have been raised on this uh, memorandum, and uh, uh, Perhaps, if, if I could understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it was the burden of the applicant to establish that there wouldn't be a detriment on the community. It was not the burden of the community to prove there was a detriment. Is that correct? That's my understanding. My understanding is the way this is phrased, it is the department's obligation to determine that there's no detriment. No. Right. So that the minuscule amount of evidence that would be on the record to indicate detriment would be sufficient for the department not to conclude that there was no detriment. That's what I believe the decision actually says. Right? And that uh, you use some legalistic terms, or at least in this clause, that you thought you took the position that since there was opposition expressed on the record, although not overwhelming or extensive factual information since they had made an opposition and since there was some evidence of opposition. That would be evidence per se of detriment. I took the position, Congressman, uh, that I took, I took the position, Congressman, that in fact I thought that opposition alone would be sufficient. That was my position, okay? Now, there was a considerable debate about that. And the ultimate decision is not that. That is not the ultimate decision of the department. The ultimate decision of the department rests on detriment, detriment to the local community and detriment to the local tribe, in this case, the St. Croix tribe. So there is detriment. But if your interpretation of the weight of evidence necessary were a question, you then are, are, are rather qualified by saying if, they, if the court doesn't agree with you, they'll reverse the opinion. Yeah. And that's correct. That's and that's up to a court, and it's in court now, I assume that being one of the issues. The question of whether that is adequate is a question initially for the solicitor's office, right. and they have agreed with it. Right. And on that position, we've heard a lot of questions here by both sides on precedent. As I understand, this has nothing to do with stare decisis or common law. This is administrative law policy, and that each application is on its own merits, and the facts particularly of that application. Is that correct? That's correct. Whether all prior requests were made and granted or whether all prior requests were made and not granted would have no impact on how this particular decision would be decided. Is that correct? I'm not sure that's correct. I think there is a requirement for us to explain how we are deviating from policy if we have deviated. It would be in deviation from policy, but right. not past conclusions on applications. It is we not a matter of stare decisis here. And not technically, no. Right. Now, you uh, uh, have been named as, uh, quote, the representative of the secretary that had some impact on this decision. As I understand your testimony today, you absolutely deny taking part in any of the substantive part of this decision, but were only effective in the process, how the decision should be addressing these particular sections, section 20 or section uh, 
uh, 365 or 465? I, I think I said that I participated in the decision-making process. I made recommendations as to what I thought the decision ought to be and how we ought to treat the matter in, in the sense that I uh, made a recommendation, for example, that we deal with this under Section 20. Um, but I did not make the decision and the initial decision, recommended decision, was made by Mr. Scabine. Did, did that decision and recommendation in draft form get created before you stepped into the picture to polish the decision and see that it comported with uh, what you thought the legal requirements would be? My sense of the timing is that I received a decision recommendation from Mr. Scabine that had already been made. Yes, Congressman. Right. Now, do either one of you know any involvement of Secretary Babbitt in the f decision in this matter? And secondly, do either of you know of any political influence or influence as a result of political contributions that uh, affected this decision or imposed the Secretary into this decision-making process? I don't know of any uh involvement of Secretary Babbitt in making this decision, no. And I know of no political inf influence on this decision. This decision was made on the facts, on the merits. It's obviously a good decision, and I am constantly amazed that this is not obvious to all parties. <laughs> just go ahead. I agree entirely with Mr. Duffy's answers. All right. Now, uh, maybe I'll just go off the record, and knowing the chairman is not an attorney by profession, Maybe I let the record show that it is not unusual, Mr. Chairman, for an attorney to be retained by opponents in a, in a prior case or by disappointed parties in a prior case or members of a jury that may have witnessed that attorney in action. As a matter of fact, prior to the right of advertising, that was very common how a, an attorney or a law firm built a practice to uh, uh, imply that there is some improper uh, connection with gaining a client because of your demonstrated expertise as a counselor would do a great disservice to the legal profession. And I think, Mr. Collier, I'm going to ask you, is that what you're trying to show, that in every instance you used every method to interpret what would be ethical and you went beyond the pale of notifying the department that you were going to undertake this representation because you know it was an Indian tribe and in your prior activities in the, in the Department of Interior who had some effect on Indian tribes. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Congressman, you uh, said it much better than I did. I agree with your characterization. Right. And Mr. Duffy, from your standpoint, I, I don't know, are you both at the same firm now? or well, We are. And, and I assume that's a rather long and long existing firm of high integrity in uh, both in Washington and Arizona. Is that correct? We, absolutely, Congressman. Right. Mr. And Kanjorski, I, uh, if you'd let complete that last question, because I wanted to yield to some of oh, our Oh, sure. I'll, I'll be happy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Duffy, uh, you were saying earlier that there is a relationship between the, the distance between the reservation and the site of uh, the hoped-for casino. Is that is that correct? Yes, the 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 uh, I was talking about the underlying statute of taking land into trust, Section 465, and the regulations under that, which are found in 25 CFR Section 151. And there, it uh, clearly indicates that to the extent that the uh, request for trust land uh, is distant from the tribe's reservation greater weight should be given to the objections of the community in which the new trust land would be located. Is that, is that in the statute or is that, is that department policy? It's policies? in the regulations. It's written in the regulations. Okay. Um, so in, in this case, again, how far from the, the reservations was the, was the site, was the dog track? I believe it was 188 miles from one reservation and the closest, I think, was um, 85 miles. It was 85, 165, and 188 miles from the three reservations. Okay. Just for my own benefit, is there any um, language that talks about crossing state lines? I know that there was the one case where the, 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 the you had Nebraska and Iowa, but let's, let's say that there was a, a spot here in, in Virginia and you had a Wisconsin tribe that wanted to move to, to have Indian gaming there. 
is that something that would be permissible under under IGRA, under the under the, the federal laws? Well, in Section 151, the one I just previously referred to, which discusses the distance, also discusses the question of state lines and indicates that's another negative factor. If the land in trust, putting aside gaming now, just an ordinary land in trust application, if it would cross state lines. Okay, so, but hy hypothetically, you could have a situation where a, an Alaskan tribe or a Wisconsin tribe could move into another state. Hypothetically, uh, it could move. The Pine Ridge Sioux, for example, one of the poorest tribes in the country, could establish um, a, a gaming facility uh, uh, in, say, Knoxville, Tennessee. I was reading a report uh, they quoted Mr. Babbitt last week that talked about the different tensions within the, the department, and I don't know if tensions is the right word, but the debate. Is there a difference of opinion as to the, the strength of local opposition between the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Interior staff? Not on this decision, I don't think. Not on this decision, but I'm talking about no, I understand there isn't on this decision, but just on, on the weight that is given to a, a local community's opposition. I think of the Bureau of Indian Affairs as being more of a proponent of, of the wishes of, of the tribes um, and not necessarily that being the case for the interior. Am I, am I wrong in, in my interpretation there? Well, I, I think that's, um, I don't think that's entirely fair, no, Congressman. I think that the Department of the Interior, as a general, as a whole, has an obligation to Indians, and that obligation is effectuated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, obviously, one of the reasons the Department of the Interior has a central um, policy-making organization in the Secretary is for him to make some of these decisions um, from a... Uh, a higher plane or from a broader mm -hmm. perspective. Okay. Now, you were, you were a proponent of making this decision under Section 20. Is that correct? Yes, I was. And that is the taking land into trust provisions. That, that is the provision with respect to gaming. Uh, I fully supported Mr. Skabeen's idea that this uh, application should be rejected simply on the grounds of Section 465, um, on the grounds that it, it was not an appropriate acquisition of trust land this far from the reservation with these many problems over the strong objection of the community. So that's 465 alone. I thought we should also consider and, uh, and examine this under Section 20. Can you tell me what the, the legal standards at that time the decision were made for challenging each of those decisions? Do you, when you say the legal standard, do you mean the process by which they would be challenged, or what was the review standard? The, the review standard. I think the review would, would be arbitrary and capricious with respect to Section 20. Um, it's a little unclear what the standard was under 465. At the time, the solicitor took the position that the department had unreviewable discretion under Section 465, and therefore it could make any decision it wanted. So that, and this is a hypothetical question, if, if the decision had been made solely on the basis of 465, one could make the argument that it was non-reviewable. Th that would have been the argument the solicitor's office, I presume, would have made, yes. So by including Section 20 language, you were in effect opening yourself up to a lawsuit. Section 20 did provide a basis for a reviewability stand, for reviewability, yes, in the district court. Mm -hmm. But, go ahead. That I had nothing further to add, no. All right. Uh, Mr. Waxman, I have no further questions at this time. I don't know if Mr. Kanjorski does or Mr. Waxman, if you have some, I'll do, yield do, my time back to yeah. Mr. Kanjorski. And just to go on that point, if in fact there had been political influence or consideration because of, of political contributions, you would have done a, 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 a solid uh, lock on the situation if you'd gone over 485, or 465 is the reason, because that gave you absolute discretion. It would have closed off uh, the dog track people from ever raising a question or the Indians from raising a question. The very fact that you did use the process of using Section 20 gave judicial review. I, at the time, Congressman, I have to say I did not think about those factors, but as you say them here, yes, that's correct. 
That is, uh, that's a good point, because no one anticipated, I assume, uh, Mr. Duffy, when you were trying to decide on what basis to make this decision, that somebody was going to come in and question whether the decision was made based on political influence or, or any interference. Absolutely. Uh, there was no, no suggestion of that. The, the purpose of our hearings, and this is the third day on the same subject, is whether the decision by the Department of Interior on this particular application to have a Las Vegas casino off a reservation in Hudson, Wisconsin, was made because of political corruption. In other words, because campaign money was given to the Democratic Party or Cl Clinton Gore, and because of that, the White House or someone in political power uh, told the people in the interior who had the actual decision-making authority to make it a particular way. Can you just say to us, you are under oath, whether there was any interference, whether there was any kind of uh, uh, pressure from the White House or from the Democratic Party or anyone outside the Department of of interior uh, to uh, come up with the result that uh, was uh, arrived at. I, I can and I will. There was none. 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 And Mr. Collier, you're I also emphatically under. agree. Well, I, I thank you both for your testimony. Uh, we still have some time, but I'll yield it back to the chairman. Chairman yields back the balance of his time, Mr. Souter. First, I'd like to say for the record, since uh, my friend from California, Mr. Horn, has had his uh, deposition questions up there twice, that he is a pretty moderate, mild-mannered man, and I don't think his intent is to badger witnesses. And I talked to him once on the floor, and it certainly wasn't his intent. So I wanted to say that in his behalf. Um, uh, Mr. Duffy, are you familiar with the Detroit casino? Did that occur when you, when you were at the Department of Justice? Yes, it did. Um, that tribe is farther away than these tribes, right, from Detroit? I my don't know. By a large distance. Um, and were they not given additional time when there was community opposition to try to work with a referendum uh, to try to see if public opinion, in fact, can be fairly fluid in these situations and generally is not particularly receptive to casinos in a community regardless? I don't know. I wasn't involved in that aspect of it. I don't know. Do you, uh, do you know whether in this particular case, either you or Mr. Collier, whether or not uh, the applicants were told that there might be problems? In other I, words, the goal of the agency is to work with particularly poor Indian tribes and try to work through it, would it not? I don't know what Mr. Scabine told the applicants. Do you believe that that's an important part of the process? I would assume that Mr. Scabine did what he thought was appropriate. The applicants had been consulted extensively at the area director's office. It you didn't me. ask him? What? You didn't ask him whether he had been working with those tribes? No. Uh, particularly given the fact that he told our committee that the way that he told them was their letter of rejection, uh, he had not discussed the problems that were developing. Uh, it seems like, uh, doesn't the, let me ask a specific question to both of you, does not the law require such consultation? when it's being rejected? When, when would it be In other words, when the, when the Indian tribes that were requesting it, when they're um, about to get rejected, doesn't the law require working with the Indian tribes to tell them what the problem was with their application and see if it can be worked out before you just unilaterally rule against them? No, I don't believe the law requires that. You don't think that that is, uh, my understanding, uh, and I, you're, I am not an attorney. I mean, I, my understanding was that, that it certainly seemed like a logical goal of the Department of Interior to work with the poor Indian tribes and not just outright reject them. The, the, Congressman, it would be an absolutely infeasible approach to the decision-making process of the Department of the Interior <laughs> to receive applications from people and then, after having received uh, information from them, when, when we were in the decision-making process to stop the decision-making process and ask them for more information. I mean, the decision forms itself by consensus. It is made when Mr. Anderson, the man who has the responsibility to make the decision, signs the decision. Thereafter, the decision on the facts go out. So, what you're saying, you yield, uh, yeah, yield real quickly. Uh, I just talked to our counsel about this, and he said, uh, 
the law is pretty specific that uh, it does require consultation with the with the tribes in question before a decision like that's rendered so that they can try to correct those and and they were consulted at the area level at the area level wasn't uh, I thought this was uh, pretty much approved this and, time and moved up the up. chain but the information the information that was the basis of the decision was collected at the area level and they at that level uh, we have numerous memory I mean the area level recommended approval in fact the Anderson study you're familiar with the Anderson study said there wasn't detrimental I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, and they the, that is was submitted up to the Department of Interior and what partly we're looking at here is at the area level where the consultation was occurring there wasn't that warning and once it was kicked to Washington amazing process occurs all of a sudden one tribe is left out until they do hire a high-powered attorney who had been a former partner of the secretary to, c to come in because there was a whole intervening period there in June that's very disturbing and what I'm trying to figure out is how one group was shut out while the other group had different congressmen contacting uh, multiple memos flying around whether or not you saw them or not is something apparently we're not going to be able to uh, I mean I'll take you at your word uh, that um, it is a it is a uh, kind of a questionable thing to us when we look at Detroit where in fact the tribes from farther away with community opposition apparently had time to correct the situation and they didn't hear it okay. congressman this really surprises me it really surprises me because to me the, the the tribes once the decision is made the tribes could have come back for reconsideration they could have filed another application we're simply making a decision on the facts as they appear on that record we're not foreclosing them from other taking any action i mean isn't the, the goal here of this whole act which i would not have voted for and by the way i just want to say for the record i think you made the right decision too i'm worried you made it for the wrong reasons if not yourself someone uh that um uh is not the point here that there are many very poor Indian tribes and we're trying to figure out how to provide employment for them. You have a group of three very poor tribes, in effect at this point, being blocked by several much more affluent tribes. A logical process would be to say, if you're in the process of turning them down, to give them options to work through, to see what you can do with them, unless, of course, there was political influence, and that's what we're trying to find out. Well, Congressman, one of the objections, okay, uh, was that they would have detrimental impact on the St. Croix tribe. I but that not. is not what Arthur Anderson in that study found at that point. It said it was minimal impact. It may have been up to 10 percent, and that is not a factual statement. That's millions of dollars, Congressman. Well, a detrimental impact. There was a detrimental impact whenever the next casino went in anywhere in the state of Minnesota. The question is, is it a significant impact? And uh, I like your interpretation because, in effect, your interpretation can block any casino anywhere. Well, I, I, uh, I mean, Atlantic City has a detrimental impact on Las Vegas. Congressman, the, the, the question here is whether or not there was going to be a detrimental impact. Right? It, it's not, it, there was going to be a detrimental impact here. People would lose a great deal of money. Now, the question was what was meant by detrimental? How much impact was ne necessary to make it detrimental? Three times your local office stated that the principal, uh, excuse me, that the, that the statement uh, that is, I can't much hold my sheet out earlier, three times that the Arthur Anderson study said that there was not detri significant detrimental impact and that was not a valid consideration for rejection. Well, Congressman, I, 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 th this is a, a, an argument or a discussion that uh, I'm interested in because I like discussing these issues, okay? Uh, but just as a background, the, the purpose of IGRA was to uh, have put, uh, allow I I Indian tribes to game on their reservations, okay? It, it was, as I say in my opening statement, an exception to have off-reservation gaming for many of the reasons as that you point Duluth, out. As is Detroit. Right. Uh, in fact, the Mystic Casino, is that on a reservation? I'm just curious, the Shakopee's? My yeah. understanding is that it is, yes, Because Congress. it's yes. in the metro area, and I, d I didn't know that. My that understanding is that it's on their reservation. Um, but I, like I say, I have a concern we're going to move to gas stations and all kinds of other things off the reservation. We, we, and it's a legitimate concern, but in fact, we've moved beyond that we, in the law, and we need to change the law. We, we, no, we address your issue. We, we, we don't disagree with you. We address your, and, and we're trying to address your issue administratively. That's the reason for this decision. We, are, we understand your concern, and we're trying to address it administratively. Because frankly, speaking for myself now, when I was at the department, I don't want you to change the law. I want to interpret the law in a way that will convince you that you don't have to change the law. Because I think the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act is Indian tribes' real opportunity to make some money 
and to get to a position in this society that has been denied them for many, many years. I, with great respect to the Congress of the United States, I do not believe you were prepared to appropriate sufficient funds to do that. And therefore, I think Indian gaming is the only way to do it. And we are trying to make the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, how can I say this? Uh, I don't want to say appealing to you, but not uh, obnoxious to you. We are trying to not have every community in America cry out, hey, we could have a gaming application here. We don't want that. And that's why we're making these determinations, but purely on policy grounds. The Detroit application was strongly, overwhelmingly supported by people in Detroit. The mayor came in to see Not me. initially. Well, they, they, the application was delayed for an extended period of time so they could run advertising and change the thing, which you didn't give to these. Congressman, if there's a change in the view of the position of, of St. Croix tribe or of the local community, this tribe can you come back. It's ironic that well, wealthy tribes seem to go farther and tribes that give more money seem to go farther than poor tribes who don't give as much money and aren't as wealthy. That's I, the irony. I, it's, an, it's, an, it, it's an irony only because you're juxtaposing things that actually have no connection. There is no connection between what these individuals gave and this decision. Yeah. No connection whatever. I don't know how strongly I can well, say gentleman's that. Gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Parr. No, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll take my five minutes. Oh, you have five minutes now? Are we not? Yeah. Okay. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in in this discussion and, and uh, direct uh, Mr. Sauter uh, to um, some discussion on this as well. Y you, I'm impressed that you seem to have some knowledge of this Indian gaming law. I'm learning a lot more than I ever wanted to know about this law. This is not the committee with jurisdiction over that issue. So if, if you think the law ought to be changed, you may be on the uh, Interior Committee, you may not be, but that, that's the committee that's going to have to look at it. You said you agreed with the decision, but you disagreed with the <coughs> way it was reached. And you seem to raise questions about they, maybe they didn't consult with the tribes sufficiently. And I think that's a, a matter open to dispute. Or perhaps you didn't think that, that Mr. Duffy's theory was grounds were as good as Mr. Scabine's. But what does that have to do with why we're meeting here? Do you, do you, um, if the decision was made on one basis to turn it down, or a decision was made on another basis to turn it down, and it wasn't based on political interference, then it's up to another committee to decide whether they ought to have a third reason to turn it down, or other procedural steps that they should follow. I, I want to yield to you. What, what are you getting at? Uh, what I'm getting at is I believe they made the right decision to turn down the casino, but I fear it's because of the financial impact, and I don't know who. <coughs> the financial there, impact on whom? The, the contributions that came in after the decision, the process that were occurring, all the influencing of. Yeah, but you haven't, you haven't established that. You, your whole time was taken up over whether they consulted with the the because tribes. I, I, in effect, took them at their word and that they're not going to change their position here that they weren't under political influence. So there's no real point in me asking, can you ask that or I'd be called badgering the witness. I was trying to establish a more technical point, and that is, was there a consultation with the a poor child who were rejected? Okay, well, um, look, we had Mr. Scabine, Mr. Hartman, Mr. Anderson, all career people at the Department of Interior, very familiar with this law and very familiar with this case. They said there was no political interference. They made the decision on the merits. Now we have Mr. Duffy, who worked at the department, who's given us that same testimony. All of them under oath. I mean, it's a serious matter when you say things under oath. It's a lot more serious than just making a charge to get into the newspapers. So we have no evidence of any political interference. We just don't. And we have a lot of questioning of whether, as to whether the decision should have been made on one basis as opposed to another basis, that's a legitimate point. And you know what? It's going to be fought out in a lawsuit because Mr. Duffy decided to turn them down on a grounds that's reviewable. And Mr. Havenick, who's still here, he's been here for three days, not alone with a panel of lawyers. He's looking for uh, grounds in the court case to uh, overturn the decision. Now, once it's overturned, as I understand the law, he. He doesn't get his way. He then has to submit another application. Is that, is that right, Mr. Duffy? It would probably be sent back to the... It depends on what the ground is, yeah, but it would have to be sent back to the department for further action. Okay. So he's challenging on all sorts of different grounds. As I understand that the judge's decision, which Mr. Barr earlier cited 
he had a quote from the judge, and the judge said uh, that political interference, but as I understand her decision, she said she had some enough evidence that there might have been political interference, so she decided that discovery can be proceeded on on the questions of political interference. She wasn't going to limit their lawsuit only to procedural grounds as whether there was some kind of arbitrary and capricious decision making at the Department of Interior, which is also grounds that Mr. Havanick and his partners are uh, basing their objections to the decision. That's correct. Okay. Well, look, I, I just want a reality test. If we all seem to think this was an appropriate decision because the local people didn't want it, and I, I take that as a, as a very serious matter. Uh, you can't cite Atlantic City and saying the local people might not have liked it or they might have had a, This was not an Indian l land taken under reservation. When Indian, an Indian tribe takes land under a trust, that means that the local people cannot pass laws applying to that area. Isn't that right, Mr. That's Dunn? correct. So even though the state of Wisconsin, the, the city of Hudson, uh, and others who were living there uh, didn't want this casino, their decision-making would have been completely irrelevant if the Department of Interior decided to use this little loophole that says land can be taken as a trust if it's an Indian tribe or tribes, and, and, and then federal law would apply. Is, is that, am I accurate in what's... That's why they can game on it, because it no longer is local governed by local law. It's now governed by the tribe's law and by the federal law, namely the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Now, there was a, a, a meeting that Mr. Eckstein had with uh, the secretary. And um, it, 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 he said, did he meet with you? He met with me before he met with the secretary, yes. Uh, and then he went to meet with the secretary. What happened in his meeting with you? I told him the application was going to be denied. And so, but Mr. Eckstein was there because he was hired by Mr. Havanek to make the case to you, isn't that right? That's correct. He was their lawyer lobbyist. The argument that these poor Indian tribes didn't have their say is absolutely in incorrect. They had their say to the point where they hired a guy who was hired primarily, as best I know, because he could get access right to the secretary, the highest levels. Well, well Mr. Mr. Eckstein, I, I think, himself concedes that he saw both the gaming management staff, and he contends, although I don't recall this, he contends that he also saw me in a meeting on May 17th, along with Congressman Moody, who was employed also to lobby on behalf of the tribe. And Mr. Skabeen testified he met with the Indian tribes that uh, wanted this application. <coughs> he also met with the Minnesota congressional delegation that didn't want it. He got both sides to uh, say what they had to say. And then as, as a man who had no uh, financial interest in this, without any political interference, he decided that this was too far a reach outside of a reservation for tribes that were 80 to 200 miles away to be allowed to take an area outside of local control when the local people didn't want it and turn it over to the federal government and then allow them to open up the casino. That's exactly correct. I'm going to uh, uh, take my five minutes, but I'm going to yield to Mr. Barr the, the majority of it, but I just want to make a couple of points. Uh, Mr. Waxman continues to try to make the case that there's nothing but smoke and there certainly isn't any fire. And he may be correct, but Tom Schneider uh, was contacted uh, by Mr. O'Connor and asked to uh, contact uh, the White House, Mr. Ickes. Mr. O'Connor did talk to the President. The President did instruct uh, Mr. Ickes to be contacted. Uh, Terry McAuliffe was asked about this. Uh, Mr. Fowler was asked about this. There was political operatives uh, uh, asking uh, people to take a hand in the decision-making process. Uh, after the fact, uh, there's a memo or a letter that was sent out asking for money from the tribes that benefited from this, from Mr. Kiddo and Mr. O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor says he didn't see the letter, but nevertheless, his name was on it, as was Mr. Kiddo's. And uh, uh, on September 14th, uh, this letter was sent out, circulated to Native American clients asking for contributions. And in the letter, uh, it said, as witnessed in the fight to stop the Hudson Dog Track proposal, the office of the president can and will work on our behalf when asked to. Now, these were two people who were lobbying to stop this 
this program, this, uh, this new casino at Hudson. And uh, they say very categorically, you ought to give some money to the DNC because uh, we got the job done through political uh, uh, contacts in the White House and elsewhere. Now, this isn't just hyperbole. It's in writing. And it's, it's, it's in, our, in our files here, and it's been submitted for the record. And uh, then after that, we have $360,000 in contributions that were made. Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier went to work for a law firm, and the Shacklebees, the main tribe that benefited from this, are their clients. Now, you know, maybe this is all coincidental, but it sure does uh, smell a little bit. And that's why a lot of us have concerns, and that's why we're holding these hearings. So for you to say, you know, nothing's going on, uh, that this is all baloney, uh, just uh, doesn't uh, wash with a, a, a number of us. And then, of course, uh, Secretary Babbitt said uh, that Ickes told him to uh, get the decision out and the tribes gave <coughs> half a million dollars. Now, that's what uh, Mr. Babbitt said to Mr. Eckstein. And, uh, of course, uh, we're going to talk to Mr. Babbitt about that tomorrow. Mr. Barr, you have the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to have entered in the record the the court, uh, court case, which appears uh, at 961 F SUP uh, 1276, the uh, Sagogan uh, Chippewa Community uh, et al. v. Bruce uh, C. Babbitt et al. Uh, have either of you gentlemen uh, testified in, in that case? Um, I have not. Mr. Duffy? I, I have not testified. I have submitted an affidavit, which was, uh, I think, sub, uh, well, I gave an affidavit to the Justice Department. I think that has been submitted in some fashion in the case. Okay. Uh, Mr. Collier, have you submitted an affidavit or been deposed uh, or in any other way submitted a, a statement to the court in that case? Um, I spoke to um, uh, counsel from... Um, Department of Interior, I believe, but I don't think I ended up submitting anything uh, okay. with respect to the case. Uh, I'm going to read briefly from the lead into that case. Uh, Lake Superior Chippewa Indian Bands challenged decisions of Department of the Interior denying their application under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, uh, IGRA, for United States to acquire in trust a Greyhound racing facility for conversion into <coughs> off-reservation casino. After partial summary judgment was entered, 929 F SUP 1165, bans sought reconsideration. The district court, Crab J, held that bans made sufficiently strong showing of improper influence on agency decision to be entitled to extra record discovery and examination of agency personnel. Now, the case uh, is, is still currently uh, an active one. It has not been tried. Uh, as we can see from, from this document, this official uh, opinion, uh, it is still in the discovery stage. But the reason, I think, in large part, following on what the chairman indicated, that we're here today is more than simply any singular or collective opinion on this side that, you know, something was wrong. Uh, this is a United States District Court judge, and she has issued a, a fairly lengthy opinion here uh, and towards the end of it, on page 10 of, of the written opinion that we have here, uh, she indicates uh, appropriately that she does not intend to imply that all contacts between agency officials and White House staff are improper. Uh, she says such meetings are a necessary outgrowth of the manner in which the executive branch is organized. Uh, however, uh, whereas here there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision-making, it is necessary to allow extra record discovery to uncover whether that is true. Many of the events of which plaintiffs complain could be considered innocent in and of themselves, but their combination in this case raises substantial suspicion. That's not my opinion. That's not the opinion of the chairman or Mr. Souter or anybody up here, that is an opinion of, of a United States District Court judge based on uh, what we all can, I think, presume would be a, an extensive and very professional review of a very extensive record thus far in the discovery of that, of that case. Uh, she goes on uh, to indicate that it would be a rare case in which a party will be able to present evidence similar to the evidence plaintiffs have produced here suggesting that. 
and then I'll go on when I have a little more time, but uh, what, what she's saying is there, there are some very unusual things that appear based on the record in this case to have happened, and that, that's why it's of concern to us, and I'll uh, uh, go into this in another matter in a little more detail uh, when I have my five minutes. Mr. Barr, we'll come back to you right after the next, uh, next uh, person to testify or to question. Ms. Maloney. I uh, would like to really ask uh, uh, both Mr. Collier and Mr. Duffy the same question. I'd, I'd like to ask you that um, uh, during uh, really Secretary Babbitt's tenure and, and really uh, during the time that both of you worked at, at the department, is it a true statement that the department policy was to give um, great weight uh, to the views of local community and local politicians? Was that the view of the department to uh, listen to what the local people had to say? Uh, absolutely, yes. And Mr. Collier, would you answer too? I agree with that, yes. Uh, why, why was this important to the department to, to listen to elected officials, to uh, really uh, referendums from the people in the community, from the uh, various levels of uh, federal, state, and city? Why was that so important to the department? Well, well, I was trying to encourage us, Congresswoman, not to rely on referendums, but to focus our attention on the response of the local elected officials, which I felt was the best test of what local public opinion would be or what the local community was in terms of support or opposition to a particular item. Uh, local community was important because uh, there's a overriding political concern, and by political concern I mean that in the best sense, having to do with politics and elected officials, um, that the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act needs the support of Americans throughout the country. Uh, Indians do not do well as a general matter when they come up against the majority of non-Indians. And where their interests are in conflict, Indians tend to lose. We didn't want the Indian Regulatory uh, Game, uh, Gaming Regulatory Act to be in conflict with local Americans. Most local Americans, from my own personal feeling and uh, uninformed uh, and unofficial opinion poll, support Indian gaming. But they want to have some say if it's not going to be on a reservation. Yeah. And I think that's what we were trying to get at. We wanted them, we wanted to listen to people when the gaming was off reservation because it's only appropriate that people should not be forced, as the Secretary has said, not have a gaming casino shoved down their throat. Was there a, an unusual degree of opposition to this particular project? Well, there was a, in my focus of attention, and I believe the department's focus, there was strong opposition across the board in uh, here, and the local community, as I've said before, the local officials were against it. Did Secretary Babbitt ever pressure you to take a particular position with respect to the trust acquisition of the St. Croix Meadows Greyhound racing track? Mr. Duffy, did he ever pressure you? No, I don't think he ever expressed a, a view on the specific issue, or the specific application. I don't believe he had any view, and I don't he, he was not, not involved in it. He didn't pressure you. He didn't even express a view. He wasn't involved in it. He simply wasn't involved in it. I did have a conversation with him many, uh, some uh, months before, uh, a long time before, in which we talked about the type of policy we ought to be uh, putting into effect in the department, and that's where the don't shove it down their throat remark came. But on this particular application, he was not involved. So, um... Are you um, aware of the secretary exerting any pressure on department employees as to how the decision could come out? No, I'm not. So he not only didn't affect you, he didn't pressure any other employees? No. Uh, did the secretary ever indicate to you that he was receiving pressure from the White House, the Democratic National Committee, or Clinton-Gore campaign on this application? No. And. Uh, and the secretary, secretary never told you that you should ensure that the application was rejected? Is, is that correct? No, he, he never told me anything about how the application should be decided. I'd, I'd like to ask both of you, Mr. Collier and Mr. Duffy, okay. did any of your superiors, um, you testified about uh, 
the secretary, but any of your superiors ever tell you to take a particular position on this matter uh, because of a tribe's campaign contributions or because of uh, any other reason? Not because of a tribe's campaign contributions, no. Did any of your superiors ever tell you that any particular tribe of Indians was to be given deference because of their campaign contributions? No, absolutely not. Did either of you ever uh, pressure uh, George Scabine, uh, the 20-year career employee, uh, to make a particular determination with respect to this matter? I didn't. Nor me. Did you, Mr. Collier? No. Did either of you ever ask George Scabine or anyone else on his staff uh, to make a particular determination with respect to this matter? Well, Congressman, I participated in the decision-making process, and I did urge that we use Section 20. Mm -hmm. uh, so to that extent, I have to tell you that I talked to Mr. Scabine and recommended an approach. But as to the initial decision, that was Mr. Scabine. But, but, but actually, if, if you did disagree with the legal reasoning on which uh, the gaming office based its determination, would there have been anything illegal, unethical, or inappropriate in directing them to make a change? There would have been something inappropriate, not an inappropriate, but I would not have had the authority to direct him to make the change. He did not report to me. Mm -hmm. I was not in line authority with Mr. Scabine. But, but isn't it part of your job to review documents prepared by the Interior Department staff and to make changes based on your knowledge of the law? It's more the solicitor's responsibility to make changes based on the law. Mm -hmm. It's my responsibility to provide recommendations with respect to what I think is appropriate policy. Ask one last question. Do you, do you believe that campaign contributions determined the outcome of this matter? I, I know they did not determine the outcome of this matter because I was watching the process, monitoring the process. I saw how the process was made, and I know that there was no influence on kind of by campaign contributions on this process. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as, as I've said before, Mr. Chairman, we have a case where we had opposing sides, both of whom hired lawyers, lobbyists, both of which made campaign contributions. Uh, but we've had testimony from career professionals, uh, from all types of people, that have said that it in no way influenced their decision. And I, I come back to the theme that uh, really the President had last night in his State of the Union, that we should just ban soft money contributions. Then we would never have any, uh, any discussion of uh, any impropriety because everybody could not make large comp contributions. You'd be limited to $1,000. Gen Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Barr, you recognize me. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think one of the nice things about court opinions is uh, they stick to the points. Uh, they don't go on and on about extraneous matters. And what the judge in this case has done, and I keep coming back to it because I think it's very important, uh, because there's a constant effort in these hearings and every other time we have hearings uh, to trivialize us or pull us off on tobacco or campaign finance reform or something. Uh, our witnesses today are lawyers. I'm, I'm sure that they have uh, you know, very strong regard for the opinions of courts. And what the court is suggesting here is that based on substantial evidence that it reviewed, there is a very serious question and suspicion that has been raised. That obviously is not important, has no importance whatsoever to the folks on the other side. Court opinions do have importance, uh, and, and I respect them, and I, I know these witnesses do. And what the court is listing here, such things as agency officials meeting with opposition groups uh, and not notifying the applicant, uh, the head of the DNC meeting with opposition groups, uh, and shortly thereafter contacting the White House, Chief, White House Chief of Staff and the agency about the application, raise suspicions. Uh, Upper-level agency officials rejecting the conclusions of the area often <coughs> and agency staff without conducting further factual inquiries of their own. Agency officials relying on a reason for denying the, ap the application that is considered insignificant with respect to a later similar application. And the head of the agency saying that he was directed explicitly by the White House Chief of Staff to is issue the agency decision on a given date. Those are not things that a court has made up. Those are not things that a politician has made up. Those are statements placed very seriously and very 
deliberately in a court proceeding uh, that has to do with an awful lot of information that we have not even gone in here today, and that is why this is important. Let me uh, ask a couple of quick questions, Mr. Collier, about something a little bit different, uh, but something about which I know you're familiar. Uh, we have some documents here uh, regarding um, Mr. Hubble uh, and Mrs. Hubble. Uh, on April 5th, and these, I, I believe, were documents that you provided to uh, Senator Faircloth, uh, both documents uh, regarding meetings uh, that you had, Mr. Collier, with uh, Mr. Hubble, and then a chronology uh, of uh, various matters, uh, discussions, and telephone conversations with regard to uh, bringing uh, Mr. Hubble's wife uh, back from an extended leave of absence. Uh, in uh, 1994, 1995. Uh, did you indeed have, have lunch, which according to Mr. Hubble's appointment calendar took place on April 5th, 1994 <coughs> with uh, Mr. Hubble? I don't recall the, uh, the specific date or the specific lunch, but I have had lunch before with Mr. Hubble, yes. Okay, and, and it wouldn't surprise you if indeed that entry on, on his log was a correct one. That that I, I have no reason to question that entry, okay. Congressman. Uh, and then again on October 12th of 1994, and the entry is a little bit more difficult to read on that, uh, would that my, uh, have been a day likely in which you had another meeting with him? I, I have no recollection of, uh, uh, I just can't help you, Congressman. It, it, my name appears on, uh, on a calendar. Okay. Uh, so you're saying in, in, in April of 94, it, it, you have no reason to suspect that, that you didn't have lunch with him on that day. You, that, that's, that's what his calendar... You don't that's recall it all on October 12th. That's right. I just don't recall. Okay. Uh, what was the reason that, that Mrs. Hubble uh, took a, an unpaid leave of absence from her interior department position in March of 94? She wanted to spend more time with her children. Okay. Uh, what was uh, her, her grade level at that time when she left? Uh, Congressman, I don't recall her grade level at all. Okay. Was it a fairly senior position? I, I, uh, I don't recall at all. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, when she came back uh, in February of 1995, uh, about a year later, uh, there was some discussion <coughs> about exactly what work she would, uh, would be doing. Uh, did she, in fact, come back to the same job that she had left, or was she given a different job? Um, I, I'm, I'm not certain. I think she was given a different job, Congressman. I, I, I think that's, that's probably accurate. Uh, do you know uh, what grade level she was brought back in at? Um, I believe she was brought back at the same grade level, Congressman. Okay. Uh, were there discussions that you had uh, with Mr. Hubble, Mr. Hubble, that is, during this period of time, that is from, from April of 1994, uh, which is when he left the, the Department of Justice, until his, his wife was rehired about a year later. Did you have conversations with him during are, that period? Are you asking whether I had conversations with him about his wife's job status, Congressman, or are you asking me if I had conversations with him? about anything. That. Um, um, I uh, have probably in my life had two or three conversations with Webb Hubble. Um, I don't recall when they occurred. Okay. There, there being so few, there might be a presumption that you might have a pretty specific recollection of what was discussed. Uh, could you tell us what you discussed at the meeting that occurred on or about, and, and the date isn't that important, April 5th of 94? No, I, I have no idea what we talked about. Do you recall what you talked about at any of your meetings with Webb Hubble? I don't. Even though there were only a few of them? Oh, oh, even though there were only a few, Congressman. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Let's see who's next down there. Is it Kinjorski or? <laughs> Mr. Kinjorski, would you like to? Sure. <laughs> Well, as long as you want, Mr. Kujarski. Uh, let me just uh, uh, take one second, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, I know my colleague on the other side talked about uh, from the decision of the 
uh, District Court, uh, Western District in, of Wisconsin. Uh, and maybe we should call the judge in that case. I don't know what uh, she would offer other than she had a transcript before she had requests. As I understand that case, there was a, a, a limiting order signed by the judge restricting the amount of discovery that could be taken by the petitioner, the disappointed party in this case, the uh, dog track owner, and that upon reconsideration, the court decided that there were a lot of unanswered questions and that if you took the inferences all in favor of the defendant, you could arrive at one conclusion. If you took those same inferences all in favor of the plaintiff's side, you could arrive at another decision. And the court merely concluded that based on some of the facts and some of the allegations, that it would be unreasonable not to allow extra discovery procedure to be granted to the plaintiff in the case uh, that otherwise would be prejudiced and potentially su subject to summary judgment, which means in a federal district court that you just don't get a chance to proceed and prove your case. The position that Mr. Barr has taken in, in, in asserting uh, statements in the record are out of context and really disingenuous from the standpoint that I don't believe this judge has arrived at any conclusions, and this is a intermittent decision to allow the case to proceed in an orderly fashion, to allow extra discovery beyond the administrative <coughs> record. That's all it involves. In, in seven instances and two, uh, sustaining the court's original position that there's no reason to ask uh, to allow any further discovery, there was a failure of evidence or allegation which dismissed uh, and allowed for summary judgment. Uh, and may I say that this was concluded, as best I can recollect, sometime in uh, April of 97, uh, which is what, almost two, a year ago, uh, certainly precedes this hearing. And if we have any more evidence uh, or, or facts why not have live characters come in and testify rather than doing a disservice to all of us to attempt to use a, a federal a district court judge as a witness by citing or quoting out of context some of her uh, decision or conclusions that she arrived at to attain fairness. Uh, so on the basis of that, I only hope that we can wind this uh, hearing down. I don't want to take any more time, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. The only idea, I hope we don't have any more phantom witnesses before the... Uh, and, and, and if I may, I'll yield to Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, as we come to the close here of this hearing today, um, some of the protestations from the Republican side about fundraising um, make me think of the scene in Casablanca where Claude Rains uh, is shocked. He's shocked that there's gambling in Casablanca. And Mr. Chairman, you and other members from your side seem to be shocked that there is fundraising actually occurring in Washington, D.C. Um, but I would venture to guess, Mr. Chairman, um, that there has been not one, not two, not three, but hundreds if not thousands of letters that have gone out from lobbyists on behalf of yourself and members on your side uh, following action by this Congress, following action by you or other members, um, explaining to clients the good work that you have done and asking them to contribute to your campaign. Uh, and I would also venture to guess, Mr. Chairman, that you've accepted those campaign contributions and felt that you were doing your duty, that you had done the right thing, and that they were participating in the, in the political process. Uh, so I think that this is instructive to the American people um, because I think that this is in some ways a um, a garden variety um, issue uh, and how Washington works. And a decision is made. The decision was made on the merits. Um, and yes, campaign contributions were made following a decision. Uh, but to suggest that something is wrong here when we have the overwhelming evidence that the local community, from the mayor, the common council, every single 
elected member of Congress who took, an issue, uh, who took a stand on this issue in the state of Wisconsin, every single member of Congress from Minnesota who took a stand on this issue, um, that this decision was in agreement with that. And the only parallel I can draw on the other side is last year when President Clinton um, made the designation for the state of Utah for the wilderness area. And the howls that went up from the congressional members that he didn't listen to them. Um, in this case, the Department of Interior did listen. Uh, and it listened and it made the right decision. And I'm, I'm glad that this decision was made. And I'll yield back my time to Mr. Kanjorski. And if he doesn't need it, I'll yield it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barrett, do you wish to use your five minutes? You're going to pass. Well, thank you. Let me just say the metaphor you used regarding Claude Rains and Casablanca is near and dear to my heart. You've used it before, and I hope you use it again sometime because it always brings back fond memories. Mr. Micah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Duffy, um, I have a couple of questions about uh, your employee at the uh, Department of uh, Interior. Um, I chair the House uh, Civil Service uh, Subcommittee uh, dealing with the federal employees, federal employment, and uh, issues of that sort. Uh, when did you uh, leave the department? Are you addressing uh, uh, Mr. Duffy? Mr. Duffy, yes. Uh, I left the department in um, July of uh, 1996. And uh, when did you join? Uh, the other firm? Uh, right thereafter, probably thereafter. And when did you get involved in the, um, uh, this particular issue uh, representing the uh, I think it was. interest? I, I think I said it was several months later, I thought. Several months later. Mm -hmm. And are you aware that there is a restriction, in fact, on employment for uh, federal employees uh, and uh, in most instances and uh, you found that there was an exclusion and uh, representing uh, I guess Indian tribes is that the case there's a statute which authorizes uh, the um, uh, representation of Indian tribes uh, overriding the other ethical uh, statutes mm -hmm. well I, I chair the Civil Service Subcommittee, I wasn't aware of that uh, loophole or that exclusion. Uh, uh, this has certainly caused, uh, um, this has certainly caused um, at least the appearance of uh, improper uh, relationship or potential conflict of interest or uh, cast uh, aspersion because some federal employees who leave who represent certain interests uh, uh, can immediately uh, be retained uh, in the employee of a tribe. And is that, wouldn't you think that that would be a perception outside? Well, I, I think it, I really don't know what the perception outside would be. I mean, I can say that this is not a loophole. This is a congressional policy. Right. But Congress uh, has enacted it set, this. It was set by Congress uh, uh, and uh, permitted. But don't you think that this uh, uh, creates uh, problems like we've seen here, or at least the appearance of problems? I, I I'd never, don't think I, so. I honestly had never heard of it, of the uh, exemption. I wasn't here when they wrote the, uh, the law. And uh, uh, it, it's something I think that we should uh, have everyone uh, who works for the federal government uh, uh, with an agency who's dealt with issues uh, rec recuse, I guess is the term themselves, for a, uh, a year. Would you agree with that? Well, Congressman, let me make sure we understand this. I'm not working on any issue for the Shakopee's that I worked on at the Department of the Interior. Right? That's not the issue here. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that's why, in my view, I don't see the appearance of impropriety. I mean, what's the connection is trying to be made here with improper conduct on my part, which I frankly am strongly <laughs> upset about, the, the, is that I joined a law firm which already had a client 
which at some point in time was interested in a decision that I participated in but didn't make. Now, with great respect, Congressman, I'm, I'm, I don't see the appearance of impropriety here. Well, again, I think uh, this hearing uh, raises some questions about uh, that law and uh, possibly other attorneys uh, are in the, uh, you know, who serve in government and go out and work uh, in other areas. This is a little bit more uh, difficult because uh, uh, I guess when you work just uh, with Indian issues, uh, you become an expert in that uh, field and uh, you go out and expect to make a living uh, uh, in some of your area of expertise. Uh, do you have any suggestions for any modifications to the law? I, I don't, Congressman. Uh, Mr. Collier, I think you have a, you have a similar situation. Do uh, you have any, idea, any suggestions? Do you think the law is fine the way it is? Uh, Congressman, I, I uh, respectfully uh, believe that's really an issue uh, for your side of the table rather than my side of the table. Um, well, you, you've... Uh, again, uh, I'm not saying anyone has done anything wrong. You've complied with the law. It appears the letter of the law. The Congress set those terms. And my question is, you've been through an experience uh, here, uh, and uh, maybe we should go back and revisit that law. Maybe we should make some changes. Uh, our job in this isn't just to beat you guys up. It's to look at... And we're not going to indict anybody. We, are not, we don't take criminal action. We review what's taken place. We review what the laws the Congress has passed. We investigate what took place. That's our, and, and here we have a situation that's cast some cloud. Uh, are there, do you have any recommendations to me for improving that uh, and, and in a positive vein? I'm not here to roast you yet. Uh, <laughs> Congressman, I appreciate the spirit of your question, um, but I don't have any suggestions for you. Okay. Gentlemen, time, time has expired. Has expired Let me just say in closing, first of all, we thank the witnesses for their patience. They've been sitting here all day along with their counsel. I know it's been a long day for you, so we appreciate your patience with us. Thank you. And I'd like to say to Mr. Barrett down there, we have a bill that will close that quote-unquote loophole regarding Indian tribes getting having the ability, and I'd... Uh, you indicated you'd be interested in co-sponsoring it. So I'm I'd interested. Be, I'll take a look at that. Thank I'll be you, happy Mr. to give it to you and have you maybe be co-sponsoring it. With that, thank I'd, you very I'd much. I'd also uh, like to be a co-sponsor. Love to have look you as a co-sponsor. legislation, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. With that, we will recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. This morning, the House committee hearings on campaign fundraising continue. Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt is scheduled to testify. We'll have live coverage of the proceedings beginning at